So after after every uh, session, we kept a panel discussion along with the question answer session. So all the speaker will get equal opportunity. So we will have three four questions in almost uh, all the talks, and uh, so. We have kept the real life surgery. The basic aim of real life surgery, rather than keeping the live surgeries in the live surgery, there are a lot of hassles. So you cannot stop a surgeon from operating, and you cannot ask the question. So sometimes uh, delegates are not that much confident to ask the question to operating surgeon. So in this uh, real life surgery, the concept is basically we can immediately pause the real life surgery if there is any point if delegate wants to ask how this tunnel is made, what are the Tips and tricks for that. So the surgery will be stopped at that particular point of time. Once answer is finished, then we will start the relive surgery again. So we kept around three or four relive surgery. We got a sessions and panel discussions. So I hope this is going to be a very interactive session whole of the day. And I will request all of you to have active participation, all the faculties and delegates, and don't hesitate to ask any questions, even if it's a very very basic and a simple question. So with this, we are going to start our conference. So the session one is a graph choices in ACL reconstruction. So this first session is going to be a mainly a technical uh, video. So the, for the first session, may I request uh, Dr. S. K. Lunawa sir and Dr. Alok Jain sir to chair the session, and we will start our scientific program for the first session. The first session is graph cho choices in ACL reconstruction. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Okay. So I guess uh, we are well within time, and I welcome you all and thanks the organizers for giving us an opportunity to share this session. So, so now may I invite our, our first speaker, speaker uh, Dr. Bajaj Dadaria, hamstring harvest technique tips and prevention of amputation. I didn't know that harvesting a hamstring can lead to amputation. <laughs> so I was a bit worried. Yeah, I'm outcast basically. I don't have much knowledge about office properly, so please excuse my ignorance. <laughs> Actually, we will modify the topic. Hamstring harvest technique keeps and prevent prevention of the amputation of the graft. That should be the proper. Yes. <laughs> Uh, very, very good, good morning, morning respected, respected chairpersons. Okay. okay. So, so I'll, I'll be talking about, about the hamstring graft harvest, harvest tips, tips and tricks. So, uh, the most, most important, important thing is the positioning. Uh, uh, you, you should position, position your patient well. well. Knee should, should be either in the hanging position or on the table, whatever it is, but it should be comfortable. 
uh, before putting in season, it is important to palpate the graft uh, properly and then make your incision accordingly. After giving in season, the graft can be palpated well with the thumb and then palpated with the faucets. Then uh, in season is placed just the, the first thing, thing with what we palpate, palpate is uh, the, the bump, bump which is the gristlis. Then, then beneath the gristlis, you just place a transverse in season. After, After putting the transverse in season, you, you just need to make a uh, rent only. Don't cut too deeply because uh, you can uh, damage the MCL atrogenically. So just separate the fascia till you see the white fibers, uh, longitudinal fibers traversing down. So, so once, once this, this window, window between the gristlis and low lying semi tendinosis is made, you, you hold it with the thick uh, faucet and with a curved artery, artery that is the mixture artery, hook, hook the uh, semi T tendon and pull, pull it. So, so it, it is important to hold it properly, properly, you grasp it, otherwise at times we pass the uh, mixture between the substance of the uh, semiti. So go well beyond the tendon and hook it and then uh, pull it. So by pulling uh, we can just detach some fibers from the tendon at least. Then a thick holding suture is uh, passed and now the Sep uh, dissection uh, goes towards, towards the attachment. The attachment. So, so, with the help of this scissor, it, it is separated from the, its attachment on the medial, uh, just, just medial to tibial tuberosity. This, this is really, really important to separate it with the help of a uh, knife, 15, 15 number knife. Approximately 1.5 to 2 centimeter of length can be gained, and very important healing potential we can have because of this attached periosteum at the end. So, so this 15, 15 number blade is used to detach the graft. The this superior, superior fibers of the semitendinosis are very well attached means those near to the gristlis. They, they should be cleared well with the knife and afterward with the help of a periosteum. This periosteum is elevated till its attachment almost up to the crest, almost up to the sin. So, so then, then with the, the help of your finger, finger or any artery, artery you, you just pull it and this semi tendinosis graft is uh, detached from its attachment. attachment. So, so once, once it is detached, now the, the most, most important, important thing is to, to identify all the accessory bands. So, so once whenever we will give the traction, these accessory bands they come into the picture. It is really important to identify all these accessory bands and cut them sequentially. So, in semitendinosis, there are almost three, uh, in 80% cases, there are three bands and the most proximal one is up to 8 to 10 centimeters from its uh, attachment. So, th these are cut with the uh, scissor. Then, you put your finger deep within. So, if there is any other additional band, palpate it nicely and if it is there, hook with your finger. So, almost till 10 centimeters, it is important to palpate. Is there any additional uh, accessory band or not? So, with the help of harvester, then the harvester is directed gently towards the STL tuberosity, and with the gentle movement, this graft is harvested. If at any point of time you feel this there is <coughs> excessive resistance, then you can just come out, see if there's any band, and then you can cut it. So, the graft is taken out, and now it is really important because there are chances of you may uh, the graft may slip on the floor so hold it properly and while giving to your uh, staff while to your uh, assistant so you should give very gently by direct eye to eye contact because there are cases when you have given the graft for the preparation on the back table your staff is not hold it and there are chances of falling down so this is the harvest of a uh, semi graft now similarly the graceless graft is harvested uh, just we need the sartorial fascia, you pass the curd mixture, hold it and we pull it. Then it is detached from its attachment on the uh, just medial to the tibial tuberosity. 
with the help of neo scissors curved scissors the attachment is gently detached again we use 15 number blade to take it out from the uh, periosteum along with the periosteal sleeve usually there are only very few uh, accessory vents that is one or two accessory vents and they are slightly uh, thinner as compared to the those which are there in the semitic so all these vents they are removed so before proceeding for before putting your stripper it is very important to identify all the accessory vents cut them and then only proceed so this is the you can see this is the second one which we can see only after pulling it and by palpating so it is important to palpate it by your finger go as much as possible so that this is almost 8 to 10 cm you can palpate in the gracilis uh, study tells the most proximal band is still hardly 6 to 8 cm so if you have confirmed with your finger uh, going within there is no band so it means you are safe now you can proceed with the uh, tendon stripper then the small tendon stripper is passed and it is important because at times if it cuts uh, by all of a sudden so this putting this artery forcep as a clamp this protect certain slipping of your graft uh, means retracting of your graft so with gentle movement this uh, gracilis graft is harvested again while taking out and while handing over to your assistant it is important to take care that graft doesn't fall so uh it's really a uh, easy thing not very difficult task if you take care of the anatomy means of your accessory bands it is important to identify palpate it properly before putting a skin in season and all the bands just be identified and cut well uh with the help of tendon stripper you should not force very vigorously so if you will force very vigorously and the direction of force is not accurate then it might cut it prematurely thank you Thank you, Bilbil. We will have a few questions, and I'll request all the uh, speakers to be uh, right on time stick to the schedule. So, if any questions are there, then they are welcome. Yeah, yeah at times. times. There are certain scenarios means when I want to keep the distal attachment intact in case of patellar tendon reconstruction or for the. Uh, MCL, MCL reconstruction. I keep the distal attachment intact and put an open strip. As you are uh, stripping the, as you are stripping the retinal side, how many times you were able to close the sartorius as you were? Pardon? How many times you were able to close the sartorius fascia? The sartorius fascia is not possible to close it completely. You just put two or three stitches on the medial side. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. definitely. You, you just put two, two stitches, stitches medially because at the place of insertion, it is not possible to close the sartorius fascia completely. Yeah, completely. Question: Do you think we should isolate both tendons first, then we should have this? It can be done. See, you, either you can go between the window between means the gracilis and semiti. And then harvest the meat first, or you can go on the top. Means put incision above the gracilis, a uh, reverse L shape incision, and then uh, take whole sleeve of sartorial fascia, where you can see both the graft means gracilis and semiti. You can tag both and detach. So there are number of techniques. So if you are comfortable with that, it is also fair. Yeah. Uh, any tips and tricks? Uh, to prevent the injury to intrapatellar branch of saphenous nerve by harvesting this. See, most of the time, uh, nerve is damaged by putting a long, uh, longitudinal incision. So, if we want to avoid damage to intrapatellar branch of saphenous nerve, it is preferable to give uh, either a uh, transverse incision or a oblique one. Or incision can be shifted slightly more medially, means slightly or more posteriorly. So, damage to the nerve can be avoided. So Now we can have questions in panel discussion. Then otherwise you will be getting late. We just have one extension of this, sir. Uh, when you open a use a open stripper, are there any tips to take the semi-D with leaving the uh, distal end intact? Pardon? Open stripper. Yeah. 
taking a skimmy tea and keeping the distal attachment intact. Yeah. Anything different than you do with the open stripper? See, while putting open stripper, it is really difficult. Means you need to take more care because uh, when we have detached from the insertion site, we can palpate our accessory bands very nicely. We can take it out comfortably. But at the time of uh, putting open uh, uh, stripper, so you need to take more care because the accessory bands now they come in the line with the tendon. So you should hook it first, pull it more uh, proximally, and then identify the accessory band, cut it. That is the only place where you need to take extra care. Otherwise, things are same. One question. Uh, so have you ever found that there is absence of semi tendon, even after palpating the bump, when you go for harvesting the graft and you see only gracilis is there, no semi is there? Uh, honestly, not yet. But see, so anatomical case, variations are there. At times you find more distal attachment of the semi yes, more broad attachment. So you need to take uh, care. See, in that scenario, uh, Dr. What Dr. Ashish told, you can take out the sartorial fascia completely, make a reverse L shape incision, detach the sartorial fascia approximately till four to five centimeter uh, below the table tuberosity, evert it completely, and then you can have a nice look. I always do like that only, but it yeah. happened with me one, in one case. Anatomical variations are known to happen. Uh, thank you, Bradish. Thank you for a nice talk. Let's move on to and in further talks. There will not be any questions. The it will all the questions will be directed in the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, now may I invite uh, Dr. Aditya Bosra for BTB harvest, bone tendon bone, I gold standard in ACLR. Tips for passage. Good morning, seniors and colleagues. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So bone tendon bone graft one of the best graph, the live graph, and has the very less revision rates. So we'll see the technique one by one. What are the prerequisites for the bone tendon bone graph? The micro saw is one of the prerequisite, and for that the saw blades. Now these saw blades should be of the thickness of 0.5 and 0.6 mm, not more than that, and the width of 5 mm and 10 mm. Uh, we should always mark our target on the blade with the marker pane approximately 1 cm as we have seen in this. Approach, it is a medial parapatellar incision. Central incision should be avoided because it leads to the more painful uh, um, wounds and it is all because of the neurectomy. Exposure, it should be a sharp dissection. We should separate the ten, uh, tendon and paratendon and we should develop the medial and lateral cutters. Now we should start at the tibial tubercle bone plug. We should mark uh, approximately the width and the length of the bone to be harvested. But before that, it is very important that we should measure the tendon length at the flexion from the inferior pole of the patella to the superior part of the tibial tubercle. So the ideal width is approximately 10 mm and the length of the bone plug could be approximately 25 mm. As we were discussing that maximum tendon length that is permitted uh, in the BTB is approximately 5 cm but in our scenarios in Indian patients it is 4 to 4.5. If it is around 5 cm or more than that we should reduce our bone blocks to 1.5 to 2 cm. Mark the graph completely and also mark for the KY drilling in situ because when we are drilling 
at in situ uh, it is very easy to pass the sutures after uh, we complete our bone cuts as uh, we have discussed that pre drilling with k wire it helps in the suture passer uh, su uh, suture passings two to three in number one at the osseo tendinous junction and it prevents the crushing sharp dissection of the tendon should be carried out on both sides so that soft tissue is not damaged now the technique to cut as we can see that the red part is the cortical bone and the green part is the cancerous bone cortex should be cut at the 90 degree it should be a 90 degree vertical cut as soon as we get the give away feeling we should stop at that point and we should go 35 to 40 degree oblique loop first distal part of the tibial tuberosity to be cut bone cut should be matched and they should be completed before harvesting we we should finish this cu cuts on both sides uh, tibial as well as the patellar side the most important cut in the patella is the horizontal cut we should elevate the tibial plug first develop the uh, space between the tendon and the fossa spat pad and after finishing our oblique cuts we should take this horizontal cut because if we damage the inferior pole of the patella there are very high chances of the fracture so you can see that exact depth of 1 cm is reached paratendon closure is of utmost important it is the anatomical closure now we can see that the graph harvested it has a patellar bone which is going to the femur approximately 2.5 cm tendon of approximately 3.5 cm and tibial plug of 3 cm graph sizing now the utmost important is passage of the graft as well as the placement of the graft a graft placement in the femur the cancellous portion of the graft should uh, face us anteriorly supposedly this is the uh, uh, femoral tunnel of 10 mm we have drilled this is the graft on the posterior inferior aspect of the tunnel we should pass guide wire Uh, before passing the graft and our screw should be in the anterior superior part and the screw should be uh, holding the cancellous part not the cortical part because if the if it holds the cortical part there are very high chances that there may be blow out of the posterior that's why we are talking about the uh, sorry for this uh, the video is not running i will show you shortly now for the tibial graft placement the graft should be anterolateral and the screw should be posteromedial this also should be followed in a similar manner as we do it for the femur final tibial fixation screw fixation posteromedial this is the grade 3 pivot this patient has medial as well as lateral meniscus injury along with the acl injury This video is also not running. Sorry for that. This is the post-operative X-ray, and there is uh, uh, one important paper uh, when I was running through the literature that bone tendon autograph. As we were discussing that the tendon length is very important. If the tendon length is coming more than four point five, then we should do it like a central cord cord tendon. We should just harvest the tendon from the superior uh, surface of the patella along the inferior aspect, along with the periosteum. so this will act like a central cord tendon graft thank you no questions afterwards now may i invite dr arjun jain to present his talk on peroneus longus technique and current literature to support its use
A very good morning to everyone, all my seniors and my colleagues. So uh, today I have been given the topic to uh, discuss about the Peronius longest graph harvest. And uh, we've all seen that uh, there has been a lot of choices for the graph, but uh, with time, the things are evolving. So Peronius longest graph nowadays is being publicized. Uh, we'll see around uh, about the patient preparations and positioning. So I usually do it with a trolley, keep my uh, patient's foot over there so that it's easy to take the incisions in a standing position. Uh, we take a two to three centimeters incision on the skin just at the, uh, posti uh, at the posterior border of uh, uh, fibula, around two to three centimeters above the malleolus. And we take the superficial fascia and the uh, tendon sheath is open in the same line. Uh, I'll just show you a few pictures so that you have an idea about what is the procedure and then we'll show you the video. So once you have opened the soft tissue and the, uh, uh, the fascia, then you can identify this glistening uh, tendon of the peroneus longest and when you just flip it down you will find another smaller again a shiny tendon which is peroneus brevis now uh, the best part is how do you differentiate between these two is very easy your peroneus longest is a very big muscle and it has a muscle belly which is quite proximal while the peroneus brevis is a muscle which is quite from down this uh, part so you will find few red fibers always attached with this in this type. See, if you start uh, dissecting that part, you'll finally see few red fibers which are attached to one of the tendons. The other tendon will always be very clean of the uh, red fiber attachments. So this is how you basically differentiate between the red and the longest. So this is how you give an incision and then you try to separate the soft tissues from behind. So there might be some additions. So you it from the other side and ask any instrument so that you can identify and separate out the erroneous longus. Now once the longus and uh, brevis has been identified, uh, we give whip stitches directly to the Peronius longus, and uh, we'll uh, leave about one centimeter of distal part of that longus so that it can be easily tenodicized with the brevis tendon. So, in this, so you can see that uh, we have started doing the wave stitch, and then we have given another stitches beside or distal to the whip stitch, which is connecting the brevis and the longus. This is how you will whip stitch the peronus longus. And then this is the way the penodesis is done for the distal part. The distal part where you do the penodesis, you completely stitch it and cut the suture there while the whip stitch are used to retract the tendon and then we take the cut from that side. So this is how it, uh, once you cut down the tendon with uh, just proximal to the uh, tenodesis uh, stitch, this is how it works. So this is how I have taken the you know, this is stitch distally and the whip stitch proximally and then dividing in between so that the whole thing is separated. Then we take the steelies and we try to separate the additions with the subcutaneous skin between the tendons and the tendon sheet, both proximally, distally and inferiorly so that there is no uh, premature amputation of the peroneus. Mm -hmm. 
to finally you put on the stripper i use a open stripper and then gradually and swiftly you start uh, getting it outside and then this is how you get it so once we have uh, seen this procedure i went for the current literature so this technique is probably not very uh, uh, very old uh, the last papers were somewhere in 2018 which were given in the uh, literature so first literature which uh, shows about the anatomy and the pathology of this uh, peroneus ten uh, longus muscle was given by james thomas patrick he had a description about the tendon quality as well as the biomechanics which would resemble somewhere the hamstrings and other things then there was a uh, paper on this uh, knee surgery sports stomatology arthroscopy in 2020 which gave us gave us an idea of comparison between the hamstrings autograft as well as the peroneus longus autograft there was a functional uh, outcome comparison of this Uh, these two graphs, uh, he, J, Tang, Q, they had done this uh, study. So they basically found that uh, there was a promising balance between the uh, peroneus longus graft and semi T graft. The functional outcomes were quite similar for the knee, but then people started asking, "What about the knee and ankle things? What, sorry, the, what about the ankle problems? Because we are taking out a big tendon from the." lateral aspect of ankle so is it going to give any other problems so there was another paper which was uh, so they uh, again reviewed in a systematic uh, manner and they found that there was insufficient evidence to support that the peroneus longus over other graft of primary acl reconstruction is actually very good so they uh, did a study of 130 136 uh, articles they had reviewed and they gave us a conclusion that maybe a peroneus longus graft might not be a very good option because of the donor site problems because of the uh, instability of ankle so after this uh, paper another research was done to evaluate the donor ankle functions after harvesting peroneus longus which was done in 2021 again and it is given in jcdr it was done by mamanta manjuri sahu and etern so they tried to yeah, yeah. get anything about this and uh, the the conclusion was that the evaluation of functional outcome showed gradual and linear improvements at subsequent post operative visits and up to 6 months it was almost back to normal so this was another uh, set about the peroneus longus so now the choice or the decision uh, maybe is up to you or up to the surgeon what he is comfortable with thank you thank you arjun now the next and last talk uh, i invite dr pankaj vyas uh, for presenting cqt pulse pitfalls and technique i don't know the meaning of this but yeah whatever cqt think uh, it's clear central quadriceps tendon graft thank you everyone uh, thank you seronic for arranging all this uh, great meeting i'll be sharing my experience with the central quadriceps tendon graft and how i use in my practice when and why quadriceps central quadriceps tendon graft i generally use in multi ligament injuries revision situation and few select primary acl recast of it and uh, for a multi ligament injury quadriceps tendon is the front runner for pcl graft and can avoid graft harvest from opposite side in multi ligament injuries my preference of graft type is first is semitian gracilis second is first tendon and third is peroneus longus if you have this all these three tendons you can do almost any multi ligament case uh, without going to contralateral side what are the 
pitfalls. Uh, central quadruple tendon cannot be used for MCL, MCL, and PLC. As limited femoral implant options, and it's not so long that if you want to lengthen it, you will have to have it. Uh, bone plug, that is a bone plug. Uh, when I use in uh, revision situations, uh, why I use it for revision situations because we have graph size modularity. That is, you can harvest graph, uh, harvest this graph up to 11 millimeters depending on your tunnel size. For the other pitfall, you cannot do it in a revision of a BTB surgery. And when I do a primary initial reconstruction with a CQP, the indications are uh, the players with hamstring dependent athletes like soccer, tennis, basketball, and, and what are the pitfalls where I cannot use or there are few limitations that is, uh, limited femoral suspensory implant options. All soft tissue graft has. Uh, length in the challenges anytime it is around 60 65 only, like in this condition. Uh, I harvest this graph in swimming like position. I mark the patella. I prefer a vertical integer because if I want to extend it, I can extend it. And there are no risk of uh, sensory uh, nerve involvement in this case. Uh, first, we decide that to carotene. Retinal is vertically incised for later closure. And central portion marked with a sterile uh, master pen in width and length. In width and length. Leave a margin of 2 mm from immediate terminal portion and laterally you can go up to your choice. And then it videos from a uh, superior pole of patella with sharp dissection to the end is rated with high strength features uh, to aid in further detection. Here is a video showing the graph rating and distal features and detachment. I have to avoid entering into supra many times we may enter into supra but it has no consequences if you again repair the two and the two and the two. Make sure uh, adequate length of uh, your graph before amputating the graph. If superficial epidermal power is breached. It has to be securely closed before further adjustment. Grass preparation has limited options. And this is the fully prepared graph to be used. My take home message would be if you are doing your ACM reconstruction, it's frequency. 
Question might be your primary graph now, and shall be well in most cases. But there will be situations where you are pressed for a graph other than homestead. In this scenario, security has an important role. Thank you, Pankaj, for this significant time. Now, may I invite all the panelists on the stage so that the panel discussion can begin. We can spare around 12 minutes in all. I would like to thank our chairperson for uh, moderating this session. May I request uh, Dr. Manish Mahishwari to facilitate uh, Dr. Lunawar, sir. May I request Dr. Ankush Agarwal to visit uh, Dr. Alukdin. Ankush. Thank you, sir, for giving your valuable time. I thanks my chairperson. For this session, now I would like to invite the panelists for this uh, panel discussion. Uh, may I request Dr. Sachin Jain from Gaulia, Dr. Sumitra? Before we take over leave, it's my last privilege because something was interesting over there, and I would like to ask two questions before your questions start. Because if I go without asking one a single question, sir, we, we are coming to question answer session only. So the panelists will sit here, and then we will have open forum for questions. Okay. 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 So, uh, yeah, Dr. Sachin Jain from Golia, Dr. Sunit Rasekar from uh, Bhilai, and uh, Dr. Abhishek Kalantri from Indore. Now, I will uh, request all the four speakers, they will not be allowed to sit, they will be standing here so that delegates can ask direct questions to them. So, we will have an open fire round. May I request Dr. Brajesh, Dr. Pankaj, Arjun, and Dr. Aditi to come again. Mike, uh, panelists, uh, I guess, uh, so the, the pattern on this question and answer session will be Abhishek. So we got a four speakers in your front. So the first uh, question will be asked from the delegates and uh, uh -huh. followed by our panelists. So anybody, sir. We want to just, I will just, yeah, yeah, yes, we just give me one more. That's why, because I'm, so, I have one specific question to Arjun only, because yeah. I'm not going to ask anything about the office to okay. But the most important thing, what is the position of the foot and ankle when you can use the turn as long as to prevent pains? One. Second thing, like you mentioned that the effects of the deficit over there uh, has ne never been uh, uh, assessed exactly. What is the contraindication for harvesting a permanent longest term? Thank you, sir. That's a very good question. So the first and foremost uh, prerequisite for this is that you have to first assess the functionality of the ankle. And it has to be done preoperatively. You have to counsel the patient about the uh, graft procedure. I never do this peroneus longest before uh, without talking to the patient. Because they will have an, uh, pain over the ankle and they'll ask you, we had a surgery for the knee, but we are having pain in the ankle. So what is the reason? So the most important thing is first you have to counsel the patient and you have to talk to them. If this is going to be the procedure, you will harvest the tendon from there. 
Uh, usually, somehow, I feel that in females, I'm more comfortable to your peroneus longus. Two reasons, you have a very small incision, you don't have a big scar over the knee. And secondly, uh, because they have a problem for the hamstring or uh, these type of uh, tendons, especially hamstring, they're quite small, so you don't actually get a good strength of the graft. And secondly, you always assess the ankle. There's no pathology or there's no ankle weakness or there's no prior previous injuries of twisting. Then only I would prefer because otherwise she might land up on patient might land up with some kind of uh, disability of the ankle. Again, the these uh, papers which I have reviewed, they specifically have uh, the stores of AOGS and others also for the ankle function. They had a very small difference after six months, not before that. So definitely you have to counsel the patient. Thank you very much. On the contrary, you will have to be more careful in opting this procedure in females, like to opt middle ladies. That is it. That we shall discuss later. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the, the pattern that we are going to follow in this uh, particular discussion that all the four speakers are there in the front of you. So already we have finished up with the questions of the hamstring. Then we will come to the second talk, BTB, followed by Peronius, followed by security. So we will have a we will allow almost four questions per speaker. Out of these, the two questions will be asked by the delegate, and the panelists will ask two questions, and then we'll have an interaction among the same question. So uh, we will start with the question of the BTB harvest by Dr. Aditya. So if there are any questions for BTB. Sir, one question for him saying actually. Yeah. So uh, uh, many times we find that this uh, graft amputates. So, how much length is sufficient, which is there after amputation? You consider it to be sufficient, and how to how to hold this graft when you, we are pulling the graft for our rescue? So, do you put uh, stitches or to hold it hard piece or such or such? So, I always hold with the number five if you want. If it amputates before 24 uh, millimeter, 24 centimeter. See, at least 24 centimeter of the graft is required for me because I always quadruple it. So, if anything, uh, uh, which is less than 24, I'll go and uh, and offer the peroneus or something else. So, 24 is the cutoff for me. If it amputates before that, then I'll have to offer some other graft. If I get 24 length, then I'll be happy. You know, sir, if you opt for some other graft, what do you do with the semi T which has been amputated, uh, short of length? I you... to, because uh, I almost always uh, detach it from the uh, uh, attachment side. I'll have to discard it. Or I can use it in a double way. Means I'll combine the peroneus along with the double semi -t. So if you have only uh, used an open stripper, you, kept, you keep the insertion intact. What do you do? Do you want to suture it back to the desalis into the strength of hamstrings or you would detach it and then again do this? See, if the distal attachment will intact and if it is unprotected, so it won't be won't be easy to reattach to suture back to the muscular tendon. Wherever, wherever on desalis, if you can, do. do you ever do it or you just detach it and leave it? Honestly, uh, till date, I have not I have not faced the premature amputation problem. So no, nobody has been so fortunate. I think, I think we will go on to the BTB question. So, after the BTB, Peronius and CKD, if we got time, then we can ask open question to any of the speaker. So, the, the question is open for the second talk that is by Dr. Aditya. So, any questions for bone tendon bone graft? Yeah. BTB, man, 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 sir, man. sir, please. I have a basic question for all the four speakers. One is, how do you initially palpate? The gracilis and hamstring tendons and decide about the site of the incision. Are there any yardsticks for that? Or uh, you simply do it this way and just incise? It is one. The second question is that you have a multiplicity of getting the harvested tendon. That in itself suggests that probably not one is universally satisfying to everyone. What are the criteria for getting into a patient where you will have a hamstring, where you will have a baroneus, where you will have a EPD? Uh, sir, for answer for the first question. 
uh, one centimeter lateral to the table tuberosity, I will uh, uh, palpate it with my finger and uh, will get the bumper effect. At that side, I will give an oblique incision. That is the first part. And the second part, uh, my graft choices are different dependent, sir. Uh, they are not uniformly uh, defined. Uh, for the uh, uh, Indian males, I will go for the hamstrings. Indian females, because I get the short grafts, I will go for the short stature females, I will go for the peronias. And for the sports person, I will go with the BTB. These are my choices. So among the panelists, is there a difference of opinion? Like when you will go for a BTB or when you will go for a peronias? Issue? Basically, what we are uh, most comfortable uh, with, whatever graft we are using almost in all kinds of patient is a primary graft. Unless yeah, until so there is a contraindication. Contra it's not like if, if it's a sports person, we are going for DTV. If it's a female, we are going for some other graft. We are not, we normally don't uh, discriminate on this basis. Sir, in my practice, I do hamstring for primary and uh, BTV only for revision. For revision. Sorry. Uh, so, sir, I think uh, PL is a very readily available small uh, incision graft. We should not underplay the importance of PL. Uh, what's important is when we put a scope before we have the tendons, we can see the ACL which is torn or the other ligaments which are torn, or the PCL which is torn. So, that gives us an idea of how thick the tendons and the ligaments of a patient have. And the female patients, when we see the wrist, we see the palmaris longus, we see the FCLR. So, so know, for primary, what is your first choice? So, the patient always is to hamstring, you, always, so always hamstring. hamstring. Semi-T only, all inside. If need be, yes sir. What about other speaker, Dr. Pankaj? I mean, is a choice depending on... My I am asking the question, please. For a standard ACL, only sports person, Mike. I use a flexible lab. If generally I use quadruple infinity and quadruple fractal experience, which comes from the material. It is very good. In sports person, we use a quadruple center. Arjun? I think it's like the answer is usually the same. So, uh, what is the requirement of the patient is more important. Definitely, usually I'm using semi to restless, not one person is required. In few cases, I'm doing uh, theromias. Rarely, because probably I can I go into the practice. PTB was not very much into the system, so I'm not very much you know, confident with that. So very rarely I've been using that. Probably it all depends on patient uh, the surgeon's confidence on the procedure rather than actually the thing with what the reviews or what the literature shows. So we will have a combined uh, opinion poll on the you will be getting a question on your WhatsApp. So, which choice is the best choice for the first standard primary ACL reconstruction? So, Harsh is going to pose that question into the group and we will have opinion of all of the house and uh, whatever the result we will show you in the probably in the next uh, session. So, coming back to the question to the, for, uh, regarding the bone tendon bone graft by uh, to Dr. Aditya, any question related to BTP regarding the graft harvest passage, any, any queries by any of the delegates or Yes, sir. Right, so explain it. Sir, uh, centrally, uh, it has been shown that the nerves they uh, co uh, merge with each other. If we take the central incision and we cut the paratinin centrally, then there are more chances that that wound would be painful post operative. Uh, there will be neural yeah, It will not be difficult to. No, sir. Mm -hmm. Because why we flex the.
Yeah. My question is, so 15 millimeter is out. Yes. So what what do you do? Uh, sir, then uh, if 15 millimeter is out and if the bone plug is around the uh, 2.5, mm-hmm. so I will lock with one screw above. Lock with one screw above and uh, uh, deprive the rest of the rest because at, otherwise it will be a. So the, the concept is minimum 10 millimeter of BTP graph should be there inside. Problem is when you got a graph length of over 20 and the 15 is out, then it's a trouble. So there are multiple options. You can use a peripheral fixation. You can make a trough. You can cut that BTB and then just fix it with the screw. So these are certain options which are available. So coming to the next talk, there was a peroneus loggers by Dr. Arjun uh, James. So I think it's going to have a lot of questions because uh, peroneus is the one graph which always creates a lot of controversies. One controversy already created by Dr. Alok Jain. <laughs> So, because the foot and ankle surgeon will say, oh, my, don't don't use peroneus. My question is, the peroneus longest tendon uh, harvesting is, do you select patient activity according to the condition of the foot, under protectors, uh, over protectors, flat foot? If, if there is a problem with the ankle, then I'm definitely not... No, 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 it is not the problem with the ankle. These are the normal variants of the foot, like under protectors, many, many of them are over protectors. So, do we select the patient according to your? Definitely, you have to examine the patient's gait and everything so that the, uh, the patient doesn't line up with the ankle problem. So, which are the patients we exclude? So, we have to suit for the strength. You always take the inverter strength. You always see for the range of movement. You always see for squatting problems. If they have a problem. No, in among the these normal variants, which are the patients which should, you should exclude from? Getting, uh, taking out these uh, perineus longus tendons. Oh, right. yeah. Actual contraindication as per the foot pathology. So this is the foot and ankle pathology. I will never harvest perineus. Yeah. I think that foot is one of them because in these patients, they usually have a problem with diameter of you already. So I would not touch them first and foremost. I've seen a few patients who had uh, alex perineus and Somehow they had this problem also of ankle pain. So I usually try to avoid that. See, Alex valgus is always associated with that foot. Uh, it is a heel, heel valgus which is giving, giving rise to the Alex valgus. So it is a different pathology. I am talking about over pronation, under pronation, supinated foots. These are the foot variants. <laughs> which are the foots you should avoid to take this pernicious longest graph? So one is it? Yes, Amit. Yeah, uh, Arjun, uh, a patient, short female patient with flat foot, uh, will be short. And uh, what graph will you prefer then? I mean, perineus longest, we keep an option. What uh, will you prefer? Then, then uh, we, we are usually, we can utilize a central cordyceps. That's why we go to the Because I have not tried beyond my experience right now. So, Nowadays, uh, uh, young surgeons they are preferring perineus longus in every cases, but I suppose hamstring is should be the main concern. I mean, main. Yeah, sure. I also, I also should say my first preference is for hamstring graft, but in few cases, I usually I go for a perineus. My question to Pankaj sir. No, we will come to the next year. Uh, perineus were continued. Uh, yes, sure. any question related to perineus? Uh, last question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Arjun. You Tino D's the graph, right? Yeah. Now, uh, one of the largest centers where they do this is Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian surgeons have actually stopped Tino D's. So, uh, what is your uh, science behind Tino D's itself? Because uh, those people say that if you Tino D's it, it leads to a very painful bump. Yeah. So, we should not rather do it. The second question you're talking of uh, using peroneus for short, stocky females. Most of these females have valgoid knees. To compensate their valgoid knees in gait, they end up with a slight heel virus. They also have a lot of pest planus component. Now, they, they need strong inverter. I understand that they have bad hamstrings. So, if you to prevent bad hamstrings graph, you take out the peroneus and then inverter of the foot, which is required for a valgoid and somebody who needs good inversion, are you not actually putting it at the desert? Should you not contemplating Ankit Sir's graph? That's uh, the first question I'll say. Uh, if, the point what I feel is if you know this, that's why whenever I'm taking a good stitch, 
take the switch I again C and mark the Z point so that my tangent length distal attachment to that point is almost similar in mm -hmm. order to change. So I take that analysis switch exactly the same point from the in the same length, but that should uh, that should will be similar length. So that should avoid the problem of imbalance between the two tendons while it is working. And uh, definitely the point is nowadays there are stop stop switches and still to my uh, I would say that we have a good sleep. I the, I think we the, can use an absorbable suture rather than a non-absorbable suture in such cases. Yeah. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. For the short structured females, uh, again, the patterns again depending on the foot uh, biomechanics of the foot. Exactly. Uh, foot uh, the, uh, this, the condition of the foot. If they have a problem with the, the ankle, I'll definitely have to use that. I'll go for ankle. Mm -hmm. See or let me ask you, you are telling black foot patients are going to be using more pregnant slanders right. So on the contrary, these black foot patients have poor functioning of the urethras. So in these patients, definitely a pregnant slanders right can be used. There is a patient in whom there is over supination. Who should be using the pregnant slanders right? Oh, I would say because I had two bad experiences, that's why I am sharing this. They already had a problem with the ankle. Now you do something for the ankle and they keep on nagging you that, sir, you operated, since you have operated, now I have got a pain. I have so that is the reason I'm thinking that if the patient has a, uh, 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 biomechanics are not good for the ankle, then you do something for the ankle which is already there, they will take you to a suit. So that is the whole concept what I utilize for my ankle. We'll move on, move on to the central cordyceps tendon graph, sir, if there are any questions, your, uh, yeah, security. This is the bonus graph with the process of tendon or you take only soft tissue graph tensile center? Personally, I take only soft tissue. Any question related to center body? Sir? Amit wanted to ask. Yeah, Manish. I'm just saying, I'm just, uh, my question is specifically for TCL reconstruction when you see CPT. You mentioned the average size may be around 60, 65 or 50, lower 50. size. So how do you make it is TCL? Sir? Minimum uh, which I got is around 60. But you can get longer. So for the TCL, how do you do it? What size you want? PCL like reconstruction. For PCL PCL reconstruction. Uh, I never educated from a topical fixation. I uh, rely on future posts and future days. So a uh, graph of around 70 would be enough for me. I'll have uh, around 15 in my physical circuit. And I'll have around 10 to 15 inside my TBL circuit. So that will suffice. Before you do sustainable fixation for this, both sides, you know, I use a sustainable fixation on the moral side and use a cortical fixation on the TBL side. Sunny? Uh, so another CQT. If it's a division scenario, we don't have the hamstrings. Uh, CQT is still an option, the best option, or we would go for the contralateral hamstrings. Personally, I don't want to violate a normal knee as perceived by the patient. So, my, my argument would be if you do it on the other knee, the graft harvest related problems go away. So, whatever is happening, the anterior knee pain, the knee pains are all attributed to the fixation of the ACO. And the other knee will only have pain of the harvest. So, I'm trying to divide it here. Am I wrong? How wrong am I in this concept? Uh, I think there is no appreciable uh, repetitive pain after a CQ. There is no repetitive pain. I mean, kneeling down is a pain, is a problem almost eight to nine months. Kneeling down on the patella. I mean, a little bit nagging pain. Some people have excruciating pain. It can, it can differ. But two, three, two, three months, they definitely have a... No? For two, three months, every ACL patient has something. Every uh, sir, sir, you are doing this in a uh, multi case only. Right? So, further damaging the cordyceps tendon in an already damaged knee. In place of that, what he is saying, we can harvest simply from out of those side. And, uh, my, like, my philosophy in that case is, I am not damaging uh, cordyceps tendon. 
can be given part of what is your presence, and which has the capacity, capacity to regenerate. And we, if I take a whole string, I'll be permanently taking out that whole string. If I take a portion of what is that, that will is always hamstring. Yeah. Uh, only the semi deep. Still, you think there will be a weakness in the hamstring? No, it is, not, it is not about the strength of hamstring. It is about uh, one logistic. We yeah. have to pay the you know, thing. You have to, uh, if you are taking a particular sample from the same unit in these units. Yes, Ankush? No, sir, is there any scenario where uh, because the graph size is less, you've gone ahead and taken the bone plug also? Uh, it, is, it is generally sufficient because you, you can uh, very well uh, manage your graph. Right. You can go up. Right. And, and for, for people who are not using suspension fixation, so would it be better to take a bone plug? Are there any disadvantage to take a bone plug along with it? A bone plug has some difficulty in passing in for me. For me. Uh, I'm not very well conversant with uh, bone plug. So uh, there's a value in my hand. Those who are comfortable with UTG, they can be very well done. We'll have last question with Dr. Sunil for this session. Regularly taken bone plug with uh, and uh, what I wanted to bring to everyone's notice is Dr. Rajiv Ramon in particular has demonstrated the superficial box standard graph, which is again a very fantastic graph. You will get a pretty thick graph. And uh, the best part about it is we can fix it just like what we would do with any instance graph for a perimeter. Yeah, please. Sir, uh, this question is regarding the borders of Stenberg. You take any lateral view accident uh, when you are taking the cortex of the Pardon? Lateral view in the accident of the knee. Yeah. What are the in conditions to what? That uh, knee will get an MRI of the knee. So we have a uh, certain idea of uh, this question. And uh, regarding uh, uh, failure rates of the cortex of the knee in his studies? Around 16 to 17 percent in the division. division. In the region, there is, there is there is no data as far as it's recent in Isakos general. The study by Danish Vijay yeah. from 2000, 2005 to 2017. They told that taking the quarter of down, the revision rate is higher. Yeah. Compare, uh, compared to other families. But if you, you read that paper very carefully, they have clearly mentioned because there are less number of center cordyceps tendon which are happening all over the world. So probably that is giving the wrong message that CQT may lead to uh, a lot of revision surgery. So that is that was that they was shown in the paper. So, so once we do more CQT, we will be having a better results all over the group. So that's why one uh, central cordyceps tendon group has been formed worldwide. So you can input your uh, results into that group. Yes, sir, so, in, uh, yeah, we will come to the last question. In post of behavioralism, we find the quadriceps muscle to be very difficult to recover actually. And uh, further, if we take graft, is it going to change your rehabilitation protocol or it is going to prolong the rehabilitation? Fortunately, it has not been like that. The quadriceps atrophy mainly depends on the time and other things. You know, so taking a part of the product of the no, no, I am saying, does it prolong the rehabilitation time? No, 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 no. You can, if you have approximated or okay. even not approximated your point of okay. you can uh, continue with your routine. Okay. Yeah, we will end this session. Uh, thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, our uh, panelists. So, we will move on to the next session. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. So, I now invite Dr. Jagdap sir, for the relive surgery on the ACL evolution. I'll invite uh, Dr. Manish Maheshwari, Dr. Sachin, and Dr. Murtuja for chairing this session, for moderating the live surgery.
So good morning everyone. So this is Relay Surgery session and is uh, requested by the organizers. So in this session you are allowed to ask any question during any stage since this is a Relay Surgery we will request the speaker to pause for that moment and answer your query whatever it may be. So please feel free to ask any question. Dr. Jagtap sir has very good experience yeah. of this sir I believe this is suture anchor fixation. Yeah, two okay. suture anchors. So uh, this is actually, very innovative technique. I think some of us might not have seen it before. So take your time and have this privilege to ask questions to Jagtap sir. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one of the few instances when we go for anterior cruciate ligament repair. As you uh, repair the femoral avulsion, this is the TBL bony avulsion uh, repair that I am going to talk about, and I would be uh, discussing steps and then uh, show play a short video on bone model and the uh, operative uh, procedure. So do let me know if you have any queries. So uh, as you all know, any displaced type of ACL bony avulsion, TBL bony avulsion fixation needs uh, repair, and uh, whatever the goals of treatment. For this repair, are uh, anatomical, a stable and a rigid fixation, which will eliminate the uh, extension block and impingement, as well as aid in early rehabilitation and mobilization of the new joint. And what are the treatment options we have? Surgical options. First is uh, pull out sutures, uh, which uh, have distinct uh, disadvantages in the fact that it may not be a totally anatomical. Uh, Fixation leading to some anterior beaking, and uh, uh, because it is a distal fixation, you may not be happy with the overall stability of fixation. Also, in skeletally immature, you need to drill through the facies, which is not a very good idea. The second most common uh, fixation is by uh, use of screw, uh, where uh, uh, definitely it is a very very rigid fixation, but uh, you may need a C arm. As well as the screw heads become proud after some time, which necessitates a second surgery. And in skeletally immature, the it is very difficult to put the screw in the direction. Also, there are some issues regarding the screw length and the trajectory of the screw. Even in uh, comminuted fractures, it is difficult to put the screws. There are other treatment options like uh, staples that were tried, but we are not very much successful because of uh, back out of these staples. So uh, this uh, other pin fixation is also not very much popular now. So why suture anchor? Because there are a lot of studies now, and as uh, most of you being shoulder surgeons, you know that you are uh, using anchors uh, left, right, and center, and then they are working quite well. And especially considering the fact that these are young people, when where you get ACL avulsion, so suture is not a big issue. The requirement for this all inside ACL avulsion fixation is uh, two uh, suture anchors. One is a double loaded anchor and one is a knotless anchor. Uh, third uh, uh, portal needs a passport cannula and uh, suture shuttle devices in the form of either the lasso or a self retrieving suture devices. So I will be uh, discussing with the steps that are uh, followed uh, while repairing this avulsion TBL fragment. The first step is. Uh, uh, position of the patient and the portal. The only one additional uh, trans patellar tendon portal is used, uh, uh, along with anterior middle anterior lateral portal. We use a uh, passport cannula. Patient can be uh, uh, the table can be broken or it can be a flat supine position. Once you are done with the portal, then you identify the crater. You drain the hemorrhosis and put a double loaded titanium or any peak anchor on the posterior part of this crater once you are done with this then you uh, pass the four threads of this anchor from behind anteriorly with the help of this suture shuttle devices like suture lasso or a self retrieving anchor so that uh, you uh, get all the four threads from behind to anterior once you have delivered the suture you will get a configuration like this. Uh, you can tie a central uh, two threads, identical threads in, in knot fashion. But uh, some modification uh, before the, uh, what we have made is uh, while tying the knot, especially in uh, comminuted fragments, you may not uh, damage the fragment more, which may be a distinct possibility in case of screw fixations. 
uh, another modification which we have done we have avoided now these uh, knots in uh, the central portion and we have taken help of these uh, the angle uh, the junction between the anterior horn of meniscus and the acl bony fragment to give a more spread out uh, fixation of this aval fragment if you can see the thread is coming from this junction uh, fourth step is then uh, passing all the four sutures through the a knotless anchor after creating a pilot hole in the intra articular portion of upper end of tibia this is the uh, portion which is uh, to the best of my knowledge not used by anybody for fixation of uh, the fracture finally the fixation is there so that uh, all the bony fragment is seated permanently nicely in an anatomical and a rigid way so that you can mobilize it early so this is now a short video first on the bone uh, model so this is already accepted in arthroscopy technique first you uh, do a scopy you identify the uh, fragment whether it is comminuted or not put a double loaded anchor in the crater posteriorly once it is there you now get four threads from the uh, double loaded anchor all the four threads are now passed from behind anteriorly with the help of either a suture lasso uh, with which you are comfortable or you can also take the help of a self retrieving suture uh, uh, passage device so this is the final configuration that we have just seen on the uh, step you can tie two knots here in the center and then pass all the threads into the uh, intra uh, through the lateral row anchor and put that anchor in the interarticular portion of upper end of tibia to get a very secure fixation so when you are uh, going ahead with the intraoperative surgical practice you again train the hematologist see the configuration of the acl aval fragment once you are not able to say anything so any dip should delegate once you go for a acute acl or not there is some criteria that you will not go on day and you will like to wait for another three or seven days and how will you tackle with that team of process yeah uh, he marks his tackling uh, you uh, i think you need to almost uh, wash it with 2 uh, to 3 liters of saline before you uh, get to see uh, the configuration of the aval fragment so you should be liberal while using normal saline maybe 2 uh, to 3 days down the line you, sh you should be able to go ahead because this is a uh, one of the few instances where you do arthroscopy in acute uh, scenario in trauma so what about intermeniscal ligament intermeniscal you, ligament you should try to preserve as, as much so as possible so you pass those which are big above above the intermeniscal above. Okay. and the uh, bony fragment should be uh, underneath the ligament as it is uh, anatomically sir so, you just say uh, that we need to assess intraoperatively the configuration of the vessel so you need to say we decide for this it's just intraoperatively or we can go to other techniques also if there is combination or if there is uh, uh, other... uh, there is a, a distinct advantage of this procedure even in combination we can just pass uh, because we are passing the uh, sutures at the junction of the acl substance and the bony fragment so uh, if there is combination still we can pass the threads because this is an indirect form of reduction we are not passing any sutures through the bony fragment this this uh, technique will work for all configurations sir. yeah i think so uh, there shouldn't be any uh, issues uh, only thing is that we have to uh, uh, make the rehabilitation slightly slow in comminuted cases you can in that cases if the threads are uh, sort of cutting out then you can tie uh, two central threads for better grip of the uh, fragment how do you go to the posterior part to fix that ankle suture you just uh, lift the uh, fragment it is otherwise also hanging around and whenever you are putting saline then it is slightly above 
and the uh, anchor which you take uh, it is through the trans patellar tendon it goes straight uh, directly on the posterior portion of the crater sometimes there are lot of ablations and some fibers of the uh, the intermenstrual ligaments that are in in between these how to go through that is uh, inter- sometimes quite difficult you have to just uh, elevate the crater part also intermenstrual ligament is quite anterior the crater uh, is uh, on the posterior side near close to pcl if there are some uh, fibers that are coming in the way you can uh, remove those fibers but uh, usually intermenstrual ligament need not be removed or uh, dealt with you should try to preserve the ligament as much as possible because that gives additional stability sir so, how do you assess the depth of the anchor how deep we are going so just uh, the laser mark of the anchor but the cortex thickness of the cortex which is left behind usually uh, you have adequate uh, Length. If you are going horizontally, break, break the cortex posteriorly. Yeah, you can. You may go to the PCL itself, insertion of the PCL. If uh-huh. you are going horizontally, because it is more anterior, PCL insertion is more anterior. No, I didn't get your question. So, how you measure the depth of the anchor uh, which is going inside on the yeah, posterior cortex? The first anchor which you are putting yes, behind. Yes. Yes. So that's what I am trying to tell. Uh, you have adequate uh, uh, tibial uh, cortex posteriorly. to hold the anchor okay. and uh, 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 till now the, there is no breach of posterior cortex okay. so one question sir so when you are putting the anchor in the posterior part does it cause a posterior dipping and overstretching of the nerves uh, because you will be pulling the suture and it will it will take the fragment of verse from the posterior part no the uh, fibers are coming from behind the bony uh, bony uh, avulsion fragment at yes, the sir. junction of the Uh, so uh, ACL and its bony attachment. But sir, you are putting the anchor in the pad of the avulsion fragment. Yeah. And sir, so when you are pulling the sutures, this will definitely uh, take the, the fragment upwards from the posterior part. Uh, you may be right because uh, it is slightly lower so down. So what's going beneath the avulsion fragment? The fibers will be coming under. No, fragment. not under. From behind. Behind the avulsion, that uh, behind the avulsion fragment. Uh, doc, I think let's sir uh, go through the video, then you yeah, will yeah. get the idea. Okay. Sir, one, It's two questions, if you allow. Sir, you are putting your anchor in the bony bag, which is a cancellous bone. So yeah. Have you encountered any time there is transfer uh, nature to that? Uh, yeah. Or sufficient strength because this is purely cancellous bone, and the trajectory we are passing is also something like that. In it is through the cancellous bone. So uh, what kind of anchor? Which size? What configuration? Five point five titanium anchor. I so prefer titanium anchor. Yeah. But uh, there is no pull out, thankfully, because uh, we are uh, encountering young people in this avulsion category. Old people don't get uh, those avulsions. Uh, So what I can guess from your this is you are passing the anchor through the transpatellar portal. Yeah. So what and you are putting a passport cannula also. Yeah. And it must be eight point five. Yeah. So, uh, are we not damaging patellar tendon too much by doing this? What I mean to say, can we pass this anchor through the anteromedial portal or interlateral portal, whatever it, is? It it won't be that central then. The anchor through transpatellar tendon portal is a uh, dead central. that gives a better uh, hold of the anchor and we are splitting the patellar tendon as we are uh, doing in uh, tibia nailing as well as we are harvesting the patellar tendon so i don't think that should cause damage to the tendon yes. the proceed this is the uh, the now video is showing the This is the intra-articular portion of upper end of tibia. Here we have prepared a pilot hole for the fixation of the lateral row anchor, which is a knotless anchor. We have passed all the four thread through this lateral so, row anchor. So, sir, to answer that question which someone was asking, so you can see the threads are coming above the bony fragment to the ACL. So it is not below. So, those threads are coming through the substance of the ACL. I know that. But sir, that anchor, that titanium anchor, is uh, under that fragment. Yeah, it is inside the bone. And when we, you will put, uh, you will pull the sutures 
then the fragment which is attached to the acl will get lifted from the posterior part it yeah i'll draw it what my confusion is i want to make it clear so double yeah it is just like uh, fixing the rotator cuff it is between the junction of the bone uh, bony part of the acl and the soft tissue or the substance of the acl yeah, it this is, is the junction this will not happen this will, sir, will not through the bone jagtab sir yeah i think he is drawing something meanwhile yeah, yeah, finish yeah. so we can take it i will discuss with him uh, afterwards also to save time yeah so now this is the second uh, uh, anchor which is a knotless anchor as you know we are doing shoulder scope just we have to uh, fix the anchor sir, uh, to stop it you here uh, any tip for exposing this part because it is easier said that you will put it there how do you uh, dissect this part so any so tip you, you dissect with shaver and you can uh, easily so identify you go anterior to the uh, meniscus root yeah do you go anterior to the meniscus anterior to the meniscus there is a, a distinct uh, interarticular portion of upper end of tibia you can see next time you do scopy and you you would be really happy and surprised to know that there is some tibia there which we were probably not using and to maintain the exact line of pull your knotted anchor is also dead center central and this knotless anchor will also be central am i right no so this is slightly uh, on the medial side so this is slightly on the because the uh, acl which is there it it is not uh, uh, dead center it goes from medial to lateral side as you all know so the to have a better pull of the acl for the acl you make it slightly medial not central if it is possible and how do you assess this final tension while putting that knotless anchor passing threads through just by uh, with the help of probe okay so one of your assistant will be doing the tightening or at least showing the yeah just and like then you are probing at the same time yeah fixation of the rotator cuff that is the most uh, distinct advantage of this that is the most uh, distinct advantage as you see now in the next uh, x ray the, and uh, i think if i may say so this is the best method as far as pediatric or uh, people with the open fight is there now you can see appreciate that this is a this is a level in uh, pediatric age group you put one anchor above the fight and the other below the fight without uh, 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 damaging the fight and it, 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 that explains the uh, person about uh, uh, posteriorly it is not coming up and the reduction is almost anatomical so that you get a very good function this is the same patient who is uh, before this any difference in rehab protocol so this is one year follow up but we are interested in knowing the immediate and a uh, slightly delayed no, 6 weeks like, three months uh, acl uh, uh, reconstruction you can uh, start so you start mobilizing yeah. very next day early uh, yeah you can mobilize unless the knee is slightly inflamed in because it's a role of non weight bearing walking in this patient to uh, another 10 days or so 10 days so how do you achieve a compression at the fracture site with this type uh indirect method with the help of knotless anchor so the suture is compressing on the posterior part only no posterior and anterior they are coming so anterior you are going above the cortex or above the cortex or tibial surface so there it is not going to compress it yeah it will compress it will because it is coming from it, behind it is a cancerous bone and we usually dip the fragment inside the crater 1 to 1 to 2 mm to get a good compression it is not going to uh, dip the fragment inside its crater yeah definitely you can uh, not push it down uh, beyond its anatomical location you cannot push it down yes so But i think that should be more than sufficient so i think the point yeah. of contact is only posterior part of the fragment only so anteriorly there is also good contact if it is comminuted anteriorly or it is cancerous on the crater is, is more deeper anteriorly it is not going to progress maybe in comminution you have a point 
I think in communication there is higher chance of because once you are pulling your threads for the knotless anchor, there is a chance that you may make it sit on the threader. Yeah, it, it so uh, easily sits on the threader. What uh, what I understand from his question is, uh, it is not giving adequate compression for healing. But I think it is. A I think it's a wonderful technique. We because. Uh, this, there are some, some technical challenges like putting a double row in a knee itself is a challenging. So I will request Dr. Jitav sir to give 5-10 minutes extra to the, the people who are having questions. Like he has got some drawings, so sir please give him some time. His, his technique is available in Orthroscopy Journal. So if you want to see the details uh, already there online and at a very, very wonderful paper. Thank you sir. Sir, one more question uh, before he is putting that. So what is your time frame? Sorry, Manish. So, what is your time frame? Say you can go ahead and do surgery as early as a two or three days post injury. So, what is the maximum time limit till that time you will do ACA levels and fixation with this technique? I have done it after uh, even after six to eight weeks by doing some uh, freshening of edges on both the sides. But then, uh, as uh, Sir has pointed out, you may not get that much compression. Because of the crater has become more uh, deep than compression effect of this uh, procedure. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for this wonderful session, sir. Moving on to the next session on perfecting the art of. ACL reconstruction. We thank you the, the moderators for this wonderful session. Calling on to the uh, next chairperson for the session, Dr. Manoj Bhatt, sir, Dr. Anil Agrawal, sir. Hey, sir. Dr. Manoj Bhatt, sir, Dr. Anil Agrawal, sir. And Dr. Arvind Rawal, sir. First talk of the session was planned by Dr. Mukesh Vedda, sir, on femoral tunnel anatomical drilling. That will be presented by Vikram Gupta, sir. I invite Dr. Sito Gupta for his first talk. Uh, he is uh, in place of uh, Dr. Mukesh Vedda and he will de deliver a lecture on uh, femoral tunnel anatomical drilling. Dr. Sito Gupta. Session is for 8 minutes. I hope uh, he will finish his job in 8 minutes. Mukesh is uh, not well. Uh, Dr. Mukesh is from Nagpur and is a good friend of mine. He just recently travelled back from Dubai and he was not feeling well. So, this femoral tunnel anatomical drilling I am going to take. So, I will try to do justice to his talk. So, basically we have divided uh, this ACL reconstruction technical tips into femoral tunnel and tibial tunnel separately because if uh, if you see the anatomy, the femoral anatomy is uh, different and the, the technique for the femoral tunnel, there are n number of methods which has been described for doing a femoral tunnel drilling. So, still I think the best point where you should do uh, a femoral tunnel drilling is uh, still I would say it is unknown. So, depending on individual surgeons, it is varying but that variation is not more than a millimeter or so.
So I'm going to speak on perfecting the femoral tendon in the ACL reconstruction. All of us look very different. Our faces are not same. So our ACL is definitely going to be different. So these are the patients of mine who have got a normal ACL, but in every patient you will see the ACL looks relatively different. So every ACL surgery is a la carte situation and depending on the anatomy of that patient, you have to individualize the ACL reconstruction, both the femoral side as well as on the tibial side. But still, our faces looks like human being, not like aliens. So the difference lies in a footprint rather than anatomy. The one thing which is clear in ACL femoral tunnel placement, it, it should always be below the lateral ridge. So there is a clear cut demarcation, which is an extension of the posterior cortex of the femur. It's, it's an imaginary line right from the posterior cortex of the femur, which is going down, which is a resident ridge. So it's a kind of a prominence. So you have to be just below that prominence. So it has been divided into different kind of bundle and there was a concept of double bundle. And uh, when we were in Japan, we were doing triple bundle as well. And these are the cadaveric pictures from that time only. So there were intermedial bundle, postulateral bundle and new bundle concept that has come at that time was an intermediate bundle. The bundle will never be sufficient. So even if you see in the orthoscopic anatomy, you can see very well that uh, we got a lateral intercondylar ridge and we got a lateral bifurcate ridge. So bifurcate ridge is dividing it into two portions, the anteromedial and the postulateral bundle. Even in the CT, you can see the same landmarks, the anteromedial and the postulateral bundle, and there is a clear cut lateral intercondylar ridge, which is also called as resident ridge. There has been various attempts to redefine the anatomy. The Smigliski has defined the ACL as a ribbon-like structure and it's a fake like lasagna. So we are anatomical in footprint, but not in the shape. There is all of see been described a fin like extension fiber and the mid substance fiber, which are called as the direct fiber and the indirect fiber. So, if you consider a femoral tunnel anatomy, if you consider a whole of the femoral condyle as a circle, you just divide into two parts. So, this the lower part is where the anatomy of this ACL lies. So, till the time you are below this resident ridge, almost in 95% cases, you will be absolutely right. So you can see in this uh, orthoscopic picture, you identify the proximal cortex, you identify the posterior cortex. So this is the resident ridge. And if you are into that particular zone, you are absolutely right in your footprint. But this can always be achieved not with the transtibial position because you are going to go very higher. So there are four different ways in which you can achieve the anatomy in which you want to keep yourself below the lateral intercondylar ridge. One is a free hand method in which you just take a owl and do a check. You can use the offset guide. You can use a ruler method or you can use a fluoroscopy in fact to see where exactly is your anatomical femoral tunnel be going to. Other methods are outside in zig you can use as a template. So use it as a template and make a mark. And you can then do, uh, do a drilling from outside in. Ultimately, what is the goal? The goal of anatomical ACL reconstruction that it should be match the patient's specific need and should be stored at least 80 to 90 percent of making insertion sites. So coming to the very, very basic uh, concept that once you are doing your orthoscopic ACL reconstruction, you are in 90 degree of flexion. So once what you are thinking as a posterior is not exactly posterior, it is a proximal, which is also called as deep. What you are thinking, which is low or inferior is actually the posterior femoral condyle. So in 90 degree flexion, your orientation change. So high is anterior, the low is posterior, the deep is a proximal and the shallow is the distal one. So correct water placement is the key that the correct AL portal and I always use a central portal for the same. So the advantage of using a central portal is that I will do the debridement of the fat pad. Once you do a good debridement of the fat pad, you are able to see both on the medial side as well as the lateral side. So once this is done, you will be able to see the medial meniscus in a very good way. And a correct AM portal placement is then quite easy. So I will just go below the AM, just above the meniscus. In a such a way that I am targeting my spinal needle towards the femoral tunnel. If my spinal needle is not correct, which I am showing in this example, then my whole of the tunnel will go wrong. If I am too posterior, I am going to hit my articular cartilage. So you have to take precaution that your spinal needle, just avoid put a knife and then dilate it and it should be directed towards the anatomical footprint. What is the key? 
if patient has got some other pathology, use the same spinal needle. See that you are able to reach onto the anterior half of the meniscus, posterior half of the lateral meniscus. If you are able to reach with your spinal needle everywhere and able to reach at the anatomical footprint as well, that would be the correct anteromedial portal, and you can use it for the anatomical drilling. Femoral preparation, you can use any method. After this, you can use a curette. So curette will help you to see the marks very well. Don't do such deep curette. So to uh, just uh, debride your resident ridge. The resident ridge should be preserved. Or you can use uh, expensive radio frequency uh, devices in almost in all cases. I use it only in the revision cases, in which you can see I am able to identify the previous tunnel very well using the radio frequency device. So I use a combination of two techniques, which is basically a offset guide technique as well as a freehand technique. So this is the technique is a pilot hole and the probe technique, in which what I am doing. You can see I am first calculating how much is the footprint size, which is close to around 10 millimeter to 12 millimeter. Once this is done, I will use a curette. So with the curette, what is happening? Just in a single go, I am able to expose my footprint very well. So once my bony anatomy is clear, then I will use a probe again. You can see this is the resident ridge which I am seeing. So I want to just go into that center. So first, I will use offset guide. I will make a pilot hole. So this is a pilot hole. This is not the definitive hole. I will check from the intermedial portal. I can use my probe again. So, if I am really with the 9, 4.5 is down, 4.5 is in the front, 4.5 is proximal, posterior. So, once this is done, you are sure that you are not going to blow out any of the cortex. So, once any of the cortex is not blown out, then your placement is going to be correct. Once this is done, you will again check from the intermedial portal. You will see your position. So, that at least in the next case, you can see. Uh, so, around 2 millimeter of Bone is bone bridge is there both proximally as well as posteriorly, and this is below the resident ridge. So once you use this technique, then you are you will be able to in a better anatomical position. What happens if you got an incorrect pilot hole? So like in this case, I am drilling a pilot hole, but my pilot hole was not correct. So go again in the intermediate portal, check which one is the best femoral anatomical tunnel. You can use a ruler as well at the same time. And once this is done, you can accept one of the two pilot holes, which is better and more anatomical. So these are 16 tips for a perfect femoral tunnel. Use a correct anteromedial portal. Target the spine needle towards the anatomical footprint. Once this is done, use a curate or a radio frequency to expose the wall. Use a shaver and gently decorticate. Try to identify both the cortex, proximal cortex as well as posterior cortex. Use an offset guide. Make a pilot hole. Once pilot hole is done, cross check from the intermedial portal. Shift the scope to the intermedial portal to check the accuracy of the pilot hole. Once this is done, come back again. Use a 4.5 mm drill guide. Once, then remove the guide wire, check again. You are at a good position. Come back again. Now, this is the method that we devise. Introduce the 9 mm desired drill at 90 degree of flexion. Don't do a hyperflexion that will avoid the scuffing of the cartilage. Then direct it towards the condyle. Now do the hyperflexion without guide wire and then put the guide wire and start drilling. So once this is done, again, remove the guide wire, remove the drill gently, do the 90 degree flexion and then remove your 9 mm drill. So this will avoid the scuffing of the articular cartilage, smoothen the margin of the tunnel. Once this is done, you can do your uh, standard technique. So this, check for the blowout of the post in the lateral cord. <laughs> To conclude, always remain below the lateral reach, make the pilot hole and check from the AM portal, leave the margin 2 mm proximally and posteriorly and avoid the prevent the cartilage scuffing. So this uh, technique has already been there in the website of ANA, which we have presented in 2017 or 18. So you can see and uh, watch there all of the technique. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, we have another talk on TVL tunnel landmark and notify and anatomical placement. Dr. Abhishek is at here.
good morning respected chairpersons my dear seniors and colleagues today i will be talking about the acl tunnel position for tbr landmarks and methods so in 2023 is it still there something to learn i mean why we are discussing this because if you go to the data in last 10 years around 15000 literatures were published on acl out of that around 18 to 20% literatures were only on the acl anatomy why so many research is going on on the anatomy something in a anatomical acl reconstruction we are doing non anatomical that's why even after going so much anatomical the graft uh, re-rupture rate is uh, around 10 to 15% and out of that 11% is due to non anatomical or mal position of the tbl tunnel so for a um, tbl tunnel first we must be well versed with the anatomy the shape it has been debated about the shape of shape but most commonly accepted shape are elliptical triangular or c shaped uh, shape of a tbl footprint the size is also variable it can the width can range from 7 to 16 mm and length from 10 to 15, 10 to 15 mm orientation of a uh, tbl footprint is oblique with a anteromedial bundle placed more anteriorly and to anteriorly and medially as compared to posterior lateral bundle so if you go by the tbl tunnel orientation if you see the mri in a sagittal plane the tbl uh, the tbl footprint is quite posterior to the uh, notch that is uh, represented by the blue men's of line so this must this must be kept in mind that your whole of the tbl tunnel must be lying posterior to the blue men's of line so for that the key is to have a good viewing point so for a, for looking at a uh, tbl footprint you must have a bird's eye view of a isometric point that is view from the top for that you have to make an high anterolateral portal if you make a high anterolateral portal so in a high anterolateral portal you can see directly from the top the tbl footprint now you must be uh, work with the bony and the soft tissue landmarks from medially there is a medial tibial spine anterior parsons knob and there is a l shaped ridge connecting the medial tibial spine and a parsons knob these are the medial side boundaries on the medial and anterior side and on the lateral side there is a anterior horn of lateral meniscus then it inserts in the groove on the um, lateral side and there is a tibial spine the lateral tibial spine there is imaginary line connecting the uh, tip of the lateral tibial spine and corner of the l shaped ridge the mid point of that point is a uh, roughly uh, your entry point for the isometric point it corresponds with the posterior border of anterior horn of lateral meniscus so this must be your rough landmark if you see your landmark and your tunnel is covering only 50 to 60% of your bone uh, of your tibial uh, bony footprint the type of amr we use are commonly elbow amr or a tip amr in elbow amr the tip of your big pin uh, reaches the elbow and the, in the tip amr it reaches up to the tip both amrs are good depending upon the surgeon's preference which they use I personally use a tip hammer because in a tip hammer I am very much sure that where my the tip of the guide wire will be coming. Two types of drilling can be done. One is extraction drilling where the desired size of the graft is made directly with the same size of a drill bit. And in a sequential sequential dilation dilatation type of a drilling, you drill with a smaller size of tunnel and then sequentially dilate it with with a tunnel dilator. if you uh, mal position the tbl tunnel then you can have a tunnel blow out if your tbl tunnel is too anteriorly placed and too much vertical it can have a roof or a notch impingement when the tunnel is too much anterior or failure to uh, debride the cyclops lesion it can cause a flexion contracture and ultimately leading to the graft failure if your tunnel is too much posterior then it will be non functional acl with acl impingement so this is a video demonstration technique first you identify the tbl footprint demarcate all the boundaries if there is a cyclops lesion or if there is a uh, anterior bump debride it debride the bump using a radio frequency device or you can use a simple shaver because 
if you do not write this, you can have a extension impingement or not impingement and fixed flexion deformity. Then uh, identify the TBL footprint, identify the posterior in identify the isometric point in the line with the posterior border of anterior horn of lateral ministers. Then using your any type of aimer which you use, pass a big pin. Before over drilling with the big pin, you remove this uh, aimer and look for the uh, position of your tunnel. The tunnel should cover with the ACL all round in 360 degrees. If there is an eccentric tunnel, you can always revise at this step. Once we are, you are sure that it, your, uh, your tunnel is covering all around the ACL, protect the tip of the bit pin with a uh, curette so that it do not scuff the cartilage while over drilling and then over drill with the required size of a uh, drill bit. So, with a reamer, you over drill it and then using a shaver, gently remove the margins of the tunnel, the soft, soft tissue along with the bony, small bony fragments, remove it with a shaver. Then, this is how you make your ACL TBL tunnel. So, how to check for impingement? Uh, few tricks. One is uh, you insert the scope through your tunnel and gently extend the knee, see for any impingement of your tunnel on the lateral or superior side of a notch. Another, another technique is using a Wissinger rod inside your tunnel, viewing through an anterolateral portal, gently extend the knee, your whole of the Wissinger rod should come inside the notch. Any loose fragment which you see, you can remove it. Then final graft fixation. So, the take home message, the uh, key to success is an anatomical TBL tunnel placement. For that, thorough knowledge of anatomy and accurate tunnel placement is there which, which prevents the impingement. Anterolateral high viewing portal and a good instrumentation will prevent error and whenever in doubt, if you are doubting about the impingement, not plastic will bail you out. Thank you. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign. We have another talk on all inside ACL reconstruction by Dr. Rohan Pansal. Good morning, everyone. I would like to first of all thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present on all inside ACL reconstruction. ACL reconstruction has always been done for a, from a long time, but there has always been difficulty. My surgeon has to think about how to do an ACL reconstruction in which type of graft to be used, especially with the females, the Indian females in whom a smaller graft will be expected, the pediatric patient in whom the thickness of the tendons and the length of the tendons will be smaller. So, the diamond of the graft cannot be made to a certain limit. And in multi-ligament injuries in which every tendon which is saved can be used for making another ligament. The advantage of all inside itself reconstruction are that it requires only one graft. That is only semi tendinous can be used for the ACL. And it provides a suspensive fixation on both the sides with the help of tight ropes. And thus, a perfectly balanced and a tightened graft can be put. Now, how do we do this all inside ACL reconstruction? After doing a diagnostic arthroscopy through a standard anterolateral and anteromedial portal, we first of all treat any associated lesion which can be present like a meniscal tear. Next, we go for the graft harvest. Only one of the tendon is required for the graft harvest. So, a semi tendinosus is normally used and it is harvested with the help of a closed handed tendon stripper. A quadruple ACL graft of approximately 6.5 cm in length is prepared and two tight rope buttons are attached on either sides. The table side of the tight rope should be lengthened 
for easy passage of the endo button to the T-belt terminal, which will help in the easy passage of the graft later on. Next, we come to the femoral tunnel preparation. The starting point of the femoral tunnel is marked with a 45 degrees microfracture rowel. And the starting point, which is also checked by switching the arthroscope to the anteromedial portal for the better visualization of the femoral tunnel location. Once the starting point is identified, you normally make the femoral tunnel in the same way as you make for a routine ACL reconstruction. The depth of the tunnel is measured, and depending on the depth of the tunnel, you drill the femoral tunnel. Normally, we would like to pass around 20 millimeters of graft inside the femoral tunnel. So, we will make the femoral tunnel to something like around 26 to 28 millimeters in size. We will overdrill this femoral tunnel according to the size of the graft which was prepared. But the T-bell tunnel preparation is different in all inside ACL reconstruction. In this, with the arthroscoping viewing in the anterolateral portal, we will first put the T-bell aiming device is placed anterior. Uh, is placed anterior to the posterior border of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus and the anatomical footprint of the ACL. Once this is confirmed, then we will introduce a flip cutter, which is which has an initial Which will, in which the tip of the flip cutter will come exactly in the center of the uh, T bill drilling guide. Once we now confirm that the drill is present right in the center of the ACL footprint, we will remove the T bill drilling guide sleeve. Now we will again advance the flip cutter beyond a certain limit so that we can flip the flip cutter. So once flipped, a flip cutter will be drilled in a retrograde manner. We'll bring it back to the T-bill surface so as to make sure that the T-bill tunnel is right in the center of the T-bill footprint. Next, we'll retrograde drill the T-bill tunnel to around 26 to 28 millimeters in size as the graph for the length for which the graph is required. Next, we pass two passing switches, one in the femoral tunnel and one in, one in the tibial tunnel and bring both the switches out to the anteromedial portal. Using an eye strong, we will make sure that both the sutures have come out to the same anteromedial portal from the same location so that there is no soft tissue impingement present in between the two strands of the, uh, the femoral tunnel and the tibial tunnel. Next, the graft is passed from the anteromedial portal. And we'll bring the graft inside the femoral tunnel. We'll tighten the graft in the femoral tunnel and then pull the T bell tunnel endo button towards the T bell side and finally tighten on both the sides. And this will help us in creating a good anatomical tightened ACL graft. This is one of the post of X rays in which the uh, tight rope is present on both the sides. But the tight ropes can be adequately tensioned in 30 degrees of knee flexion and in some internal rotation. So, what are the advantages of this all inside ACL reconstruction? This is a very important and a very good technique, especially in the Indian females who are having a smaller graph in the pediatric patient age group. It requires only one graph, so definitely we are saving graphs for other ligament reconstruction in multi ligament reconstruction. It's a bone preservation surgery. And there is an ease of revision surgery as we have very little damage the bone. There is ability to be used, especially if we have had a smaller diameter of the graft which has been taken out, or an attenuated graft has been found because of an early detachment of the graft. Uh, this can be performed in skeletally immature patients also, as we will be least damaging the epiphysis. The disadvantage being special equipment which required, that is a flip cutter, and there is a learning curve for this. So some tips, we should always prepare a short ACL graph of not more than 6.5 centimeters in length for 2 centimeters of the graph to be in the femoral tunnel, 2 centimeters in the T-bell tunnel 
and around 2 to 2.5 centimeters for the intra-articular portion. We should trim the both the ends of the graft to a smooth cylinder so as to make the graft passage into both the tibial tunnel and the femoral tunnel easier. We may slightly overrim the femoral and tibial tunnel by 0.5 millimeters to allow some space for the re retention of the graft. Most important is to remove any soft tissue at the tibial socket before the graft passage so that the endo button stick, uh, is attached flush to the tibial bone. And obviously, retrieve both the total uh, shuttle sutures together to the anteromedial portal once with the help of eye stones before passing the ACL graft to the anteromedial portal to prevent any soft tissue in the position. And some things which should be avoided as obviously the graft cannot be too long. It, it may bottom out in the tibial socket, thus may present, at, uh, present us with a difficulty later. We should over tighten the internal brace also. It should be tightened only 30 degrees of knee flexion because there is a chance of over tightening it. And obviously, we should prevent the entangling of the uh, shuttle sutures and the tight rope limbs. The rehabilitation progresses normally. Definitely, with a better tightening, we can be a little bit aggressive in the rehabilitation. And most of these patients uh, return back to sports specific training at around four to six months and then return to previous sports activity by six months. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Bansan. Now I invite Dr. Sukesh Rao for fixation choices in SCR reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Two important announcements. All the speakers are requested to upload their presentation so that we can save the time. And at the same time, we got a result out for the best choice of graft in primary isolated ACL reconstruction. So the poll has given 90% have favored the hamstring and the rest of them around 4 to 5% was bone tendon bone graft, 3% is central bodies of tendon graft. Peroneus for primary ACL has got zero results. So this was the opinion which was taken from all the faculties and the delegates present over here. We'll keep on posting the questions in the group. So just, just keep on checking the questions. So we will be coming with two more questions in our opinion poll. Dr. Harsh is going to post them soon regarding the femoral tunnel and the tibial tunnel. So once you see, in the meantime, we can have one quick question on the, either on the femoral tunnel or the tibial tunnel by the time the, the presentation is getting ready. Any question, any confusion regarding the tibial tunnel placement? Sir. I just have to ask, like we saw tibial tunnel preparation, and it's a practical thing. At the end of the surgery, we always check that there is impingement or not uh, when you are extending the knee. What do we do if there is impingement in there? So, Swar has asked a question. What, what if there is an impingement after you do the tibial fixation and you see there is an impingement of the knee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I told you in my lecture also. After the final fixation, if you see the impingement, you have to do a notch plasty. 
don't hesitate in doing notch plastic. Most of the time, impingement occurs in group or a lateral wall. So, notch plastic will, will always bail you out. How do, how do you do notch plastic? Yeah, notch plastic is done with a normal uh, uh, bone burr which you use in a shoulder surgeries. So, acromanizer burr is good for a notch plastic, but before doing notch plastic, use a curate to uh, remove the uh, bony bump which you, you want and then smoothen the uh, wall with a uh, bony burr. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity and Sironix India for inviting me. I'm Dr. Sukesh Rao. I work in Secunderabad, uh, Telangana. Uh, my topic today would be on uh, fixation choices in ACL reconstruction, the pearls and pitfalls involved. Since most of our talk in the morning, I think there is a lot of overlap between my topic and what has been already discussed with the other speakers. So, to save ideal fixation, it should be secure. It should allow graft healing within the tunnel. The strength of the fixation should be should allow immediate range of motion, weight bearing, and early return to sports. But obviously, it should not cause any secondary damage to bone and should not require a second surgery. But uh, unfortunately, there is no perfect fixation technique. So um, all techniques have shown good results. Okay. So the choice of fixation. So the first thing is the surgeon's preference and his training. So obviously, you do what you are trained in. So if you are good at it, you continue doing it. It is also dependent on the type of graft that we use. So different grafts have different fixation techniques. So your fixation choice is again dependent on the graft that you use. The length of the graft, obviously for a longer graft, you cannot use cortical fixation on the tibia. You have to use an interference screw or a suture post. And also your uh, fixation is also dependent on the number of ligaments that you are going to fix. In the multi-ligamentous injuries, you obviously have to do some mix and match so that you don't end up uh, coalescing all your uh, fixation devices. And most importantly, the quality of bone, especially on the tibia. Now, the fixation types can be classified into compression type, which involve the inference screws, suspension techniques, you have the screw and post mechanisms, or hybrid fixation. The compression devices have interference screws. They may be either biabsorbable or metal. I'm not going to delve into the bio bio biological properties and all. But basically, these devices function on aperture fixation. So the working length of the graft is very low. And as you all know, the ACL heals by aperture uh, healing. So it uh, heals at the aperture. So aperture fixation. And the most important factor in determining or determining the outcome is the bone marrow, bone mineral density actually. So, uh, again, the factors that influence the initial tensile strength are the screw diameter, gap size, screw length, which we will be discussing all these things uh, in the future slides. Now, coming to this bone mineral density, like this is the most important factor, especially in the tibia, because the, uh, the strain on the tibia, the graft in the uh, tibia is along the longitudinal axis, and that is the site where there is a lot of strain on the graft. So, the fixation should be very secure. So, if the bone mineral density is not good, there is a chance for uh, graft seepage or graft failure. Coming to screw diameter, studies have shown that the ultimate failure load is larger with larger interference screws. In fact, uh, the recommendation is not to use a screw diameter less than 7 mm in TBA. And there is another important factor that is the gap size. So, what is gap size? It is the difference in size between the graft and the tunnel. So, it should not be more than 4 mm in a bone petal or bone and studies have shown that it should not be more than 0.5 mm in a soft tissue graft. So, uh, the general consensus we build a size, a tunnel size to just put the same size of the absorbable screw and you can use a 1 mm larger metal screw if the bone is soft. For screw length, it is not very important in bone petal or bone, but it is very important in soft tissue grafts. Now, the screw length determines the area or which friction is generated and it contributes to pull out strength. And one more technical tip is that your screw head should not cross the cortex. You should always be engaged in the cortex. It crosses beyond the cortex, it enters the beyond the cortex, the fixation strength is compromised. And 
lack of history divergence the studies have shown that your divergence should not be more than 30 degrees especially in the femur and the uh, soft tissue grafts can be fixed by inserting the screw either eccentrically or concentrically the studies have shown that concentric screw placement maximizes the contact between the graft spans and bone tunnel wall i have never used this technique i don't know how they do it because when you put it concentrically there is high chance that you tend to twist your graft so if anybody in the audience does it we can we can discuss it later and the technical tip like what dr aditya told in his talk you close your nitinol guide wire before passing your graft so that will allow your proper angulation and it will prevent screw divergence now coming to interference screws if it is bob jack wood screw there are high chances that it may break one technical tip is to insert your screw driver fully it should be fully engaged it should not be any half engagement in fact uh, and you should also see that the screw driver should be there should not be any deformation of the screw driver in fact there is a study published uh, i think in the journal of me are uh, showing a failure of two bicomposite screws when an arthrix uh, screw handle was found to be deformed you can see it in the net and there is another possible that while drilling you can have a tunnel blowout the salvage options will be described by the simulator of simulator and suppose you find that the bone in the tunnel is too hard one trick is you can pass your uh, what i call the bob job you have a bob job screw driver that is very narrow can pass it through the nickel guide wire and kind of dilate at least and then put your screw in coming to suspensory cortical fixation systems now currently considered as a gold standard but the problem is that there is a large mobile segment in the tunnel uh, that can theoretically lead to windshield wiper effect uh, it can be a fixed loop or an adjustable loop but all the studies have shown that all the current uh, suspensory cortical devices have uh, Ultimate failure strengths that are more than satisfactory required for the rehabilitation program. Now, tip and tricks during uh, your loop button fixation. Obviously, you drill at least six mm or more. Follow the button to flip. If you are nervous, just starting out, you can always uh, use CM guidance. Now, suppose whatever you do and your assistant kind of pulls it and the button gets entrapped, there are various techniques to bail out. I found this technique described by Ben and Jay Sabat. published in journal of uh, arthroscopic arthroscopic techniques in floor 19 basically what they have shown is uh, as you can see here the pull the button out then you can use your poker cannula push it over the button as you can see here make a small incision push it over the button and ensure that the poker ca cannula goes on to the bone and then you can ask your assistant to pull the graft from the tibial side so as you can see there it has come down and then uh you can see the button getting engaged there on the tibia so this is one technique that i found useful other techniques are you can either open it cut down the idiotical band and again reduce it back or there's a technique described by social fuga where it does an arthroscopy and releases using an ablator then for adjusting new buttons other techniques some of the techniques that i found useful especially while deploying the button on the femur is i usually visualize my button on the medial through the medial portal under vision i will uh, pass my button because it's an adjustable button the graft is not there so i can nicely see the button getting flipped there and one trick that i all i do do what has been described by the previous uh, speaker was i do my tunnel 3 to 4 3 to 5 3 to 4 mm larger longer so this allows me to do what is called as retention of the graft i fix on the tibia i find that the graft is a little lax and what i do is i again retention it as you can see it can uh, retention so that will give me a nice uh, nice tensioning the other uh, concern with an adjustable device is that it may what you call loosen up so for that you can what you can do is use a knot pusher and tie up the knots at the end of the procedure that converts it from an adjustable loop to a fixed loop so you don't have the chance of risk leakage now one more technique that's uh, described or published already by the lewan group is you can see from the lateral better getting the button is uh, the lateral cortex you can see there so that's one trick that you can do so that you are not entrapped now regarding the tibia i am personally i personally uh, do a cortical fixation i have been using that for the past 7 years and i personally prefer using a larger button than the small uh, tight rope that has been described previously my logic is that 
larger button allows me to have a larger contact area so the contact stress on the tibia will be less and uh, as a result if it is an osteoporotic bone the chance for tunnel bloat or breakage will be less now you are doing an all inside and you feel and suppose you have a tunnel breakage one thing to salvage is you can use this button uh, it's a t button l s or an open loop button with four holes you can place the graft and then uh, engage your uh, what you call a type of onto it and uh, one more trick is ensure that your soft tissue is not there so clean the soft tissue and ensure that the button sits on the tibia so in conclusion the fixation method is based on the surgeon's choice obviously what you are comfortable you do it on a regular basis and obviously the graft and the bone quality all methods have good results you know one technique and you know how to bail out of it and uh, there is no uh, conclusive evidence of the superiority of the all inside technique or the internal brace results are yet to be out so we'll watch them closely thank you thank you sukesh can we ask dr sudil apsingi for his talk on intraop bailout in acl reconstruction thanks thank you morning everyone thank the organizing committee and the seronics for inviting me today so i'll talk on bailouts in aclr after such good talks on uh, creating the tunnels and fixation i don't think you need any bailout my plan is i'm going to talk about the colored things more than the non colored things diagnosis you need to be certain about your acl diagnosis it is definitely a clinical diagnosis it is not an arthroscopy and proceed it is a clinical diagnosis but at the same time you should be able to diagnose other ligament injuries you should be able to diagnose the injuries to the corners the posterolateral and the postmedial corners and also meniscal injuries and cartilage injuries equipment i can't stress more on this you need to make sure that all your equipment is ready for you at the time of surgery even the best arthroscopy surgeon can't do anything without uh, proper equipment you need to make sure that your viewing equipment your debriding equipment that is a shaver and rf and your surgical equipments are all in place and you should be ready with all sorts of implants you should have more than one method of fixation available to you on the in the theater you should not be waiting for them graft harvest as we have seen most of us prefer semiti and uh, plus or minus gracilis for our graft and uh, bone petla tendon graft is a very good graft at least you should be good with two methods of uh, two grafts that is on table if there is a problem with one graft you should be able to take the second graft out the distinct possibilities are the peroneus because sometimes we don't drape the uh, ankle we don't prep the ankle we don't keep it ready the peroneus graft the other is opposite leg and when you want to do them it is really a stressful situation in the ot where you are trying to repaint redrape and you are not happy with it and so we should avoid that so you should be available you should be able to take two locally available grafts semiti graft the problem is inadequate length and inadequate thickness that what we can do is we can fold it multiple times and make sure that the graft thickness and the length is adequate we need at least a 60 mm graft depth what i normally do is i just use the tendon harvester that you saw i don't detach the distal the distal part of the tendon and i clear the muscle there itself what it makes is uh, my graft won't fall on the floor you should always have an alternate graft regarding augments there is no clear evidence that any augment really works btb graft you should be aware about taking inadequate bone especially on the patellar side because we are worried about patellar fracture in the initial part if you don't have proper equipment if you don't have the small saw blade or if you don't have the small osteotomes 
you use the huge big osteotomes for the bone grafting from the bone grafting set it doesn't work for uh, patella it's all right you will get away from the on the tibial side but not on the patella you should always be aware of patella fractures and when you are preparing btb graft you should be aware that you can prepare the soft tissue part as well that is you can put whip stitches on the soft tissue part of the graft as well sometimes what happens is you have a small bone or you have a bone which is pretty weak and it won't take the sutures so the best thing is to start whip stitching the soft tissue part and then come on to the bone that way even if the bone crumbles you have adequate hold sometimes what happens when you're putting your screw in the sutures just give way so if you have your sutures on the soft tissue as well then you can protect the you can actually tension the graft graft falling, falling on the floor is a real danger especially with soft tissue grafts you give it to someone else someone else starts preparing i always prepare my grafts i never give it to anyone for me there are two critical things in acl one is graft preparation and second is the femoral tunnel the rest everything else is far more simpler than these two things so i always prepare my graft my graft is prepared kept in a kidney dish and the kidney dish i roll something on the kidney dish so that if someone pours the kidney dish down I can still retrieve my graft yeah otherwise my graft is tensioned on a big uh, graft master board and uh, i make sure that the graft master board is heavy so that everyone knows that they can't drop it and it should not be on the corner of the table it should be on the center of the table femoral tunnel preparation we have seen the beautiful talks on this you always need to go to the anteromedial portal and make sure that you are placing your tunnel in the proper position you should always make sure that you transfer your scope from the uh, anterolateral portal to the anteromedial portal i'll give one more tip, uh, tip here you see if you see all my videos they are chopped off at the top and the bottom that is because i am using a 45 degree scope and a 45 degree scope is far far better than 30 degree scope believe me once you start using it you will stop using the 30 degree scope in 45 degree scope you won't get disoriented but the kind of view you get you won't get it in a 30 degree scope so there are two ways to prepare the fem femoral tunnel one is in 90 degree flexion other is in hyperflexion in hyperflexion you need a low anteromedial portal you need to clear the fat pad and you need to have proper outflow channels so that you don't have uh, all the debris inside the joint and you need proper saline pressure because once you hyperflex then there is less volume in the knee joint for your saline to work so you need to make sure about all these things if you are hyperflexing and one more important thing is when you hyperflex and put your bead pin in and your assistant leaves the hyperflexion the bead pin just bends so be careful about that you will have a broken bead pin inside the joint and struggle all the time to remove that bead pin for doing it in 90 degrees then you need to have this uh, flexible guide pin and reamer systems or outside in techniques in medial portal technique there is no additional incision required but outside in you need to do a lateral uh, incision and uh, there is a chance of uh, medial femoral condyle injury which sheetal has very beautifully shown how to avoid it in the outside in technique you can control the entry point that is the point on the lateral femoral cortex where you want to enter and this can be especially useful in obese patients whom you can't hy hyperflex and also in skeletally immature patients even in revisions when you want to put your tunnel in a different direction yeah. and uh, obviously it is expensive outside in this is how i do in uh, hyperflexion i use this red handle as a guide that is nothing but a uh, one of the uh, shoulder anchor systems uh, the same guides i just remove it that is because most of our guides are uh, used many a times most of our reamers are uh, used many a times guide pins are used many a times they are bent and they go in all sorts of directions that is the reason i do it and uh, once you do it you secure it on one side just to make sure that you protect your assistant's abdomen and then go on and uh, do the this thing uh, 4 mm reamer is always done by my assistant i do the final reaming myself post your valve pull out yes you can avoid it by using an offset reamer by gradual reaming or using the anteroportal view or doing an outside in method you need to think about uh, fixation methods it depends on the graft which you are using if it's a soft tissue graft and a suspension technique 
and there's a small blowout i'm not really worried because previously people used to do a over the top uh, graft so it is something similar to that when you are using a bone petla tendon graft then you need to be worried you need to have a suspension on the uh, femoral cortex lateral cortex blowout is again due to inadequate visualization improper measurement of the pilot hole you should know that your tunnel is an oblique tunnel it is not a straight tunnel so what is in front of you and what is behind you is different so you need to know about that bad instrumentation sometimes you can have very good instrumentation a very new set and then the reamer is very sharp and you just blow the lateral cortex out you need to have uh, alternative fixation methods like jumbo buttons screws which can be done outside in and screw and washer so don't hesitate to do a screw from outside yeah. very simple you just open the lateral cortex and put a screw from outside to inside and you can do suspension techniques tbl tunnel we have seen the anatomy of the tbl tunnel so well demonstrated not going there this is how i do i use the posterior posterior border of the antehorn of lateral meniscus and the medial spine as a guide and then i drill my this thing i'm not bothered whether it's a tip aimer or a elbow aimer and i protect it and i do it i don't calculate it from the pcl because i think that is the wrong way to do it it depends on the knee flexion angle make sure that you clear your tunnel to certain extent so that there is no obstruction for passage of your graft malposition tibial tunnels unfortunately are pretty common and when we do this metal screws they are pretty obvious as well yeah so if you want to avoid them then make sure that you do your uh, identify your anatomical landmarks and pass your beak pin properly graft passage difficulties are because of inadequate visualization inappropriate sizing that is you size your sizer and your reamer don't match so if you are having any doubt then use your reamer in your sizer and see if they match or not and length calculation is pretty critical especially if you are using fixed loops because you can flip the tunnel in the joint or outside and weak sutures beware of them they break button flipping in the soft tissues it happens more commonly with adjustable loops because the loops are so long and button flipping in the canal happens with uh, fixed loops screw insertion for a soft tissue graft or a btb graft is a big deal you need to be very careful about that put the guide wire first and insert the yeah. angle where the femoral tunnel was created make sure you get check x rays done this is how i do my uh, femoral tunnel and fixation that is my free hand method i do the 4.5 drill over the the thing i check the length of the tunnel then do the definitive reamer once i do the definitive reamer and then i pass the guide pin the bead pin is passed just to the mouth of the femoral tunnel and here i extend the knee and i get my camera into the lateral gutter and i expose the bead pin because it is bead pin in the tunnel i can safely expose it and my button flips under vision so i don't have any problems dr sunil we are over time 3 minutes lateral parapetal or portal that is where i place midpoint of patella 1 cm lateral to it and you see when you do this portal and you have uh, buttons which are engaged in the soft tissue you can just put either an artery clip or you can just do a push pull method and you can deliver the button so this is an active portal wherein you can put the portal in and you can manipulate your button and do things and uh, if you have a lateral wall blow out then you need to, even a simple suture disc can save you it because you can put the suture disc on your button and then you can make sure that it sits on the lateral cortex that way your button is having extra support on the lateral cortex graft tensioning in cycling it depends on whether you want to do it on the femoral or the tibial side or with dual adjustable loops tibial fixation can be done with screws but beware of the bone quality if you're using metal screws beware of the sharpness of the screw threads you can cut the graft by absorbable screws again the size of the screw depends on the thickness of the graft the tunnel size the amount of tunnel that the graft is occupying and also the quality of the bone that decides the size of the screw peak screws are really good screws and uh, you can use adjustable loop on the tibial side using all inside technique or a t button and always check with x rays if you don't want any reason as you have seen bio screws break it is not uncommon all company screws break you should not hesitate to put a suspension on the tbl side if you have any doubt 
Sir, can you, you summarize, please? Yeah, I'm almost done. So, if you want to do that, if you don't want to see these X-rays, then you should make sure that uh, you follow all the principles properly. In summary, pre-operative planning is the most important thing. And for me, visualization is the key. If you can't see anything, you can't do anything. And you should have an anatomical knowledge of where things are. Only then you will be able to get a proper result. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I invite Dr. Vinay Tantuai to speak on ACL repair technique. And where do we stand in 2023? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I welcome all the delegates and the faculty who are coming for, from outside to indoor and uh, making this program a success. All the seniors. So, uh, today I am going to speak about the primary ACL repair. We all are well versed with the ACL reconstruction techniques and are very confident about the reconstruction because that have given uh, wonderful results and is a gold standard in the treatment of ACL injuries. But there are situations where we can repair the pri ACL primarily. Uh, the primary ACL repair is a procedure where uh, we repair the native ACL to the bone and uh, we don't need to reconstruct it and our and the remnant is used for it for the fixation so the classification if you know about the acl tear uh, we repair it in the sherman type 1 and type 2 and uh, mostly in the type 1 injuries or in case of the partial tears or in case of the pediatric patients uh, when ACL repair cannot be done in the chronic situations, when there is a stump is reabsorbed or it is more than three weeks time, uh, subsynovial ACL or a stretched injury, mid substance ACL tears or poor tissue quality. Advantages because uh, the restoration of the normal or uh, native ACL preserves the proprioception and kinematic functions. It is a less invasive procedure, avoids the uh, graft donor site morbidity and the faster recovery. It's also, uh, it retains the anatomy, collagen, and orientation and uh, proper orientation of the ACL. So, it acts as a normal ACL in spite of a graft. It preserves the biomechanical properties of the ligament and uh, it is also good for the pediatric patient because it spares the physis. So, uh, I am going to present a case where you, you can see that. Uh, ACL is torn from the femoral attachment from the bone and on a diagnostic arthroscopy you can see it, it is detached from the bone and the rest of the remnant is intact. So uh, examination under anesthesia is performed, you can see that the ACL is torn from the femoral attachment and it is a Sherman type 1 injury. A high anterior lateral portal and a low anterior medial portal is uh, made for the process. First, we clear the hematoma and the soft tissue. Uh, then we identify and uh, plan the procedure. So, the first, the uh, findings are confirmed that the uh, your uh, remnants are of good quality. There is no tear in within the substance, and then we repair it. So first we pass a first pass suture and repair it. This is a technique where we display a two bundles in this. So you can see uh, that there are two bundles in the ACL, anteromedial and the posterior lateral bundle. So in this technique we uh, 
makes uh, uh, sutures are tied on the anterior medial bundle and in the, onto the posterior lateral bundle separately. So, for uh, tying the uh, sutures on the uh, anterior medial bundle, we keep the scope on the posterior uh, AL bundle and then with the fiber, uh, first pass device, we make suture of, uh, on the anterior medial bundles. These are the uh, fiber wire number two sutures. And once the anterior medial bundle is uh, tied or sutured, we park the sutures on the anterior medial bundle, place or scope onto the anterior medial bundle, and then this is the anterior medial bundle how it is now tied to the post. And then we switch the scope onto the uh, anterior medial portal, and from the anterior lateral portal, we tie the sutures onto the posterior lateral bundle. So, this blue suture is for the anterior lateral bundle, uh, posterior lateral bundle. Now, both the bundles are tied. Now, we will make the tunnels in the femur. So, with the offset guide, we make two different tunnels. One is for the AM bundle and another for the PL bundle. A cap of the uh, spinal needle is used to protect the sutures entangling while drilling to the bone and it also protects the remnant of ACL. So, uh, this one wire is that is passed from the tunnel made for the anterior middle bundle and it is withdrawn to an extent that knee can be mobilized and then with the help of uh, offset guide, we will make another tunnel into the bone for the PL bundle. With a similar technique using the ca uh, cap of spinal needle as a cannula, we will overdrill it with the 4 mm drill bit. Then these sutures are passed, uh, the wires are passed from the tunnel, withdrawn into the notch and from the lateral aspect onto the thigh, anterior lateral aspect, we will give a small incision so that we can uh, clear the soft tissue between the two tunnels and the wire. Once the soft tissue is cleared, then we will pass the sutures from the tunnels. This uh, dated black and white suture will pass it through the end tunnel made for the anterior middle bundle with the help of beat pin. And similarly, we will do it for the blue eye, blue sutures for the posterior lateral bundle. First, these sutures are withdrawn from the intromedial portal and then through that cannula, we will pass it through the different side of the bone. And once these are out of the lateral aspect, you can see one stretching, the graft is well fixed to the lateral cortex of the femoral condyle, lateral condyle of the distal femoral. And then we can tie these sutures over uh, with each other directly over the bony bridge or if you feel that the bone quality is little uh, weak or uh, stoporotic, you can put a uh, endo button and then you can switch, tie it over there. So, this is a very simple technique, uh, only two sutures are used and repair can be done properly in the case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. And I invite now Dr. Vikas Jain.
arthroscopic solution hoisty while we are waiting vinay can i ask you what are the results of this repair are they good enough so that we should try and repair more and more what does the literature say so can we use when you have used the ropes can we use uh, uh, suture anchors as we use in shoulders yes suture actual technique or original technique was described with the suture anchors only Yeah. They use the not less sutures. They fix it uh, into this. Any company suture can be used for it, and we can fix it. But important thing is that if the uh, placement of suture is not perfect, so while range of motion it can pull out. So initially I started with the anchors, but when I, once I see that uh, that the suture came out, then I started doing the trans uh, osseous tunnel technique so that the fixation is more secure in such cases. but that cannot that can be done without so we need not to make a lateral incision in that case and after uh, just trying the bundles we can just put the sutures onto the footprint and get it done so the only thing is why don't we do it so often why not many people do this repair and why did it took so long to talk about these repairs and we have been reconstructing for years so there must be a reason so reconstruction is being done uh, in, since long time but repairs are also being done there are a lot of literature uh, is coming and uh, since last 4 5 years papers are coming to the primary book uh, so do you do the freshening of the femoral area first before uh, passing the sutures we will take the question afterwards yes should be sir uh, good afternoon everyone i would like to thank osi and ceronics uh, today i'm going to talk about a topic which is uh, somewhat not arthroscopic solutions for stiffening uh, what are the present solutions for stiffening is manipulation under anesthesia arthroscopic release and open release with mua we already know there is an increased risk of fracture open release increases chance of recurrence and arthroscopic uh, uh, release is my choice at present uh arthroscopy for knee stiffness what are the advantages it offers a good option for relieving stiffness in majority of cases it can access the anterior as well as the posterior compartments and most effective it's uh, if it's done earlier in the course of stiffness 3 to 6 months uh there are specific indications for the condition one is post traumatic knee stiffness post total knee replacement stiffness post arthroscopic uh, uh, um, after acl reconstructions and infections uh what are the managements uh there's a pre op planning intra op planning and post op uh these are the pre procedure investigations we should get x ray ct and mri uh injuries and fracture around the knee state of articular cartilage uh what we should do prior to the surgery is make a documentation of the range of motion active and passive before and after anesthesia and this will be our guideline for the stiffness procedure if there is no significant difference then there, there is a resistant and severe contracture and there is limited patellar mobility what would you do during the actual procedures is divided in three key parts one is the portals which are obviously important second is the instrumentation what you are going to use and the sequence of releases 
द मेजोरिटी ऑफ पोर्टल्स आर एंटीरो लैटरल एंटीरो मीडियल सुपीरोल मीडियल सुपीरो लैटरल एंड समटाइम्स यू नीड टू गो फॉर द पोस्टीरियर कंपार्टमेंट द बेस्ट पोर्टल्स टू स्टार्ट विथ आर द सुपीरो लैटरल एंड सुपीरो मीडियल पोर्टल बिकॉज मेनी टाइम्स एन एंटीरो लैटरल इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल टू फ्लेक्स नी अपू नाइन एंटी डिग्रीज what are the instrumentation specific you need you need an rf for sure shaver is always there for most of our surgeons sickle knife and periosteal elevator is one of the tools which is helpful what would be the sequence of releases and i'll just focus on two important points over here after that we'll go to the videos uh, one is the superior uh, supra patellar and patello femoral release start from superior lateral and superior medial portal if the knee is in extension that is the best place to start with so that gradually you can get the flexion and you can access the knee joint clearance of gutters capsular releases anterior interval release many times of fact that is card anteriorly then you need to go for the interpondylar and notch debridement certain case in notch plasty has to be done and once you access the tibio femoral compartment loose bodies flaps and meniscal tear are sometimes a culprit in spite of doing everything once you are not able to do there is an option of high pressing and uh, niches of quadriceps which is known as quads uh, close quadriceps plasty and while you are doing the entire procedure after every few releases you need to keep manipulating the knee and check the range of motion has it decreased it will also help you in releasing certain adhesions uh supra patella pouch is one of the areas key areas extends about a hand width or 3 inches from the patella knee in extension like we have already discussed to release all additions hypertrophic synovium and intraarticular bands and after debridement release patella should be mobile and the other thing is close quadriceps plasty if flexion is still restricted after all the releases by pressing or multiple surgical niches into quadriceps muscle close quadriceps plasty should be done because uh, one of the pre culprits is the third quadriceps to the femoral shaft and you can use uh, periosteal elevators through the uh, superior lateral portals and these are the types of management if you have to divide restriction of flexion and the restriction of extension whenever there is a restriction of flexion the culprit is in the anterior compartment extension is more over both the compartments are involved anterior as well as the posterior capsule like i said uh, for flexion restriction capsular radiation in suprapatellar region medial lateral recess and intercondylar regions posterior has to be addressed only if needed after complete anterior release and you are not able to get extension restrictions are additions in the posterior capsule fibrous nodule cyclopleugens in the intercondylar region can be one of the culprits uh, now i'll just go for the videos so um, this is one of the cases we start with oh just watch Okay, I'll just start with that. So this is after the epidural anesthesia. The patient had around uh, 50, 60 degrees of FFD. Patient was a known case of Parkinson, and this is the final result we were able to obtain. What we start with is a supra patella region. This is the knee replacement implant. What you have to do in certain things, I'll keep. Uh, I'll go a bit slow. these are the tricks anterior lateral anterior medial portals initially you will have no visualization but you just have to keep calm and dheere dheere slowly you'll just start uh, looking at the structures look for the shaver that is one of the best tips try to triangulate feel the shaver and gradually you'll get a clear visualization this is the medial and lateral gutter we are cleaning now we are able to see the implant this is a intercondylar box cut region implant with rf reflection you can see whenever you are doing a post tk releases you will see all these reflections and this is the tibial side this is the tibial tray post in this case which we are gradually able to see now we are releasing on the tibial side last few additions after we release and we are able to visualize the complete compartment and this is after releasing it entirely on the anterior side and the patient still had 30 degree of extension remaining after the anterior clearance now what we did after that is we went on the posterior side because whenever there is a limitation of extension patient being parkinsonism case she obviously had tightness of the posterior capsule so what we began with was view was from the posterior medial side we were working for the posterior lateral side whenever you are doing that keep switching 
one of the tricks to save from any problems or damaging the neurovascular structures is work along the bone along the implant you are at the safest area and when you flex the knee and normally when you flex it the posterior structures move about uh, 5 to 6 millimeters behind so at least you are in the safer area try to do it in flexion whenever you are doing it so we are seeing from the posterior medial side and we are this is the implant on the top at the bottom you are able to see the tibial tray and we are releasing from the posterior side once we were done after the surgery we will do we will get almost in complete extension this is one of the cases the other thing what the trick is many times quadriceps get adhered this is not my case i have got it from the internet but this is one of the techniques which does help so they are in the suprapatellar region and there is a sickle knife patella additions and this is the suprapatellar region of the femur these are the additions and with a sickle knife you can release it completely and the advantage with arthroscopy is with a small hole you can go up to a larger area proximally uh, what one of the things i have experienced is you can also use a periosteal elevator through the superior region you can also use along with that just a mop just to pass it through so that the quadriceps get detached from the surface so this is a patella now the releases have been and the shaver is being used to clear the further uh, fibrosis and soft tissue uh, ultimately this is what was achieved so the next situation which was again difficult was a trauma case this is how the case was initially when the patient came to us and this is the range of motion uh, this is before the anesthesia again same patella must have been adhered so this is how we start and we are not able to visualize anything you have to have your patience and gradually things will turn up and this is the clearance of the lateral and medial gutters uh now again the suprapatellar region which is one of the most important areas especially in uh, quadriceps fusion and post traumatic cases once you just clear it off knee joint visualization will be proper gradually even the fracture was not properly fixed but at least we were able to get certain motion and this is after the end of the surgery what we were able to achieve and one of the things the last video i'll just show is uh, the post acl reconstruction so this is one of the patients who had acl reconstruction elsewhere around 6 months back and he was not able to extend the knee completely he had some lag and it was majorly disabling for him because he used to walk with the limp always uh this was the acl ligament a bit high in my opinion but uh, moreover it was in good position uh, there was a fibrous nodule at the top ultimately we just had to clear the fibrous nodule and we did not have to go in the posterior area and after this we were able to get a complete extension some amount was remaining around 5 degrees but uh, gradually it worked out this is just 3 days after the surgery and this is a complete extension the patient was able to achieve so uh coming back to it many times you are able to achieve a lot of things intraoperatively but you have to ensure in certain cases like this that post operative management is equally important one of the things which will prevent you Not from getting this simple yeah uh one of the things which will prevent you from getting a good result is the patient having pain post operatively so you have to find an alternative to it there are good options uh, and we have certain good anesthetists who are able to give epidural blocks as well as regional blocks prolonged femoral blocks with catheter that is one of the best tricks which helps uh the other thing is physiotherapy obviously is the most important and cpm is among the most important tools the complications and limitations is low grade it is obviously a technically challenging procedure but chances of injury to adjacent ligaments and articular cartilage are there in neurovascular structures and posterior release we can release all the intraarticular scar tissue but extra articular causes can't be completely addressed and there is a chance of damage to the components post care 
the prognosis is good results in post surgical fibrosis and uh, <laughs> surfaces such as total knee replacement and intraarticular fibrosis but in severe scarring of quadriceps post external fixation and osteomyelitis it's a bit difficult uh conclusion arthroscopic knee release is an excellent procedure for knee stiffness and i think every arthroscopic surgeon who have this thinking in their armamentarium and even uh, joint replacement surgeons who do arthroscopy as well uh it's a minimally invasive and less complications quadriceps plasty and suprapatellar release need to be paid attention to and everyone should know this thing thank you thank you dr vikas ji uh now we have one, one more topic and dr moparthi i invite dr moparthi for his talk revision acl planning and treatment algorithm after this talk we will have a question answer session which will be followed by inauguration and then inauguration will be followed by relive surgery so there is just a slight change in program so after this the panel discussion followed by inauguration followed by relive surgery good afternoon first of all i want to thank uh, organizing chairman and organizing secretary and the indoor orthopedic association and the mp chapter uh, ioi mp chapter and the ceramics guys for giving me this opportunity and the respected seniors uh, on the dais and off the dais today's uh, my topic will be on the एक बार ट्राई कर आ जाएगा देखो या आगे पेंट्रे दिस वॉज द समरी ऑफ द क्वेश्चन विच वॉज आर्ट प्रिफर्ड मेथड फॉर फिमोरल फुटप्रिंट Not a, yeah. The offset guide method is being used by 65 percent of patients, uh, of the delegates and the faculty. The ruler method by 9.4 percent, and the free hand technique is 25 percent. So presently, the outside in zig and image guided uh, none of uh, us are using. Uh, we got a 51 responses, which is a pretty good response for the TBL MR guide, which you prefer. So elbow MR is a preferred option in 50 percent. The deep MR. Is twenty nine in the round zig. That is a ring zig in twenty percent. So there's a lot of difference in the the kind of zig that we are using. Ultimate aim is anatomy. So if your tibial footprint anatomy is fine, irrespective of whatever kind of zig you are using, it doesn't matter. perfection it isn't the final outcome but a sign of what's to come there is no be all and end all it is a process while we are progress it isn't the present tense or past but the future the start how do we tension how do we perfection is the opposite of constant it is change the only thing that's constant That's what we do here at Serenix, creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in: innovation, consistency, and giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine. We don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life bettering tools consistently. It is around 30 to 40 newton of tensionometer. You put the tension on that graft and then you start putting the screws. After you finish your fixation, then you need to check that uh, graft both in flexion as well in extension. What my criteria, the subjective criteria, I use a trocar or a obturator to just check the tension in the flexion. If it's not over tension in the flexion, that is absolutely acceptable to me. So it's a more of anatomy. Loose little bit inflection and extension should become tight. 
So it's just a subjective feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it will not exercise. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And truth be told, the power to deliver ground. Can have one or two more questions. Okay. Now, Dr. Rao. Dr. Rao is there? Yes. Uh, man, oh, uh, how will you decide uh, uh, in a case where you use button or screw or by observable suture anchors? What uh, is the criteria of choosing fixation method? So, first thing, like, like I told, it's your personal Amerika. choice how you do it. But generally, uh, so graft is longer, you cannot use a cortical button. So, you have to use an interference screw. Mm -hmm. My personal choice, I usually use a quadruple uh, semitendinous graft. I use an adjustable loop on the femur and I always use a cortical button on the femur. Only if the patient insists that he needs an absorbable screw, I will read through, through the internet. I use a triple graft, so that comes out of the tibia. So I obviously cannot use a cortical button. I use an interference screw. Sometimes when I do a multiligamentous reconstruction, when I have to do a PCL or an ACL, I may use uh, an interference screw because using two cortical buttons on the tibia, sometimes they kind of come together and coalesce. So I use an interference screw. Any, yeah, advantage, any advantage over it? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We are ready now. Thank you. Sorry, there is a small, slight technical glitch. This. Uh, Today's my topic is on uh, revision ACL. Uh, as we know, there are so many techniques of uh, primary ACL reconstructions. Uh, so, when you go to the manual of Strobel, uh, saying that he has described around uh, 300 procedures in the reconstructing the ACL techniques. Till today, date, he, he said that there is no. Uh, Perfect procedure to say this is a perfect procedure for the ACL. Is a as the technology is get advancing, so many of literatures and so many of uh, surgeons choice, so many of the studies has shown that these are the somewhat uh, um, procedures uh, which we are doing nowadays, like hybrid fixations, suspensory fixations, uh, correcting all the technical difficulties. Uh, we are adapting some procedures to get the uh, patient benefited uh, good results. Okay, okay, Dada. Okay. Yeah, before only I brought and given to him. He told that no need, you can directly give the PowerPoint. He told. Then I brought safe side, I brought my laptop also. Yeah, I have given, given them. Those are the people who are sir. They will not have any chance directly. Sitel, we can have Sitel. We can have few questions. Mm -hmm. Hello. Can we conclude the session now? Can we conclude? Yeah. I would like to involve Dr. Padip Chaudhary sir to present uh, momento to the chairpersons, and we can further continue the session. Dr. Ravin Raval, sir, please. I invite Dr. Anil Agrawal, sir. I invite Dr. Manoj Vetra, please. Continuing with our session, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Vijay Dadaria, sir, 
and Dr. Manish Maheshwari sir to moderate the question and answer session. Yes, sir. So I'll invite all the uh, speakers of this session to come on the dais, please. Dr. Sheetal, Dr. Abhishek, Dr. Rohan Bansal, Dr. Sunil, Dr. Vinay. I invite Dr. Suman Nath to uh, come Shira. as moderator. Dr. Sukesh. Yeah. Dr. Raju Ravi Teja and Dr. Arjun for moderating the for chairing the session. So, okay. So first, we'll take the question to the first speaker, Dr. Arjun. Dr. Suman Nath, Dr. Raju Ravi Teja, is he here? Okay. So from the delegates, we'll take the questions first. Uh, uh, we'll take questions to Dr. Seetal for femoral tunnel placement. There must be a lot of questions, yeah. Yeah, she's a nice talk. Uh, now we have been talking about remnant preservation surgery. So, what is your uh, idea on the femoral side? Uh, since we don't talk, no, about we can't hear you. Can you? Okay, so, uh, we are, we are talking about remnant preservation surgeries in ACL reconstructions. So, what is Sheetal's and uh, Abhishek's idea, especially Sheetal's on the femoral side? So, on the femoral side, if there is a residual stone which is present, so I got three situations. One is a chronic situation in which all of the femoral condyle is empty, there is nothing is else, then I will use the technique which I have shown that pilot in the probe technique. If there is the remnant, I would like to preserve. So, if the postrolateral bundle is uh, uh, preserved, is uh, present, then I will just divide the portion of andromedal po bundle portion. I will do my standard reconstruction and I will put a suture anchor. So, I use a suture anchor for fixing my remnant to the ACL graft. This is one situation. If particularly the remnant is unstable, so meaning unstable is if you are doing a flexion and extension, if you see that your remnant is moving, which can create a cyclops. So, I will use an anchor. If that is a stable that is not moving, I will use a simple suture that I will tie my remnant along with my ACL graft. So, these are the two situations which I usually face in my technique. So, TBL cycle. Yeah. Remnant preservation, if there is a available intact part of a bundle of a ACL or bundle a ACL, then you have to be uh, very careful while drilling the TBL tunnel because if you drill the TBL tunnel like in an anatomical ACL reconstruction, you might end up damaging the remnant of a TBL attachment of a ACL intact ACL. So for that, you have to adjust your TBL tunnel entry point accordingly according to the part of the remnant. Most commonly, it is a postulatal bundle which is torn in a remnant preserving uh, or a bundle specific reconstruction. So, you have to uh, aim your tunnel bit posteriorly and bit uh, laterally to preserve the anteromedial bundle or an intact bundle. Dr. If you have to compromise with the placement of the tunnel, is it a good idea? See, sir, I think that the absolutely. tunnel should be good absolutely. in the correct position. Absolutely, sir. I agree with you. If you have that uh, loose fragment, you are compromising with your typical tunnel. Absolutely. The logic says that. So, first, first principle is that you to be anatomical first. The second, while you want to preserve the remnant, don't compromise on the size of the graft. You want to preserve the remnant, you will use a 7 graft. I don't agree with. I will use standard 8.59 mm graft. If I could preserve the remnant with that, because you are not sure what is the biomechanics of that remnant. It's already a deformation is there in that remnant. So, I will not rely on that remnant. Thank you. Also, while doing the remnant preservation, what I do, I make a tunnel at the footprint. I try to pass my graft within the remnant. So, that uh, <coughs> it, it adds to the diameter of the graft without compromising the anatomical location of the tunnels. That's why I am using a suture anchor to retension that remnant. So, that you can retention uh, to the original uh, Actually, if that ACL is fully torn, then in a remnant on the TBL side, you don't shave the whole of the TBL footprint. 
that's how you preserve the remnant and you enter into the anatomical position but if there is a bundle specific ring construction then you can adjust not very much but just slight so that you don't end up damaging the intact acl so in the partial uh, partial acl scenarios there are a lot of uh, sports uh, sports persons who have this issue they have instability and then most of the time when you get an mri done to document it you would find that they would, the radiologist will always mention there is a partial kind of an acl there is nothing called a partial acl but basically it's an insufficient acl that's what's not which is not working because the patient is having a pivoting issue so in those cases would you go for a recon or you would go for a repair if the acl if the knee is unstable acl is gone so, whatever is there is not working so you need a proper reconstruction and on top of that if you can save a curtain of tissue that is fine i question to again when i it just in case you find if you go in the ceremony to would you take your acl repairs cases only when there is a complete femoral avulsion uh, or you would still you have go for such cases who have a pl bundle injury in a acute case of a pl bundle injury comes to you in an acute case would you go for still go for a repair yeah if it is completely uh, avulsed or just detached from the femoral side if it is a mid substance i won't so attempt it type 1 sherman type 1 acute case acute presentation and a good tissue quality if you can see that its distal attachment is well it is not torn there is no fraying of tissue then only i'll do that so dr sheetal one question for you you said for uh, making the anatomical femoral tunnel you use zip and i think in one more presentation we have said offset zip for femoral then you are taking that thing out and again checking it so if you are using the zig that means your placement is absolutely where it should have been whatever 5 mm 6 mm 7 what is the importance of adding one more step to this now the only advantage is despite of using zig we have seen that uh, there may be difference in the antero posterior because you are looking from the antero lateral portal so once you are using the use there is a one hole that we are creating and that may be a wrong placement that may be good as compared to the proximal and the distal that is shallow in the teeth but you may be wrong in the plane of anterior and posterior so once you go back and then check because offset is just giving you offset from the proximal not giving you from the anterior and the posterior so once you realize that then you can change that is the reason i'm using so uh, jig can rotate in the hand yes, yes. Exactly. that is why you need to check okay. so any more questions from delegate side the question to dr rohan bansal for all inside <coughs> yes doctor hi rohan nice talk uh, so uh, you in your rehab said that for your all inside acls you, your patients will return back to their previous level of sport at 6 months so now the histological studies say that the acl incorporates with the bone in about 9 to 12 months so how do you explain that It's a bit of a rehab program which the patient is taking. There is no fixed period. That is, it's a four months, it's a six months, or a nine months. Uh, so uh, there is no fixed period like four to six months. It's just the rehab program which the patient will be undertaking. We can take a tensioning of the graft on both sides. At least, probably, I'm more confident that my patient can start the rehab early. And definitely, with the early rehab started, he returns to activity a little bit quicker as compared to other. Uh, Dr. Rohan, I have a question for you. If Dr. Rohan, if after please passing the graft in the tunnel, you feel still your graft is lax, there is no adequate tension. So, Dr. Rohan, I think either side you are having deep tension in the graft, either side. Okay, but you have fixed tunnels. So, but you have already done the tunnels for size approximately one centimeter, which is larger than the size of the graft. So, you know, I was telling you my graft. That when you are making the graft, you have to make sure it's not beyond six to six point five centimeters in length. Mm-hmm. No centimeters for the femoral side, two centimeters for the tibial side, and two to two point five centimeters for the intra-articular side. And you are drilling really approximately twenty five millimeters in tibial and femoral. So you have one more centimeter to do. Okay. So your calculations has to be. Okay. If any big calculation. Okay. So can I can I ask? My question to Doctor Vikas: uh, If you see knee stiffness, you are doing an anterior release by arthroscopically with flexion deformity. I understand we are getting the result, but for extension leg release of the anterior compartment, I doubt how you are getting the extension because it is the tightness of the posterior compartment. So, 
when you are not able to extend completely. Okay. Uh, what you have to do, there must be certain fragments which are obstructing anteriorly. If you think logically, all right? majority of the cause the of the extensive reason, lag is probably a tight posterior capsule. And the other reason, what I was saying is, in extensive, you also have to go posteriorly because many times the capsule shrinks. It was in my presentation, so you have to go on both the sides in case of extension. In case you have shown, you have done only anteriorly, then you got the full extension. I was able to get it, but not completely in that case. That's what I said, like three to five degrees. And I tried accessing that case posteriorly, the one I showed in the air. What was happening was it was too fibrous. And so we were kind of able to achieve three to five degrees. So we just did not uh, go in further for that case, the last one. But ideally, you should go anterior as well as posterior in case of it. Agree. That. Agree. My question yeah. to Vinay, sir. Uh, sir, you said, sir, here. Uh, uh, so you said that you drill uh, your cable tunnel through the substance of the remnant in the cable side. And so, how often does it create a cyclops reason or how to prevent it? So, uh, I have not faced any case where it become a cyclops reason because it is a, a big remnant which, uh, which which is covering the graft. Yes. So, in case if you feel that uh, it can form a cyclops if your graft is little posterior in that tunnel, if you keep the graft little anterior, the substance will be little posterior. If you keep tunnel little posterior, the substance will be more. On anterior, it can. If, if you feel that it can uh, block or it can form a cyclops, then I divide it. Okay. Uh, do you prefer putting a suture to the graft substance? Not, not to the graft substance. If I feel that I have to tie it, I will tie. I'll uh, suture it like a primary repair and then pass it through the tunnel or okay. to the graft. Questions from the panelists to the speaker. Okay. My my question just uh, last weekend. My last, uh, my question uh, to Dr. Vinay, uh, you are using, you are doing primary repairs of the ACL. Okay. Every time you are using these two bundles, tying two bundles separately and repairing them or sometimes, is it so? Uh, for com And uh, if you are doing it, are you able to identify two bundles every time? In okay. So I, I tie it and do it the two bundle technique always. Okay. It is not that you find out the two bundles separately. If you find that there is one uh, stump, you can repair it into the anterior middle part and the posterior lateral part. Okay. So we we need two tunnels, two bundles because we, we uh, am tying it onto the uh, lateral aspect of the femur over uh, the bone bridge or our endo button. That's why I need two tunnels. And another advantage is any time you are using any kind of anchors for fixation. Sorry? Primary repair using any anchors. Anchors. I initially I started with the anchors, then I shifted to this technique. Anchors can be used. So, but my idea is that once we make two tunnels of approximately 4.5 mm and 4.5 mm, it gives approximately 9 into 4.5 mm raw area of the bone, which is good for the healing of the graft tissue to the bone. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for. Uh... Those practicing all inside uh, type with uh, retentioning capacity on both sides or at least on one side. So you assess ACL laxity at what degrees of flexion after you have fixed the graph? Do you assess it at 30 degrees or 90 degrees? 30 degrees of flexion only. You okay. tighten the maximum graph at 30 degrees on okay. either side. No, but after fixation, at what angle of the knee do you put in your probe and you test for tension? That's around 30 degrees only. At 30 yes. degrees, you don't test the tension at 90 degrees at all. So, when you need to retension, how do you take uh, that decision? Still, uh, uh, to the same tension at 30 degrees or 90 degrees tensioning will more tension the graph. So, do you actually see the entire graph at 30 degrees of flexion to assess you tension? Can. You can. If you put it anterior, in the anterior part of the knee, you can see the graph. Put, put what anterior? So, the scope in the liquid anterior part of the knee, and you can put a scope there. Test for the 30 degrees on the page in how much the lateral graph is. And Dr. Roj, one more question. Once you have ascertained that there is some amount of flexity, where you will tighten it? On the femoral side, tibial side, both the sides, and how much? Any criteria or anything? Either, side, either sides, actually. Probably I will first tighten on the tibial side. If still I feel that graph is lax and there is no space available in the tibial side, I will again retention on the femoral side. I have a question uh, regarding uh, femoral tunnel. Uh, the ones who do it in, uh, uh, without the jig, uh, free drilling, what precautions do you take while you uh, do free drilling uh, for the femoral it, It's all about visualization. 
First, you clear the complete listing, identify the anatomical listing. What about the training? Landmarks. Make sure that make sure that you can see back of the condyle. And then go to the AM portal and then see where you want to do it. And then come back to the AL portal. And from the AM portal, you put a mark there. I use a RF to put a mark there. You come back again on the AM portal and check that it is all right. Then I use my all to make a hole there. And again, come back from the AM portal and make sure that it's all right to go and do the time. But what about the trajectory of the time? Trajectory depends on the flexion of the knee which you have at that point of view. You do it in 90 degrees. Like this this thing I do it in 90 degrees. 90 degrees. Yeah. Once I do this, then I'm happy with this at 90 degrees knee flexion. Then I flex the knee. I flex the knee. Yeah. And to check the trajectory, do you have any landmark where your guide wire is exiting on the lateral aspect of the female? Yeah. They, so that is, is the way to check question. your trajectory. The point of exit of guide wire will depend on your knee flexion. And will depend on how low you can go on the tibia. So your anteromedial antro antro portal, it has to be right near the meniscus. Only then you can shoot it back. So if you have a high flexion, then your lateral uh, on the lateral cortex, your exit point will be more anterior. And if you have low flexion, it will be more posterior. That is the reason when you do it in high flexion. When you see, you see most of our patients are thinly built and you can do a lot of flexion. And you go to the lateral gutter. After that, you see your all your sutures are lying there. What about small knees, sir? Are you able to get uh, a accommodate on the uh, small knees? Small knees are pretty straightforward. It is, very, it is only the obese patients, you know, the obese female patients, they have been difficult. No. I don't. Question for Dr. Rohan. Uh, for all inside, uh, we have used both the side and the button. Uh, tibia also. Yes. So, any special trick to pass that end button for uh, fixation? I, I mean, pulling. Yeah, yeah. But on the tibial side, definitely we can increase the length of the tight foot first. So that initially, when you're pulling the graph inside the tibia, the length of the uh, in the, uh, the type of itself allows the button to completely come outside the table tunnel. But then gradually we can cinch the end button on the right. While, while pulling, if it gets stuck, it, if it's stuck, then it will not stick. If you have increased the length of the graph and with a sudden pull, you just pull it. Yes, that's the thing. If you do not, then it may get stuck. Yes, uh, so question. So one more thing to add on that. Over the last few cases, what I have done is I have gradually pulled it till the tibial margin, the aperture of the tibial tunnel, and then make sure that the uh, button is vertical and then pull it. So you can see all this with your control lateral pressure. Dr. Sukesh, yeah, uh, I think with the literatures going from initially aperture fixations to then suspension and then again coming back, so what is your take on that? What do you think, uh, in your opinion, is the best choice? Then, uh, see, it is again an individual choice. You do what you are comfortable with. But generally, um, uh, like I told you, your choice of fixation and the outcome is always dependent on the bone mineral density. So, the bone mineral density is an important factor as far as your positioning of the graph, the position of the graph is concerned. Now, they say practical, because the cortex bone is stronger, so practical bone is good. But that doesn't uh, deprive the fact that uh, your interference slow fixation is in fact very good. In fact, some of the personal surgeons they use metal interference screws on the cell fixation. So you do what you do. That's it. There's no consideration of what is best. I, uh, how many patients have you tried to get a bone density before? I haven't done. So when I do, if I feel that it is very soft, what I do is uh, I increase my this happens most on the tibia, not on the femur. The other day is I increase my angle of the jig. So I try to engage the cortical bone. So I increase the lateral bone, but then I get a more harder bone. So I do that. Last one or two questions. Can I add to that? Whenever you are doing revision ACLs, if you see your tibial tunnel is always there, it never goes away. Despite the fact that you have put a bioscope and it has been five years, you get all the white putty, but it has never completely gone. When you put a suspension on the tibial side and do a revision, you'll see that the bone has reached 
the bone has reformed. It's like virgin bone. You only have the cotton where the soft tissue graft was there, but below that, the bone just reforms. So, one question for Dr. Vinay. So, uh, in case of stiffening, so what are your criteria or points you consider uh, while counseling a patient? Uh, you will get certain amount of uh, range, maybe like duration of stiffness, maybe like what all, what pre op uh, range of flexion you had. So, what are the criteria or points that you consider while counseling a patient or while assessing whether you will get how much degree of range post um, Actually, it depends on the cases, uh, what kind of case it is. Is it post traumatic or post TKR or post CCLR? Mostly, when it's post TKR or post CCLR cases, you get you have a good chance of getting a good range of motion. But when it's, it's a floating knee injury, when there's a distal femur and proximal TKR fracture along with, there is overall lesser chances of getting a good prognosis. That is one thing. That being said, what we always try to do is intraoperatively try to get the maximum amount of flexion range, flexion or extension. But we kind of believe uh, the result will be somewhere around 30 degrees lesser than what we are achieving intraoperatively. But most of the patients are okay. If they're getting 10 to 30 degrees of flexion, they are kind of okay with beyond 90 or 120. So we kind of explain the patient that it's a guarded prognosis. You should always go ahead with it. So it was like uh, about the duration of stiffness. Now, how much do you consider is like uh, you will be able to get what you can duration of stiffness and okay. the on the stage that we have. So uh, one of the cases we did uh, was around uh, one year post TKR, and we were able to achieve a good after that. Okay. Uh, when it comes to trauma. Maximum, I would uh, I would want to consider a short duration within three months or six months or something. But what ideal recommendation is within three to six months, you should do a manipulation or arthroscopic intervention. But there have been studies, even if you do at a later date, you can get those results. Mm -hmm. So, then I have one question for you. Not necessarily for your talk, but this is for uh, ACL repair in general. So, you are aware of that latest controversy where one player has sued one surgeon, Dr. James Andrew had been sued by PA. So, what, you know, in this case, for ACL repair, what precaution should we take so as to avoid any problems with it? So, so uh, any change in rehab or something you want to highlight? I'm not aware about the controversy. You can tell me. Precaution, what I did, I never commit that I will do it completely uh, repair. If Intraoperative findings suggest that the pain is not going to work or the tissue quality is not good. I switch to the reconstruction. Another thing, the rehab part, since these patients are earlier than two, three weeks time, so arthrofibrosis can be a problem. So for that, early rehab, aggressive rehab is a problem. So I have one last question uh, for Dr. Sukesh and Dr. Rohan. Uh, when we are doing all inside uh, ACL reconstruction, if we are using an adjusted excuse me, on the excuse me. Uh, our doctor has to take a flight, so can you take question later on? We have to wrap up this session. Oh, sorry, sir. Thank you. Thank all the speakers and all the panelists. Okay. I would request panelists to continue because they have to uh, moderate the real life surgery as well. So there is a change of program. Dr. Mohapati has already started doing tachycardia, so he has a flight to catch. And after that, we will have a moderation. You continue on this thing, and for real life surgery, you have to moderate the real life surgery. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Thank you a lot. Uh, sorry to trouble. Let's see. Yeah, uh, once again, thanks uh, to all uh, the organizing committee, the organizing team, and the chairpersons. In this session, today's topic is the region ACL, panel of region ACL. So, there are so many classifications are there. The free flow has told that uh, the classification, um, immunological classification is a uh, value of your ACL first. It's based on your instability, for your primary ACL reconstruction, the stiffness and the pain. That is not the pain, that is many pain sometimes you'll have because of the parapet or whatever is there. That is not the pain. The, uh, the remaining pain uh, and the ROI and the scene is, uh, these are the one of the reasons for the failure. When we use and how the BMA or the predictors for the early regions uh, surgeries, 
There was a study done by the Swedish and Norwegian registries in the region of history and 30 and 30,000 patients. The current patients, uh, in order to prevent the failure of the incidents, you know, uh, how will you plan to have any good presentations where your uh, tunnel should be there? Here you can see the three bars, you can see the uh, one is a short bar is there, one is the uh, intermediate bar is there, one is a gray bar is there. So the short bar is uh, excellent, that is a uh, posterior order to yourself to print on the tibial side. What is the longer bar is acceptable, uh, whereas the uninterpreted bar is not uh, acceptable. It comes in front of the outside the yourself to print, it comes in front of the ACL. So this is one of the, the things when we are going for the ASL reconstruction. The tunnel placements, it should be parallel when you are seeing the X-ray, it should be posterior to the blue sex line and we need the extension X-ray. Multiposition tunnels, two and three row, it causes the multi improvement and if it's two posterior row, it causes the PCL impingement. Classification according to the femur and tunnel, and plus in the three you can see here the leftmost, the middle and the uh, rightmost. The green one, it is a correct post and further placement, is a good, uh, is acceptable, excellent, that is, the middle circle is a new for later weeks, is somewhat acceptable, whereas the right circle it is not at all acceptable when you are doing your PCs. The middle seal, you have to do a radiographic evaluation, so you have to evaluate the uh, meniscus and cartilage in the other ligaments. A CT uh, to see any uh, definition of the family of astrolysis in the bone for the region of CT. The bone scan is already the only associated uh, bone infection with the uh, hemorrhagic problems. CT basic classification to see this thing. You can see the position, you can see here the blue zone and the orange zone and the red zone. The blue zone is a critical placement uh, of the ACL. So, your ACL is the, the only ACL reconstruction was done in the zone. So, based on the value of the tunnel, the room can run to use the really same tunnel and have the right defense. Type 1, inferior posterior, is a well positioned tunnel. You can really use it. If the soft tissue graft is there, there is no tunnel widening less than 9 mm or this thing, or maximum up to 10, we can reuse. That is a single stage procedure. If it is type 2, if it is vertical, sometimes it may overlap uh, to the lateral bridge. Those chances of convergence will be there in the revision. If it goes both vertical and slightly higher, two stretch procedure. Type 3, anterior malposition. Here also, again, it depends. If the tunnel widening is there more, if it is anterior and if more widening is there, when you go for the antomal position posterior, sometimes they may blow out for the anterior. So, you have to decide how much of the widening of the tunnel is there. If it is less, less widening is there, if the graft is pre primary ACL, when you place the graft anteriorly and the tunnel widening is less than 9 mm or this thing, you can fill it with bone graft and you go with the posterior, posterior inferior. Surgical technique, single stage reconstruction or two stage reconstruction. Grafts, choices, PTB, hamstring, tendoitalis, peroneus, longus. Everything, it depends again on the tunnel widening. The autographs, about a very good uh, uh, compared to the autographs. We told the study of mass and stored that uh, we get more with the uh, allographs than the autographs. Best choice revision again that remains a topic of debate. BTB again it again depends on the later again it depends on the tunnel widening. More tunnel widening, BTB is the best study given by the revision ACL reconstruction using the quadriceps and hamstring autographs leads to similar results. A four year good object is stability to four eight of this was a study done in the by European sports, because if you if the tunnel is more widened and if you use the soft tissue grafts, the, fa the failure rate is more. So you have to be very selective when you are using your grafts uh, in the revisions. Single stage reconstruction indication: if the whole tunnel is good, uh, whole tunnel is not uh, in your position tibial side. You can, however, you can place the tunnel if it is not dilated that much. You can remove the hardware. Uh, you can remove the soft tissue. Whatever reason, you can create a new tunnel. The problem comes is with the femoral side. So, what are the steps? You have to select the graft, which what you are doing, hardware removal, the, the revision notch plasty, the bone grafting, the tunnel preparation, and the graft fixation. Revision notch plasty, you should be careful when you are doing. You have to remove the posterior osteophytes and you have to widen the intergondylar uh, inter notch space. And you should be careful, sometimes you may uh, injure the articular. 
bone grafting and single stage procedure you can this is a conical bone cutting in our indian scenario you can use the hall mills these are the best if it is uh, 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 you can uh, sometimes this uh, hall mills are also coming with the stellates you can see this is the uh, i want to show you come on play play just play this slide huh? okay it's not playing here you can see this is the tunnel is placed anteriorly and the graft was used uh, so this is a high anterior place at tunnel so the soft tissue was uh, used at the time when they are doing the reconstruction but there is no that much of a uh, dilating of the tunnel so we we what we did is we went for the primary single stage uh, uh, tunnel placement aage kya dada de dena to na प्ले कर देना यू कैन सी इन दिस यू कैन सी हियर ओ थोड़ा पीछे करना ओ वीडियो थोड़ा दिस इज अ पोस्ट इंफीरियर प्लेस दिस वन यू कैन सी द पोस्ट कॉटेक्स एवरीथिंग वेर एज दिस इज द प्लेसमेंट वार एड इन थोड़ा पीछे जाते तो एंटी रिप्लेसमेंट ऑफ टनल का दिखा सकते हैं the previous you can see here this is the anterior place at tunnel now we made it to posterior and inferior this is the thing this is the anterior vertically placed is the old tunnel this is a new tunnel so it depends on uh, if there is anterior place it depends uh, whether uh, we can go with the single stage of this thing how much of the fill of the graft is there and you can see simultaneously the uh, posterior you can see the reference condyle maintenance this one you can come uh, this thing and see the that is posterior cortex and uh, this is the tibial now we'll see the tibial tunnel this is the tibial tunnel newly tibial tunnel so principle same as the primary acl can reconstruction uh, is a, a two stage reconstruction it depends on the surgeons indications for two stage reconstruction is uh, tunnel widening loss of range of motion and active infection tunnel widening if there is tunnel widening again for bone grafting weight uh, if it is more than uh, 10 to 12 two stage for the tunnel widening ct is uh, one important thing uh, to see how much of the tunnel widening is there second is the loss of range of motion if there is a loss of extension and 20 degrees loss of flexion and there should not be when you are going for the revision acl there should not be a knee gate bent knee gate stiffney arthroscopic lysis active infection irrigation debridement removal of the hardware antibiotics to eradicate the infection previously they used to wait for 3 months but better to wait for 6 months until you are until the tunnel should get right and uh, uh, normal hematological values bone grafting again two stage i don't want to go on this this is hollow mills this is a dowel technique nowadays the hollow mills you are getting with the stellate this is a mentioned by the dowel you can uh, that with the stellate and with the small punch you can uh, uh, take the grafts and push it into the you can see the fill of the graft you can go for the re surgery like a primary new graft single or double bundle technique is depends according to the surgeon choice principles same as a uh, primary acl reconstruction the augmented procedures if there is rotational stabilities uh, modified limer procedure you can go it with is a simple i don't want to go in this because the next session will have the topic on that simply you can uh, fix it uh, below the back of the uh, lateral collateral like a whip stitch this thing take home message it is first to study uh, identify the cause of the failure of the surgery simply indicating a patient uh, for revision reconstruction without a clear clause uh, uh, will give in less optimal results revision reconstruction one one should be more comfortable with the different various choice here the main thing is uh, you should know the how to harvest the grafts and everything tunnel placement is very critical more, better more than the tibial tunnel it is a femoral tunnel it needs a lot of skill and expertise additional fixation with a post or anchor is uh, intraoperatively uh, we can achieve your feeling is less satisfactory 
most uh, return to sports it is one of the most debated issues following the revision asl reconstruction high level high level of evidence uh, shows the gu guide uh, definitely to return to sports is again it depends on timeline is based on the uh, patient condition and this thing hence surgeon should evaluate each patient on individual basis to determine when he or she is ready to return to sports thank you uh, before leaving uh, dr mopar shivanas uh, i would like to facilitate i would like to request our senior faculty dr jagtap sir to facilitate uh, dr mopar thank you sir sorry i couldn't be uh, for the panel discussion so at least two thank questions you. before he which is to help one if we miss the flight you can come back we got a lot of academic excitement i am always uh, uh, welcome sir But you have to answer two questions before leaving. <laughs> How do you plan for your hardware removal? Every time you remove the old hardware, or you plan your tunnel, then sir, it depends on the which hardware the previous surgeon is uh, used, sir. If he is used the titanium, better to remove it, sir. If it is peak material, sometimes it may uh, hold the femur bone. If there is no in CT base, if there is no any osteolysis around the peak material or anything, sometimes what happens is it gets absorbed, it becomes very stiff in the tunnel. At that time, we can create the new tunnel, tibial side. That that won't be a problem, sir, because the whatever when we start the drilling this thing, it it cuts that peak material. Our drill bit will cut that peak material. But when it comes to bioabsorbable like try TCP and this thing, most of the time it gets incorporated, or otherwise it 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 falls off when we are doing it off like that. That is all. So titanium better to remove it off, sir. So most of the times, uh, what happens is uh, when we are going through the X-rays, uh, the patient when we are seeing in the revisions, uh, we, we we have to see whether that how much is the tibial slope. The more the tibial slope is, uh, uh, what they say is uh, to go for the corrective osteotomy and do the revision ACL. But uh, sometimes it becomes a tedious process. Telling the patient, I'll cut your bone, and this thing also they are not nowadays they are not accepting. The patient with the insurance patients they are accepting, and sports person somewhat acceptable. Not with the other patients. Now the studies are coming up is the the placement of the graft. You take a BTB graft uh, in that scenarios better. You take a BTB graft and place near to the middle in front of the correct point of isometric point of the uh, in front of just uh, five centimeters away and short thickened graft. Means uh, it should be very. Navid, if we want him back, we can ask him more questions. Hello. <laughs> he will sure sure miss the flight. Last question. Last sir, question. Uh, one question. One yeah. stage or two stage? Is it most of the time your pre-op decision or intra-op decision? In revision surgeries, going for one stage or two stage? Is it most of the time? Yes. But is it your pre-op decision most of the you you got everything done MRI CT everything you have is it most of the time your pre-op decision or will it change intraoperatively? Any tips and tricks to uh, uh, to use? Suppose uh, the tunnels are partially correct. Okay, and if you uh, you uh, want to use that tunnel, so any tips and tricks to avoid the two stage surgery? In that
Use a stack screw as well. You can use two screws. So one screw will take care of the bone loss, and the second screw will be used for the fixation. Are you anytime using kind of mosaic plastic set uh, to harvest the graft for filling this tunnel? Thank you. Yes. Sir, sir, last question, sir. My chance. Thank you. Sir, I would request, request uh, Dr. Dr. Ravad, Ravad sir, sir to share his blessings with us, us. And, and Dr. Pradeep Chaudhary as well to uh, share a few words. Uh, at the outset, I'll say that 
this is probably the first super speciality meeting we are attending here. It's so well organized. And uh, uh, that is from my side, I can say that I've learned a lot. And uh, all the scientific deliberations were really up to me. Thank you very much for calling me and getting me here. Thank you, Tanmay. And now uh, I must congratulate the orthoscopy colleague of the Indore and the MP. They had an extensive course, and first time only we are discussing knee orthoscopy related things. It's an excellent course, and my many congratulations and best wishes to all all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, in continuation, I'll be uh, handing over to Dr. Brijesh. <laughs> I'll invite Dr. Sunil sir for his uh, live real life surgery. I invite panelists Dr. Suman Nath, Dr. Arjun Jain, Dr. Sukesh Rao, and Dr. Raju Ravi Tejam to, to moderate the real life surgery. Uh, just a second. Uh, I'm extremely sorry. Uh, I missed out. I would uh, request uh, Dr. Lavesh and Dr. Akshay Jain. Dr. Akshay Jain is our Indoor Orthopedic Association's uh, clinical sec uh, secretary. And Dr. Lavesh Kandalwal is uh, joint secretary. I would request them to kindly be here. Lavesh, Akshay.
Excuse me, sir. Uh, what is the size of the uh, thread that you use? Is it number zero or number two? How much uh, distance to the posterior wall will go for this uh, person here? Yeah. How much? Uh, Minimum length of the femoral What is minimum length of the femoral Minimum length of the femoral Is there, is there a point you feel that it is too short? Any limit? Femoral cortex. Asking about the length of the femoral cortex. Femoral tunnel. Yeah. The length is if, if I have a 35 mm. mm. Thickness of 4.5 tunnel, 
then the maximum I can go is 30. Yeah. And the minimum I go is at least 25. Please, would you change your tunnel in other, any circumstances? If you feel that the tunnel is short, what is your go-to point for a short funeral tunnel? When do you feel that the tunnel is short and I have to change my tunnel? I'm not really bothered about a short tunnel because the graph won't eat me in the tunnel. If you go to adjustable loop, I don't think so. Exactly. Yeah. If you the, have a fixed, fixed loop, it may be an issue. Yeah, fixed loop, usually it is just uh, touch and go. Uh, here, let go back here. There, you've done that, that. and uh, so we do the definitive reaming here. You need to make sure that you don't scrub the medial condyle. You need to make sure you don't put the reamer in and start reaming. You only ream it. Once it is on the condyle, and uh, you always clear the debris and see. You need to know that you are drilling oblique tunnels, not straight tunnels. And uh, what is 25? What you are seeing is actually not 25 on the other side. It is less than 25. So if you are doing a 25 tunnel, it is on the near side. It is 25. On the far side, it is bigger than that. Now we pass the passing pin with a suture. I keep it in the femoral socket here and at this point I extend the knee and I get my scope into the lateral parapetalar uh, gut, lateral patellar, uh, parapetalar gutter and then here I make a lateral parapetalar portal which is one centimeter away from the patella and at midpoint of the patella. So I just make that and do a small capsulotomy there and uh, this, the guide wire exit on the lateral cortex depends on how much hyperflexion you have given. And it is always, always there. It is a matter of searching. Because I have put my bead pin there, now you don't need to worry about uh, using a shaver there. If you pass the suture and start doing this, then what happens is your sutures will go. So again, you have to pass the suture again. Because it's my bead pin, I am not bothered about it. And... Uh, you can see the guide pin is always there and this is real time video, I have not edited it and this is the amount of time it takes every time for me. So once I have identified that, I just clear that loose areolar tissue and the tissue around the femoral socket there. So I can just pass the suture, that is uh, pretty much straightforward. And uh, you can see the tunnel there, I have a posterior wall. And again, I shift back into the AM portal, make sure that I'm happy with uh, whatever I'm looking at. Coming to the TBL side, I mark where I want to get my TBL tunnel, which is just besides the medial spine, and I identify the antihorn of lateral meniscus. This is an elbow aimer, so I make sure that I'm in the femoral footprint and uh, like everyone does, I just protect it. And this is just a routine TBL tunnel, nothing fancy about it. And then you make sure that you clear all the soft tissues for a smooth graft passage and uh, pull your passing sutures down. How do you drill your TBL tunnel? Do it sequentially or in one go? I do it in one go. Now, that is the graft passage. You pass the sutures there. And now you extend the knee. And... Uh, you start pulling your button onto the lateral bottle. So flipping is done under vision. And I must tell you, since I started doing this, which was almost seven or eight years ago, I have never marked the graft. I just marked 20 mm on the graft. That's it. So that's it. The button is flipped under vision. And the button is flipped and seated under vision. And there are so many things which can happen. The sutures can entangle in so many ways. Only when you see it, you realize it. And there are lots of things which you can do with this portal because it's an active portal. It's not a passive portal. You can change the way in which your button sits from this portal. Once you do that, the button is seated there on the femoral side. Mainly do in all cases, this exposure and uh, seeing the... Yeah. You will do in all, all your surgeries? Every ACR. Okay. That's the way it becomes a habit. That's the reason I know where my guide wire exits. So if you start doing it, you will know the angle of flexion that you are using. You will know where your guide wire exits. It is not that difficult and 
more importantly, there is nothing you are harming. There is no harm at all. So because I am using a suspension device on the tibial side, I routinely take off a cuff of tissue and this cuff has to be on the superior part of the uh, tunnel that you see on the tibia. You need to take a small cuff of tissues off. The cortical device has to sit on cortex. So it sits on tissues, the tissues are going to necros and it's going to become loose. I take a small periosteal elevator and make sure that uh, I elevate a bit of periosteal. So you need to have a clear view of the mouth of the tunnel when you're doing this. And once you do it, your femoral button is flipped as I showed you, seated. And now you start cinching your graft. You just put a finger in the loop of the T button and then you start cinching the graft. You start cinching adequate amount of graft into the femoral tunnel which is about 20 mm routinely. And once you are there, then you start cinching the tibial side. Now, once this tibial button is seated and cinched, what I do is I knot on the tibial side and then I do cycling 25 times. And then I go back, have a look at the graph and I also knot on the femoral side. Because my button and sutures are right in front of me, I knot it on the femoral side. So, basically speaking, I've got two fixed loops on both sides. So, so what is the minimum diameter of the tibia that you drill so to allow your P button to sit on it? Nice. The diameter of the button is 16 mm. I'm sure you won't drill the knob diameter. That is around 7 mm. I'm sure you won't drill a less than 7 mm tunnel. Or more than 16 mm tunnel. Sir, last question. How much distance is the knob, the size of the length of the knob? Because it how much your graft should go inside the tibial tunnel? The knob is around 6 mm in length from the top of the button. Yeah, 6 mm short. Sorry? Oh, I don't use a I don't use a flip cutter at all. It is just a standard TBL tunnel. I don't need a flip cutter. As a matter of fact, what uh, uh, if you ask anyone who does suture discs on TBL side, if you ask them, if you go back and see the bone reforms. The whole bone reforms. And the same thing we have observed in this. I've got a few MRI scans after uh, using T button, after a year after that, and you can see that the bone reforms in the rest of the hole. Just like our screw holes, which are filled with bone, this just fills. The people who use a metal disc, they are unable to show because it is not MRI compatible. Whereas here, because it is MRI compatible, I can show that the bone is reformed. Uh, one question regarding graft preparation. You put that uh, circlage uh, yeah. loop on, on that on both the sides. Yeah. So is it that that uh, loop comes in the mouth of the tunnel? This. Where yeah. I I try to do that because, because, because then that I don't place, need to measure. Because that is the place where that graft is going to heal in future, and if that part is uh, interfaced with the suture. I think healing will be a little uh, difficult. That's what happened with the graft link of the artifacts. They put two loops at 15 mm and 20 mm from the. Yeah, I agree with you. Then it is never that perfect, is it? It either goes inside or stays outside. <laughs> it never ends at the mouth. <laughs> so what is the advantage of this P button over a suture disc that traditionally was being used? Yeah. The, Number one, the thing is, the patient won't complain. He won't come and say that uh, you put a uh, say metal. Yeah. Number two is this suture disc. You see, if you, I've done a lot of suture discs, and even when I do ACL, PCL, I use suture discs on both sides. Okay. If you see the suture disc, when you shorten it, when you shorten and tighten it properly, the suture disc will migrate to the upper part of the tunnel. 
if you have cleared the cortex properly, it will migrate to the upper part of the tunnel. Here, the suture disc, the T button will not migrate to the upper part of the tunnel because the stub will stop it. The stub stabilizes the button there. That is one thing. Okay. And this is obviously more uh, friendly to the bone because the Young's modulus is very close to the tibial bone in that uh, location. And sir, other thing when we are tying the knot at times, it becomes a loose knot. So, do you retie it again or do you adjust it on the femoral side? Sorry, sorry, I didn't get it. When you are tying the knot on the tibial side, at times the knot becomes loose. So, oh, yeah. After so do, you, do you retie the knot or do you adjust it on the femoral side? After I tie the knots on the, I cinch on the tibial side, tie the knots on the tibial side, okay, then I do cycling. And then I retension on the femoral side again. That is my final tension. And I tie knots on the femoral side again. Why not cycle and then tie your tibial button? Which one? You, you can do it. In my case, because I am exposing the femoral side and I have it completely under my control. So, this is easier for me. I just tie the tibial knots then and there and tie the femoral knots after cycling. I have done lots of this with uh, fixed loop. You don't need to do a adjustable loop on the femur. Absolutely no. You can do a fixed loop, but you should be aware of the length of the graft and things. You, your calculation has to be more perfect. I showed it with an adjustable loop because it makes easier to understand. But I've done a lot with fixed loop on the femur and uh, this thing on the tibia. No. Sir, there's a question from Sanjay. So, so we, we, we will, yeah, we will yeah, see you all, all back, back in 15 minutes. minutes. You got the option, option of uh, salad, salad, main course, course dessert, dessert soup. So you can choose any, any one of them and come back, come back in 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome.
deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future. The start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future. The start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. 
Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation, consistency, and giving power to you Surgeons, our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future. The start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future. The start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. 
It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenix. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't a final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't a final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future. The start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change the only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex, creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation, consistency, and giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex, a division of Healthium. Perfection. 
it isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process, progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change, the only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex, creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation, consistency, and giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex, a division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process, progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change, the only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex, creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation, consistency, and giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future. The start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, 
development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex, a division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't a final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process, progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex, creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation, consistency, and giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't a final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex, creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation, consistency, and giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium.
Introducing, the Ceronix Shura Stitch. An all-inside, meniscal repair device, for precise and secure, arthroscopic meniscal repair. Can deploy in three simple steps. Pierce, turn, and fire. Adjust the needle's depth by, rotating the depth control knob, depending on the meniscus thickness. Using the Ceronix slotted cannula, slide in the Ceronix Shura Stitch, up to the meniscus, in the inverted position. Pierce the meniscus, at the desired point, until the depth control tube, touches the meniscus. Now, prepare to deploy, the first implant, by turning the safety knob, from safe position 0, to active position 1. Advance the deployment knob, using the thumb, until an audible click, to deploy the first implant. Then release, and allow it to spring back to its half position. To prepare for the second implant, retract the needle, and position it at the next desired point, until the depth control tube, touches the meniscus. Then turn the safety knob, to active position 2, and advance the implant, using the deployment knob, until there's an audible click. So we are starting the session, the next session is on pivoting knee, lot of times we see there is high pivot knees, uh, there are hidden lesions in that and we will be uh, trying to get solutions for that. So I would request uh, Dr. Pradeep Chaudhary sir, our central zone IOA secretary to chair the session along with Dr. Raj Shekhar who is flown from Bilai. Good afternoon for a post lunch session. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Sheetal Gupta on ramp lesion repair methods and indications. Dr. Sheetal, please.
So the passage of the scorpion is relatively easy now. So again I am taking a scorpion, taking a bite from the meniscus, then again taking bite from the capsule. Still I will not tie it. I will again save and pack it into the anterolateral portal. So now the two, two sutures are passed. This visualization can only be feasible if you are using a two portal technique. Otherwise you will not be able to see that this much extent of the ramp. Again repeating the same step using the knee scorpion, taking a bite from the posterior uh, aspect of the meniscus. Now everything is done. So this is a simple, so only a single or a two sutures you can use, you can cut the suture and you can reuse again. So I am doing now alternate half hitches and tying the knots and then the last one, so tying using alternate half in hitches. So again looking from the high posterior middle portal, I put my spro from the low posterior middle portal to check the stability of ramp repair which looks a quite uh, stable fixation. So to further maybe simplify or complicate the things I don't know, we have devised another technique which is we I called it as a shoelace technique. I was drawing this uh, kind of a surgical steps on the paper and my, my son suggested that it's looking like a shoelace. So I have given it as a shoelace technique and it's, it has been published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. So this is the shoelace technique. Again uh, the ACL is completely torn. I am going and looking for the lateral meniscus and the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. So once this is done, I will enter into the posterior middle compartment. You see, everything is absolutely normal. Until unless you go into the posterior middle compartment, you will not judge that patient is having a ramp lesion. So under surface is normal, superior surface is normal, and is a huge ramp. Again, you will not be able to see completely if you are looking from the anterolateral portal. So you will repeat the same step: a low posterior middle portal and a high posterior middle portal. So from the low posterior middle portal, a spinal needle will come, which will be followed by putting a passport cannula. 
and then you will make a high posterior medial portal so the the basic tip is once you are making a low posterior medial portal your spinal needle should be parallel to the posterior aspect of the meniscus so that your bite is easy while you are passing from the scorpion now i have uh, put the passport cannula which is around 8 mm now i will do a multiple puncture on the high posterior medial portal and i will put a switching stick and then i will switch my scope to the high posterior medial portal so i am switching now you can see i am able to see my ramp lesion i will do the rasping i will take a scorpion i will take the it's a single suture technique so i am taking the suture i am passing the first end onto the meniscus side and the second end onto the capsular side now what i will do so this is first then it's a second so i'll name this a 1 2 2 1 i will take the second end of the suture so i am using the same suture i am tying it again and now i will take the first end of the suture i will tie it again on the meniscal side so it's a very very simple technique again you will use, use the, the, the another, another end, end of the suture, suture we will pass, pass through the meniscus and then we'll keep on passing through the meniscus and through the posterior aspect of the capsule so once you keep on doing that you will see gradually that you are forming a kind of a shoe lace so once you tension it then whole of the meniscus and the capsule so it is a basically a side to side suture that you are doing in a continuous manner using a knee scorpion so there may be chances there may be suture entanglement but with over a period of time because you are saying a lot of money it's a single suture technique and you can see anything which heal will heal better if it's a continuous suture so continuous suture will give a better compression and the better healing once you pull it all of the shoe lace is uh, uh, will compress the ramp use alternate half inches and then just tie it so depending on the extent of the lesion you can keep on continuing the same shoe lace up to the more medial extent or if it's a smaller lesion you can cut it early but uh, with a single suture you can manage uh, your surgery so to conclude the posterior medial portal in the needle test should be done in all ACL reconstruction failure to diagnose the ramp or inadequate repair may lead to the failure of concomitant ACL reconstruction a two posterior medial portal will give a added advantage not only for visualization of the full extent of the ramp but the repair is relatively quite easy so this two technique which uh, has uh, i have devised and both has been published is the pass spark and tie technique which i have named as a ppd technique and the shoelace technique which is again available both the techniques are available online is an inexpensive implant lace quick and it gives a better stability thank you Thank you, Dr. Sheetal. We'll have a question and answer session later. Now I'll invite Dr. Vikram Sapre for uh, ramp lesion repair method indication along with SELR. good afternoon everyone uh, at the onset i would like to thank uh, organizing committee and uh, seronix india for giving me this opportunity uh, <clears throat> i'll be speaking on uh, meniscus root repair along with acl reconstruction indications and methods so coming to the epidemiology if we see uh, the occurrence of uh, root tear uh, along with acl so lateral meniscus root tears are more common as compared to medial meniscus root tears and in fact uh, if we see laprad's work Uh, they conclude that uh, lateral meniscus root tears are ten times more common than medial meniscus root posterior horn root tears. Considering for uh, anterior horn tears, in this study they have found that anterior uh, root tears they are more common with iatrogenic injuries, especially with tibial tunnel drilling or with uh, tibia nailing. So, coming to the biomechanic biomechanical effects produced by uh, medial meniscus root tears, if we see the normal biomechanics, the axial load. which is converted into a circumferential hoop stress and this uh, circumferential hoop stress it gives a weight distribution uh, increases the surface area and decreases the peak uh, contact pressures but when there is a root tear the hoop stress hoop con uh, hoop stresses are uh, lost and so there is a meniscal extrusion which leads to a decreased contact uh, surface and increased contact pressures 
So uh, this was a uh, study done by Robert uh, Allaire in which they concluded uh, that it's equivalent to a complete meniscectomy uh, if the root is gone. Coming to the biomechanical effects of lateral meniscus root tear, they are less severe because uh, here on the lateral side, lat posterior horn of lateral meniscus, you have uh, <coughs> meniscofemoral ligaments giving support to root. So if you see um, the biomechanical, biomechanical consequences of a posterior root tear of lateral meniscus, the work done by Forkel et al. in which they show there is a 14% prevalence of lateral extrusion in cases of intact MPFL. So that if MPFL, uh, sorry, uh, medial uh, meniscofemoral ligaments, they are intact, there is only 14% uh, chances of uh, the root extrusion. But when even uh, the meniscofemoral ligaments are torn, there are 60% chances of uh, extrusion. Coming to the classification, uh, classification given by LAPRA, uh, type 1 is a partial tear, type 2 is a complete tear, type 3 is with bucket handle component and type 4 is an oblique radial tear and type 4 is a bony avulsion. So, uh, this classification uh, for a lateral meniscus uh, root lesion, this was uh, given by Forkel and Peterson because in the LAPRAT's classification, they do not consider meniscofemoral ligaments as the stabilizing structures. So, uh, according to this classification, uh, type 1 is a avulsion of the root, type 2 a complete radial tear and type 3 uh, avulsion, complete avulsion with meniscofemoral ligaments are also torn. So, on clinical evaluation, what we see is uh, the symptoms are highly variable in, uh, uh, we see knee instability because of ACL, addition to that, you will only see postromedial joint line tenderness and pain. But what is most important and give rise to suspicion is a very high grade pivot shift. So, we should be very careful and uh, see for uh, the root and uh, ramp when there is a high grade pivot shift. Uh, for uh, one uh, maneuver has been described by Romain Sale at all, with, which they say, if you give a varus in hyperextension and uh, if you palpate enteromedial joint line, if there is an extrusion, palpable extrusion, this is suggestive of uh, root tear. Coming to the imaging, we see a uh, ghost sign on the sagittal images, a torn root on the axial images and you can see, sorry, on uh, coronal you can see a, a root avulsion out there. So, uh, the management considerations for operative management, if we see, we need to assess the condition of cartilage. So, if uh, cartilage is good and if we can do uh, repair, then it's okay, otherwise it's difficult. Uh, condition of meniscus, uh, whether it's then the limb alignment, whether it's a virus knee or own, the BMI of the patient and willingness to adhere to a rehabilitation protocol. The specific instruments that we require for operative management is a uh, root repair jig. Ceronics has got a, a good a sleek uh, root repair jig. Direct passing devices like Scorpion or First Pass uh, is required here. So, uh, coming to the surgical steps, first uh, for ACL reconstruction along with root repair. First we do is uh, examination of under anesthesia and diagnos diagnostic scopy. We confirm our diagnosis and then we go to graft harvest. Then we do a graft harvest in preparation. Once graft harvest in preparation is done, then we go for a femoral tunnel drilling. Once we are completed with femoral tunnel, then we complete our root repair work, place a guide wire uh, with the help of a uh, footprint jig, take the suture bites, you can take it with fiber wire or ethy bond or, uh, or a tape, uh, then we make a T-bill tunnel, shuttle the sutures and then we go for a T-bill tunnel for ACL and uh, T-bill fixation for both. So, uh, this is, uh, you can see, uh, we have done a MCL pie crusting here to increase the visualization. That's a type 2 uh, laprite type of uh, root uh, tear. You can see the root tear out there. Once you are uh, definitive diagnosis done about uh, root tear, then you go and clear the space out there to improve your visualization. And once then there is done, you Denude the cartilage, debride the cartilage there to increase the healing, the footprint area of the root. You also denude the cartilage out there. Rasp it with the diamond rasp, the posterior capsule, inferiorly as well as superiorly, and the edges of the menisci, meniscus here. Then you place a root repair jig. You can use any type of root repair jig. Place a guide wire there. Take a, <coughs> uh, 
bytes, switch bytes there. Here I have used a 20 loop and I will shuttle it with the fiber tape. You can use any configuration. Here I am using the Mason Allen configuration. Since stitches are also good, the vertical uh, stitch has been taken. The second for uh, horizontal stitch. And then once all the bytes have been taken, you shuttle it and your <coughs> Mason Allen configuration repair is done. So uh, on the cortical fix on the table fixation, you can use any type of cortical button, or you can use a post, or you can use a any a lateral row anchor that we use for the table fixation. That's the lateral meniscus uh, posterior horn root here. <coughs> Once you define the tear out there on the posterior horn, you make a TBL tunnel. You drill the TBL. Then you over ream it with uh, 4 mm reamer. You protect it with the uh, curette. Then you take a couple of bites with the uh, scorpion there. Take uh, one more bite there. It and this was the, the final repair. This was along with ACL avulsion, so ACL avulsion repair was done. <coughs> this is uh, porcal type 1, I mean, the menisco femoral ligaments are probably intact because you can see the posterior horn being pulled up, up there. So that's the posterior horn, lateral meniscus root here. You make the table tunnel, uh, then you over ream it with uh, 4 m drill bit. And then uh, here you can pass, I have passed direct stitches with the tape, the same stitches I have taken. That's the complete uh, root repair on the lateral side. This is oblique radial tear of lateral meniscus. Uh, that's type 4 of Laprad uh, tear. Here you have to take uh, two simple horizontal stitches uh, on the tear, oblique tear. And, uh, Dr. Vikram, please conclude. Yeah. 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 So this completes our uh, radial tear. This was a uh, type 5 bony avulsion tear on uh, <coughs> medial meniscus as well as lateral meniscus posterior root tear. So uh, this repair was done. Patient also had a lateral meniscus uh, root tear avulsion, bony avulsion. So that was repaired and uh, he had a ACL avulsion also and that was repaired. Uh, uh, so the only consideration we need to have is of the uh, tunnel coalition here. If it's only with the medial meniscus root, uh, yeah. unlikely to have a tunnel coalition because medial meniscus uh, tunnel will be quite post medially uh, and uh, ACL tunnel try to keep it more centrally. Only problem you can have in tunnel coalition when it's the, both the roots with ACL. So lateral meniscus uh, tunnel will be in the center. So try to keep ACL tunnel in the more towards center. Central tunnel, middle tunnel will be lateral meniscus and the most middle will be for the middle meniscus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vikram. It is a very nice video demonstration and a uh, very really nice talk. Now I'll invite Dr. Ravi Raja, Ravi Teja, Rudra Raju for the talk on lateral extra articular tenodesis techniques, fixation and options. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, the organizing uh, committee and uh, Dr. Singh Lapsingh sir for the opportunity. And I am always indebted to Dr. David Parker from Sydney, whom I was trained under. So, um, when we talk about ACL reconstruction, uh, the aim of uh, 
ACL reconstruction is to make sure that the patients are satisfied. The overall knee function is recovered and uh, obviously return to sports and uh, good functional outcome. But uh, if you look at that, um, all of them correlate more with the rotational stability, more than translational stability. And that's where uh, now the more emphasis on uh, lateral tenor diseases have come in picture. So uh, in the recent studies, uh, Houston uh, and their group have shown that uh, nearly out of five, four uh, patients have uh, who have ACL injury will also have kind of uh, you know ALL uh, injury. Similarly, in chronic uh, ACL injury patients, almost 15 patients, uh, who, I mean 20 patients who have uh, chronic laxity turns out to have uh, you know 15 patients have uh, ALL injury along with ACL injury. And also MRI studies have uh, shown that to 46 to 79 patients, uh, uh, percentage of ACL injuries have uh, ALL injuries as well. So uh, if lateral extraarticular tenor disease procedures when done in isolation, uh, they tend to have poor results. And uh, these patients don't uh, really uh, get back to sports. And uh, obviously uh, over uh, lateral constraints, the knee and uh, um, uh, subsequent development of arthritis is also noted. So, uh, what are the uh, various uh, techniques that we know of? Um, Lemaire, modified Lemaire, Lusley, Macintosh, and uh, Allison. So, what are the indications of uh, lateral extraarticular tenodesis? Definitely grade 3 pivot shift and uh, revision anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction without an obvious uh, reason for failure. And patients who are into sporting activities or high level athletes. Uh, generalized ligament laxity and uh, any female soccer players uh, like who have high risk of failure. So, talking about various techniques, uh, Limer, uh, we split the ideal tibial gland and was uh, detached proximally, passed under the FCL to the femoral tunnel at the attachment of uh, lateral gastrocnemius. And the graft is uh, passed deep to the FCL a second time and then fixed with the sutures uh, to the ITB uh, in the knee in uh, 30 degree flexion and uh, when it is in external rotation. And this is modified Lemer. Uh, it's exactly done the same way, but it's not looped around. Rather, right, it is uh, drived under the FCL and then pitched onto the femur, which I will be demonstrating a video in the upcoming slides. And then we know of uh, Allison technique, where we uh, distally, we detach the strip of iliotibial band with a bone flake. Then we pass deep to the FCL and then uh, anchor onto the bone uh, near the Gerdes tubercle. And then we have Macintosh, where a strip of IEDO tibial band was detached proximally, passed deep to FCL through an osteoperiosteal tunnel, posted to the FCL uh, femoral uh, attachment. And then again, it's looped through the lateral intermuscular septum and sutured back onto itself at the Gerdes tubercle. And this is then uh, when knee is at 90 degrees. And the last one is the Losley technique, uh, where the strip of IEDO tibial band was detached proximally and passed to the femoral tunnel that originated at the attachment point of the lateral gastrocnemius and ended anterodistal to the FCL femoral insertion site. Uh, it is also fixed um, when the knee is flexed at 30 degrees and uh, it is held in external rotation. So this is modified Lemaire, which we commonly do. Uh, so skin incision followed by eight, uh, 80 uh, millimeters of uh, length on uh, maybe one mm apart um, in the diameter and you, uh, tunnel it through the FCL and then uh, fix it onto the femur, either using staple or an anchor or a uh, interference screw. So this is a short video uh, demonstrated by Laprad. I think they do the ACL and then uh, uh, take the incision towards the Gerdes tubercle and then uh, clear the IT band and then whip stitch the proximal part of the uh, IT band and then and then just uh, leave it aside continue with the ACL and then uh, yeah shut it through and then continue with the ACL procedure and then in the last uh, they fix it uh, with a staple.
and this is done at uh, mean 30 degrees of uh, flexion with external rotation. So what are the pitfalls for uh, these procedures? The procedures have a high failure rate if performed alone, as I mentioned earlier, and they should only be performed in conjunction with obviously ACL reconstruction. Post-operative immobilization can lead to permanent loss of the range of motion and lateral side knee pain can occur following extraocular reconstructions. So, uh, evidence has shown that uh, LET combined with uh, ACL reconstruction has shown uh, definitely uh, statistically significant reduction in the pivot and there's no difference in the rate of osteoarthritis. Various studies have uh, shown in favor of LET with ACL uh, uh, compared to ACL alone. And this uh, study by Lucas uh, have looked into uh, lateral extraarticular T nodes uh, versus uh, normal ACL reconstruction, and definitely IKDC scores, uh, Lisholm scores, and uh, Tegner scores were all positive towards uh, LETS. And the graft rupture rates were much lesser compared to uh, ACL alone in uh, this study. Lachman pivot shift uh, were also significantly reduced uh, post surgery uh, when you. Uh, add LETS along with uh, ACL reconstruction. So to conclude, ACL reconstruction techniques may fail to restore full uh, uh, knee rotation stability. Pivot shift of more than grade one, uh, more points towards an ALL injury and uh, should always uh, help surgeon to think towards LETS procedures. The LETS provides rotational control due to enhanced biomechanical advantage and it will reduce the uh, anterolateral stability and uh, decrease the rate of uh, graft rupture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raju. I would like to felicitate our uh, chairpersons for this. Dr. Mopati's lecture already done. So, and we'll be taking the next uh, question and answer session. So, I would like to call Dr. Pradeep Chaudhary and Dr. Raj Shekhar, please. So I would like to call Dr. Uh, Rajesh question? Yes, for the question and answer session to moderate the session. Uh, so uh, now there will be a nice panel discussion on the pivoting knee. I'll invite analyst, uh, all the speakers, Dr. Sheetal, Dr. Vikram Sapre, Dr. Teja, Dr. Sunil Apsangi, and Dr. Jakhaspar. Please. So all of us had uh, uh, heard nice talks on various like root repair, cramp lesions. So now we'll be we'll have some basic questions with our eminent analyst. See. Now, first thing is how a positive pivot shift, positive pivot shift test changes your treatment plan. Means whenever you uh, examine a patient and a uh, pivot shift is positive. So, what thing comes in your mind, uh, yeah. Doctor Teja? Let's start. Yeah, so uh, definitely, uh, um, when there's a high grade pivot shift, uh, we think of uh, a root tear or uh, a ramp lesion or it can be you know hyperlaxity 
in the clinical examination, uh, particularly, we look for uh, any of these uh, issues. And then accordingly, we will be counseling the patient that he might be a, have an LETS added along with the basic uh, SLB construction. Okay. So, anything else? For the, if, the, after me, uh, and the type of fluid shift changes the your uh, feelings that the patient might have type 1, type 2, type 3, means? Yes, sir. Okay. More than, more than uh, type 1, then I would suspect uh, towards you know, the lesion and the other uh, pathologies. Dr. Yeah. Vikram? Yeah, when you see a uh, high grade fluid shift, means uh, like uh, type 3 or 4, and uh, you'll have a third. Uh, while uh, doing a pivot shift. So in those conditions, you consider three things, the hidden lesions, the root, ramp, and anterolateral lesions. So you should have a high grade of suspicion about that. You assess on your MRI, you go back to your MRI again, and sometimes this, they are called as hidden lesions because you are not uh, very well able to see on MRI also. But a few subtle signs uh, you can take, uh, like uh, contusion on post femoral tibia or ramp lesions, and all those signs uh, you see, uh, root you can very well see on MRI. I guess so now there is no objective criteria to define like the stress test you got for various bulges like laboratory criteria. But fever shift is still one thing which is more of a subjective whether it's a grade 2, grade 3 or grade 1. Yeah. But one thing is sure if you're getting the pivot shift and if patient is having associated ramp and root, you have to go for a, a repair of ramp and root. But issue is, if you've got a grade 2 and don't have a ramp and root, then what you should do? So for grade 3, my approach would be definitely I would like to add a LET. For grade 2, I will change my graph choice probably. Either I will go for a BTB or CQT rather than going for a hand. Jaktap sir, or Dr. Neil sir, anything you would like to add? I think <clears throat> if there is a positive pivot shift, what I would consider that uh, the knee is not stable. It is an unstable knee. Yeah. Because there are definitely few uh, patients with ACL injury who are stable, those who can call as the copers, those who cope well and they may not be having instability, even in spite of it's having a ACL injury. Ha, it is a compensated knee. Oh. So if there is instability and there is a pivot shift, then we are going for ACL reconstruction. Many times it may happen that in your clinical practice, you may not be able to elicit that pivot shift which you can easily elicit after anesthesia and sure. the spinal. Okay. So Please. then we have to be aware about that keyword shift, considering the type of injury and the symptoms of the patient. The very fact that patient is in the theater for surgery, pivot is positive. That is the reason he is in there. Yeah. Uh, so for the delegates, if a patient is having a positive pivot shift, it means it indicates a significant rotatory instability or something else other than the ACL means either it is a root tear, ramp lesion, bimeniscus injury or complete loss of uh, meniscus. So this is a one case scenario, a 32 years old young male had injured his knee because of twisting injury uh, while playing cricket on clinical examination, uh, like when positive, Macquarie is uh, positive with a click. Pivot shift positive, just uh, means dilemma in the clinic on in the office, but in the after anesthesia, it was frankly positive. So when I went inside the knee, the lateral meniscus was totally intact. This was the ACL, which was completely torn. Medial meniscus was also okay. So everything was looking okay on first locoscopy. So on the basis of clinical finding and on the basis of this first locoscopy, anything else you would like to add? Prashita? I would like to go into the postromedial compartment to check for the RAM because if pivot is positive, I will always yeah. suspect, which is not visible from portal. Yeah. So anything else you would like to add? Not all RAM can show unstable meniscus. So if you probe a meniscus, sometimes you might it might seem as though it's stable. Yeah. But still you need to go to the postural medial compartment. Yes. Yeah. So as Dr. Sital told, same thing done. I went in the postural medial compartment and done this needle test. So this large ramp lesion was visible, which was not very evident on the anterior scopy. So, 
uh, we have seen the various methods of repair. We have repaired this ramp with a single portal technique. It was uh, repaired with the ramp lasso. Four stitches were taken. And the knee was quite stable afterward. So my next question to the panelist is, how many of you do the repeat testing? Means after ACL or doing the ramp repair, do you ever uh, test the pivot shift again to check the stability, whether you have stabilized the knee? Dr. Jagdap, sir. Any of the panelists? After doing a meniscus rotation during the pivot, if I think it is risky, or you can it's risky. actually rupture. So your how rupture. how you decide whether this ramp repair alone is sufficient, or you would like to add a so I think It's more of a pre-operative decision. So pre-operative, it was a grade two a ramp would be a happy ending for me. But if it's a grade three, definitely I would like to add LED, particularly with the sports person. Despite of doing a ramp repair, I will add a LED. So there are enough uh, articles which supports me. So there are high percentage of cases where uh, ramp repair, ramp lesion is uh, there in almost many studies, which has told almost 12 to 18 in up to 20% of the chronic ACL, they're having the ramp lesions. So we should always go in the postomedial compartment. We do, we, we should routinely do the needle test to uh, look whether the ramp lesion is there or not. Even in the acute cases, we should go in the postomedial compartment and look for it. And this, uh, this presence of ramp lesion is responsible for significant pivot test in many of the cases. So uh, this is the second case scenario. This is a 34 years old male. He's a act uh, very active uh, uh, person. He plays football, basketball, everything. He has sustained injury one year old back. Leg pain was positive, anterior draw positive, pivot shift positive. But the condition, what he put, he, doc, I want to resume my work after six weeks at the max six weeks i can take rest from my work so these are his mri findings mri images uh, middle uh, acl is torn completely anything else Okay. Anything anyone would like to add? Dr. Vikram, Dr. Jaktapta? To begin with, if at six weeks you are doing stairs, then something is wrong after ACL. Because for your ACL graft, the maximum stress on the ACL graft is when you are coming downstairs. And that is around 500 newtons. And all your fixation devices, they give you a, a holding force of around 500 newtons especially on the tibial side. So at six weeks, that is no, no for me. If you're doing it on a regular basis, once in a while, it's all right. Okay. So these are the findings. There was a complete ACL tear. Lateral meniscus was absolutely fine. Menis lateral meniscus root was fine. But he was having this kind of bucket handle meniscus tear. The quality of... The meniscus was also not good. And patient has placed a condition that he wants to resume his active duties. Means he can't take rest for more than six weeks. He'll, he'll have to start clear weight and everything after six weeks. So what kind of surgical plan will execute? Dr. Jaktap. I think uh, the patient cannot uh, compel us to, considering his uh, uh, findings, we will have to go ahead with the best possible options we can provide. Okay. Uh, ACL reconstruction and if uh, possible we can uh, think of uh, age is 35. Would you like to repair his meniscus? Uh, it is not He's a young person. Body. 
is a one year old injury isn't it yeah so it looks very difficult not repairable dr sheetal uh, the duration is not the criteria so yeah. still i would go ahead and at least take a chance to explain to the patient that because almost you see it's a zone 1 so zone 1 it's it's got a good potential yeah. uh, just the, the outer thing i can i will just trim it off and i will uh, repair the uh, rest of the things and i think 6 weeks is fine i mean 4 weeks you allow full weight bearing if yeah. you do a good inside out repair which is i feel relatively more stronger as compared to any other so i will allow a 4 weeks uh, full weight bearing even if this okay i agree with you i would repair it actually if you look at a bucket handle tear the bucket handle tear when you weight bear the meniscus is actually compressed to the periphery so that helps in healing so weight bearing is not a problem the only difference i would do is i would do a btb acl because he wants to go back to work early mm -hmm. okay and considering the quality of meniscus at a time there was some radial tears yeah that's fine some horizontal cleavage component also in the anterior yeah. horn still, still you will consider still i would repair it and with a chronicity of one year will still it is very likely that he had the acl tear first and after that he had many episodes of fever and one of those episodes he uh, Broke. did this meniscus you will allow your patient to climb stairs coming down means after a 6 weeks time yeah with btb with yeah. btb okay. yeah with btb sure sure so so i have but i was not courageous enough to repair that kind of meniscus with a criteria that i can allow my patient to uh, climb stairs and do everything after 6 weeks so i have done the partial meniscectomy and the acl reconstruction but as considering his active uh, lifestyle i added the lt so i have the techniques i described i have taken a sleeve of 7 cm passed it beneath the lateral collateral ligament and fixed it with the help of anchor so any one of you have done anything means uh, adding let was uh, uh, on table decision because that meniscus was not repairable considering that is a wise decision adding a let because, because a non pivot indication for lts are also there like a hyperlexity profile lexis in case of a sports person uh, and in such cases in which you have to go for a medial meniscectomy let should be added so to prevent the uh, re injury or re rupture of acl so adding let will re reduce the uh, reduce the chances of rupture any one of you have done the anything different okay because there is a uh, significant uh, data uh, in the literature that integrity of meniscus is uh, very important if the there is complete loss of medial meniscus then failure of acl are almost four to five times higher as compared to the intact meniscus so this is a case third case scenario is 38 years old young male he is a recreational football player he has sustained injury 7 years back on clinical examination lacman was positive thing drawer was positive macmurray was positive and definitely pivot shaft was positive type 2 grade 2 these are his mri images okay so there was a complete uh, acl tear there was a bucket handle meniscus tear these are the uh, coronal images you can see the lateral meniscus is not getting attached to the uh, this is attachment so probably there might be a, a lateral meniscus here so these are the intraoperative finding complete acl tear chronic medial meniscus tear rounded edges reduction was not possible it was not reducing to place this is the lateral meniscus root tear and so what should be done so obviously will all um, anybody would like to attempt the meniscus repair dr sunil yeah i would 
<laughs> okay. So considering this, see, this meniscus was not reducible at all. Edges mm -hmm. was rounded. I would still freshen it. And okay. I am a big outside end fan. Uh -huh. So I start my outside end. Uh -huh. I go all the way post medial. Uh -huh. And then I start putting my outside end stitches. Uh -huh. And then I would assess the how well the meniscus wants to sit. Uh -huh. okay. And if the meniscus is sitting all right for me with those stitches, then my final last two stitches would be all inside stitches. That's it. Okay. I think whatever remnant is there of meniscus, even if it you consider it's a graft, it's yeah. a kind of a transplant that you are doing. So even if there is a no vasculity, still it will act as a spacer. So still I would like to go ahead and do a repair. So if it's not reducible, what I will do if you do a pie crusting, yeah. there will be huge opening. Then you can reduce it very easily. You can take a traction stitch, reduce it, and uh, whatever is there is now. If nothing is uh, uh, left to repair, what I will do, I will consider. Make it a horizontal cleavage here, and I will uh, just make a circumferential compression stay. So something remains in the periphery, which acts as a some uh, um, uh, cushion effect, basically. That's all. Doctor Vikram, take a traction stitch and assess the lat uh, middle meniscus. On traction uh, stitch, it was not coming to the. I have taken a needle from the posterior middle corner, put a traction stitch. It was not reaching up to the even the posterior middle corner. If it's not reducing, then I would go for yeah. meniscus only. And then uh, lateral meniscus root repair. And this meniscus tear was there in his three years old MRI also. I have seen his three years old MRI. Okay. The same meniscus tear was there. <laughs> <laughs> then definitely I'll go for uh, meniscectomy. Right after. Dr. Ravi? Let's go with uh, meniscectomy, definitely, and then add a LTS. Yeah. Okay, definitely. So, considering the chronicity, considering the demand, considering the age. So, look at it. Then, even radiologically non healed meniscus actually gives clinically good results. So, you don't need radiological healing of a meniscus to give a good result. So, what I have done, I have uh, repaired the lateral meniscus root. With the with two fiber tapes, this was the lateral meniscus root repair, and uh, for this irreducible uh, chronic meniscus tear with such a bad periphery, I have. Done the passive meniscectomy, saving as much as uh, rim as possible. And at the end, I again I added the LET. So the question is, the, how much of you would have added a LET along with the this means after root repair, after this kind of thing? So do you feel the LET must have been added, or you will be happy with just doing the uh, re uh, this root repair and ACL reconstruction alone? Just after. Root repair and ACL return. That's all. He is a uh, active person, although 39, and a weekend uh, football player. He wished to continue his sport. I would, I would definitely go with LUT. I would yeah. add LUT. Okay. So. Dr. Vikram, he had uh, high grade pivot, and uh, you assess uh, scopically anterolateral opening if it's there, significant. Yeah. And then you add LUT. Any different view out of? I, I would just do the ACL with the meniscus. That's all. I will do the same because already there is a, some changes in the lateral compartment, in the medial compartment as well. So, if you done a route, I think that would be sufficient for preventing the pivot. Uh, adding the LED probably may increase the load onto the lateral compartment. Second, that there are some changes in the medial femoral condyle. So, that itself indicates that the knee is going into auto stabilization. So, probably it may happen that he may not require a. But okay. it depends on the lateral compartment was looking quite okay. There was okay. not much. Yeah, but the root has already been taken care of. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely there are uh, significant literature is available. Means whenever there is a by meniscus injury, root lesions, then adding a LT might uh, give a more stability to the knee. So the take home message from this discussion for the delegates is whenever. Whenever there is a pivot shift positive, you should think about something else other than the ACL. 
means the root lesion, stem lesion, rotator instability, or the bimeniscus injury, and they should be addressed accordingly. If the menisci and everything is fine, no ramp lesion, then you should consider adding the uh, lateral extraticular tenodesis. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, Brigitte, sir, for excellent case discussion. So next, we'll move on to a real life surgery by Dr. Pankaj Vyas, sir. For this uh, real life surgery, I'd like to call the moderators Vikram sir, Pritam Agrawal sir and Rohan sir. Dr. Vikram Sapre, sir. Dr. Rohan Bansal and Dr. Preetam Agrawal. Dr. Amit. Sir, you can moderate the session. afternoon, I'll be talking about quad tendon ACL reconstruction. This is a 24-year-old male with just no comorbidities on examination, latchman positive, pivot shift is positive. Uh, further management was discussed with the patient. Uh, I think I missed a slide. Twenty-four year old male, recreational athlete, sustained an injury to left knee while playing football. He intends to play football with the same vigor again. Uh, and the further management was discussed with the patient. Uh, we already discussed the graph harvest. We'll directly go into articular. This is the diagnostic round. Portion of AM bundle is intact. At this point, I consider about remnant preservation, but with a condition that if biology comes in the way of anatomy, anatomy wins. And I sacrifice the remaining tissue if it is uh, between. Whether the living tissue remains is the bonus. This is the posterior medial joint view. This is the meniscal capsular junction. Menisci looked okay. And there's a PL bundle cyclone. Now with the soft tissues inside, where do we decide our femoral tunnel? When I am not preserving remnants, I would like to proceed like this. Next few slides are of different patient where standard ACL reconstruction was done. Area of femoral footprint behind the resident ridge is clean. I palpate the posterior femoral wall and <clears throat> mark on the center of femoral footprint. I put femoral offset guide and drill the guide wire.
and drill with suitable reamer to the suitable depth. And aperture is clean for easy graph passage. And this is how a femoral tunnel uh, looks. But now back to this case. In our case, this is not possible. I would choose my uh, point as posterior as possible without damaging the remnants. If I feel cramped up for the space, I can always remove the remnants. Here is the endo drill. I take a depth gauge, measure, and now 9 mm reamer is passed up to the depth of 20 mm. 20, uh, mm. Now, aperture is cleaned with the guide wire in C2 to prevent the remaining uh, soft tissue. This is how the femoral tunnel looks. Now I'm searching for my tibial exit point, which is slightly posterior and lateral. But for that, I view the full notch for my orientation. This is slightly posterior and lateral. All jigs behave differently. I will not try to come out of the remnant. I will take my 9 mm reamer without breaching the soft tissue envelope. And then divide the inside with a shaver and clean the upper chair. Right angle artery is used as retractor to create an exit for graft. Now the relay switcher is passed. Femoral implant relay is difficult due to all the soft tissue between the aperture and in between. I am pulling out but still it is difficult to pass the implant because of all the soft tissue entanglement. But with difficulty I was able to pass and this is the graft inside the soft tissue envelope which looks right means it has some viability. Now I would like to uh, do the impingement testing for this. But as it is inside the envelope, it is difficult for it to impinge. So, oh, no impingement. Thank you very much.
Dr. Pankaj? Uh, I wanted uh, Amit here, sir. Yeah. Here. Oh. Uh, uh, as you told, uh, most of morbidity of the uh, parts tendon graft is very less. And uh, there is, is no to other grafts. Other grafts. Uh, uh, will you elaborate? I mean, uh, you also told that suspensory fixation and preparation of graft is difficult in comparison to uh, the hamstring grafts which stayed away. Will you elaborate uh, to our delegates uh, any tips and tricks to how do you prepare the graft? If you want to use a standard uh, fixed loop device, you have to tie it on the loop. And if you want to use a suspense uh, means adjustable loop, then you have to modify in, at the uh, level of preparation of your graph. Means you have to incorporate that adjustable loop inside that graph, which can cut through. Only one company makes a specific implant for this. I wouldn't uh, like to take the names here, but there is one company which makes a specific implant for cordyceps graph. Other you have to adapt with the graph and implant. They are not specifically meant for what is do, do you use any screws uh, on the femoral side? Femoral side, I don't use any screws. Okay, so it's only on the loop. Commonly, what you use is fixed loop. No, that is a, that was an adjustable loop from some other company. Okay, made for uh, yeah for security. For, yeah. Okay. So in your practice, how commonly you use quadriceps for primary ACL reconstruction? Primary ACL, uh, I think in sports person, I would use uh, CQT and uh, I think frequently, I won't say infrequently, I, I would say twice or thrice in a month, I do a quadriceps. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One, one more question. How much length on average do you get uh, for this graph? Not less than 60 and maximum is 80. Okay. Which I got. You take both the superficial and deep components? Yes. Both you take? Both. Okay. And then you close it uh, what uh, a time? Generally, we enter the, if you want to take both, you are greedy and you always enter the supravitellar pump. Yeah. And Once you are taking the both, then you enter? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Thank you, all our panelists. Thank you for a nice discussion. Uh, we are moving on to our next session for which I would like to invite the chairperson. May I invite Dr. Manish Raf, sir, Dr. Malin Shah, sir, and uh, Dr. Vinay Tantuve to chair the session for the next, which is going to be an interesting session on the meniscus repair. Dr. Vinay? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon everyone this is a session on meniscus repair and the first speaker would be for the meniscus repair all inside repair technique with cure stitch dr naved ahmed
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so this talk would be on uh, managing meniscus tears with a sure stitch. So it's basically a uh, product-based uh, talk. Uh, so uh, the sure stitch is a device for all inside uh, meniscus repair from a sure uh, from uh, Seronix, and uh, we all know that it's a very popular uh, way of uh, repairing the meniscus, the all inside meniscus repair. Uh, especially because you don't need any posterior safety incidents. Uh, there is no experienced assistant required and the rate of complications is less and it importantly saves time. So basically when you are in a multi-ligament kind of situation, you want time on your hands. So it's the best way to you know save time. Uh, there are multiple designs available like you have all suture uh, legits and peak legits. Uh, with which you can uh, you can use uh, your all inside devices. Uh, the short stitch is with the peak anchors. Uh, there are some challenges uh, like uh, the device might misfire or break inside. It is difficult in the tight compartments and there is uh, chances of injury to the meniscus and the cartilage scuffing and the costs are high. And there are some neurovascular complications noted, especially when you are addressing the lateral uh, root and the lateral posterior horn, and your trajectory is through the lateral portal. Uh, so things have been addressed. So uh, you should, the device should not be misfiring. It should be easy to adjust, and uh, it should be a seamless procedure. Uh, it should be maneuverable uh, inside the joint. And it should be ergonomic, so you should be able to handle it with uh, one hand because with the other hand you're holding your scope. And uh, the needle should be flexible, not very flexible, otherwise it would uh, not pierce the meniscus, but uh, flexible and uh, stiff at the same time. So uh, I was told to incorporate this So let's just see this animation Inside. for all of you who haven't been using the short stitch. Secure arthroscopic meniscal repair and deploy in three simple steps, pierce, turn, and fire. Adjust the needle step by rotating the depth control knob, depending on the meniscus thickness. Using the Seronix slide cannula, slide in the Seronix sure stitch up to the meniscus in the inverted position. Pierce the meniscus at the desired point until the depth control tube touches the meniscus. Now, before you deploy the first implant, by turning the safety knob from safe position zero to active position one. Advance the deployment knob using the thumb until an audible click to deploy the first implant, then release and allow it to spring back to its half position. To prepare for the second implant, retract the needle and position it at the next desired point until the depth control two touches the meniscus. Then turn the safety knob to active position two and advance the implant using the deployment knob until there's an audible click. Carefully retract the Seronix pure stitch from the operating field. Use the Seronix knot pusher to pull the suture tail with consistent tension until the desired approximation of meniscus is achieved. Then, cut the remaining suture tail. Use another Seronix sure stitch device if required for larger meniscus tears. The so, so Seronix makes, makes these uh, excellent animations and I, I saw everyone was glued to it. So now let me talk. So the sure stitch, it basically has three simple steps, pierce, turn and fire. So it's the needle is 17 gauge, uh, a very stiff needle for effortless piercing. And it has a built-in adjustable depth control sheath, which prevents over insertion, which you can adjust according to the, um, uh, the length of the meniscus. And then there is a safety knob, which you can turn. So do, till you don't turn that knob with the first position, the first implant is not going to fire. Then you have to uh, push it to the second position for the second implant to fire. So that's a very good safety feature on this implant. And you have an audible and visual confirmation, which ensures sequential implant selection. And then you fire with the deployment knob. So you get an audible click which ensures implant, implant deployment feedback also. And it is a very ergonomic design. I've been using it since about four years now, and I'm very happy with it. So what are the tear patterns uh, which we can address with a all-inside repair? So anything be behind this line can be addressed with all-inside devices. So let's look at this right knee. This has a bucket handle tear looking from the antero 
the lateral portal working from the anteromedial portal. So you can see a bucket handle and there is a small ramp region as well over there. It's actually a double bucket kind of thing. So you rasp the legion, uh, make biology uh, work for you. And what I do is I start in the middle and then I complete the front with the inside out sutures and then using an all inside device posteriorly. So don't shy away from changing your portal. So I'm not able to get a good trajectory on this. So I change my portal. So I uh, start seeing from the anteromedial and working from the anterolateral. And once you see, you can see that there's that small ramp region over there. So what I do is I try to take both the tears uh, and uh, pick them up in one single stitch. So that's you going through the second and then pass it. Now don't uh, be very aggressive with pulling this because what happens is if you pull it very aggressively, the meniscus lifts off and the you can uh, very well, you know, put a different, uh, put a uh, inferior uh, implant also. But what you can do is simply is you can again loosen the sutures with a probe and then do a very gentle pulling of the threads so that you get nice, compression without lifting off. So that is how you should be doing these. You should be very gentle with your meniscus repairs. And you can just cut it off with a ceronic suture cutter. And then the other tip is, suppose uh, you have to uh, you know, anatomically align the fragments. So for that, what you can do is, what this allows, it has a bend. So once, you pierce it, you can lift the meniscus, change the direction, and then fire it again. So I've just pierced the proximal part. I twist to whatever direction I want, and then I push it again. So that when I pull, I get an anatomical reduction of the meniscus. There, like that. Yeah. So another case, this is left knee. We're looking from the anterolateral portal, working through the anteromedial portal. So I do a pie crusting and I see that there is a radial tear on the medial meniscus somewhere uh, middle and posterior. So I do a pie crusting so that you see well. Then the most important thing is assessing the tear. It's very important. You need to know. So there's a small vertical element on the peripheral part as well. So I use this uh, nice uh, rasp from Ceronix, which can act as a probe also. And you freshen the edges as well as uh, assess the tear properly. And then I start with uh, inside out uh, suture configuration. So I first start from the periphery and then come to the uh, joint line. So that's my uh, two zero fiber wire. And that's my first suture. And then after every suture, you should be assessing your tear. How, is, how good is your repair? So then I take my next sure stitch device. And I try to see whether I'll be able to get to both the places where I want to pierce it. Because otherwise what happens is you pierce and then the second part you're not able to. So always make sure that you're able to pass through both the sides. Otherwise you need to change your trajectory. So that's uh, pierce, turn, fire. And I'm using the uh, step so that the tissue does not come back. I use it as a traction force, as a counter traction. So again, very gently, you need to pull the threads. You just want it to compress against each other and not overlap against each other. So be very, very gentle with your meniscus repairs. And all these uh, menisci, they have very friable tissue. So you might cut through. So be very, very gentle. Then again, after the second, you again reassess. And so about half of the meniscus is repaired. Half of, the, half of it is still pending. So then I use a scorpion. And I do a all inside repair with a scorpion. Be very, very gentle in pulling because that is the time you can cut through like, just like a cheesecake. And then you tie your knot very, very gently. And then again, reassess. So we are having a good meniscus, but the, uh, the internal part is still having a tear. So another all inside device piercing on both sides and gently compressing both the edges together. Very, very gently. So that is how you can repair radial tears. You can use, you should be versatile enough to use all the three types of repair uh, available. So uh, 
to end, just a comparison of all the uh, all inside devices available on the market. Uh, I believe everyone has their own pros and cons, but with the sure stitch, the cinching is easy. It does not need a technique. There is no misfiring of either implants and uh, the price is obviously on our side if you use a sure stitch. Thank you. Second talk would be on inside out meniscus repair technique video by Dr. Suman Nag. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me. So, uh, my talk is on inside out meniscus repair technique. So, indications are posterior horn tear, middle third tear, peripheral capsular tear, and bucket handle tears. Contraindications are uh, root tear, some of the anterior one third tear and the tear which are not amenable for repair, uh, those are severely degenerative tear and avascular tear. Advantages and pitfalls. Uh, this technique gives a, a versatility of placing sutures in different pattern. You can put at least 10 to 12 sutures in vertical, horizontal and oblique manner. The needle profile is very low, so iatrogenic damage to the meniscal tissue is very less. The implant cost is very less, but the pitfalls are uh, the neurovascular injury that is popliteal artery injury, common peroneum as saphenous nerve injury, and in few cases flexion contracture you may, might see. These are the instruments we use. Uh, it is a good idea to give a uh, safety incision and use a bent spoon retractor. These are the uh, few cannulas, zone specific cannulas, meniscus, diamond rasp, and needle and suture. Tips and pulse. So first you should debride your uh, fat pad around the portal side to easy passage of your instruments. Pike a string of AMCL to open the joint to look uh, your meniscus pro properly. <clears throat> and you can identify your gastroc uh, muscle by dorsiflexing and plantar flexion of foot to put your bent uh, spoon retractor just in front of the uh, gastroc. The attempt to place your cannula from uh, contralateral side gives a better trajectory and avoid your neurovascular chances of neurovascular injury. And tying suture in full extension or little flexion may avoid uh, flexion contraction and later on in middle side uh, specifically. In case of isolated repair, you may do a notch plasty or a few micro fractures in the notch. This is a picture depicting the safety incision, uh, how you put your bent cannula to retrieve uh, your needle. This basically deflects the needle towards the uh, outer side and your assistant may retrieve needle safely for not tying. This is how you put a uh, safety incision and use a uh, spoon, uh, bent spoon cannula. And you may pass all your sutures before putting a safety incision and later on you uh, uh, put an incision and retrieve all the sutures and put your, starting putting your knots. There's a video showing uh, how I do uh, inside out uh, suture, suturing technique. So first of all, you do a proper diagnostic arthroscopy to see the pattern of tear. Basically, this is a red red zone tear and should prepare a good vascular bed either using a meniscus rasp or a uh, shaver in uh, low suction mode to prepare a good vascular bed which will 
help uh, in healing of meniscus do proper uh, probing to see the meniscus tear pattern and reduction i have started putting my uh, first suture from anteriorly it's a vertical mattress suture on the superior surface the femoral surface of the meniscus pierce the meniscal meniscus tissue and after that you pierce the meniscus capsular junction your assistant should retrieve the needle from the safety incision and pull the needle and suture sequentially after pulling the suture little traction is needed to see how the reduction is in the similar fashion you you can put few more stitches on the superior surface almost 3 to 3 to 4 sutures after every suture you should probe it to see the reduction now you can see after putting superior sutures meniscus is little everted that is the inner surface is going upward and by probing you can judge how many more sutures are needed on superior inferior surface here uh, i need one more suture anteriorly because this is the high pressure zone i should repair till the as and as, as anterior as possible so one more suture is needed here so again the meniscal uh, piercing the meniscal tissue the vertical mattress fashion vertical mattress uh, gives a good compression at circumferential fibers so superior stitches should be on a vertical fashion after pulling all the sutures superior uh, sutures i have started putting my inferior sutures basically this will reduce the meniscus nicely after putting two or three inferior sutures here i have uh, taken a horizontal mattress suture to reduce the inferior surface of uh, meniscus so pulling the inferior sutures will reduce it nicely you can see how nicely it is reduced after pulling the suture you may need few more sutures on uh, posterior side that is uh, posterior horn here i have switched my cannula to the uh, opposite side to get a trajectory sometimes it is difficult you can put a all inside uh, suture also to avoid uh, struggle so i could put one more suture most posterior uh, almost at the posterior uh, side posterior root uh, of the meniscus so almost 11 or uh, 10 or 11 sutures i have given here and after putting the sutures again examine if you need few more sutures or it is sufficient almost 10 to 11 sutures meniscus is reduced nicely pull every time you have to pull and see if you need more sutures or not thank you so much thank you dr suman now i invite dr tanmay choudhury he will be speaking on radial tear methods for repair good afternoon everyone i think uh, everybody is dozing now <laughs> so let me be quick and fast so radial tears we all know the meniscus tears usually we can see in the posterior horn they mostly seen in the commonly more commonly in the elderly <coughs> with some arthritic changes they are mostly a degenerative uh, posterior root tears lateral meniscus radial tears what we 
see is mostly in the acute uh, uh, injury setup with uh, valgus injury within uh, almost associated with an acl tear so what's the basic bio biomechanics is uh, that perpendicular transection of the meniscal fibers leads to this uh, impairs the transmission of the hoop stresses ultimately leads to equivalent which is equivalent to total meniscectomy it's very important that radial tears are functionally equivalent to total meniscectomy we have to repair there's no other option to us so because it increases uh, increases the joint stresses and meniscal extrusion is already explained by the previous speakers and leads to arthritic changes chondral damages if, if unrepaired so in 2010 12 bathing kelly uh, mentioned that with less than 90% of involvement of the meniscus uh, in the uh, zone it usually doesn't affect the pressure magnitude but if there is more than 90% involvement of the meniscus it significantly rises in the peak pressures and so should be reduced and uh, repaired properly whether it's a medial or a lateral meniscus uh so and role of meniscus in arthritis prevention is well established need not to focus much on that so what are the challenges we see in uh, radial tear meniscus healing uh one is the radial tears involve avascular zones of the meniscus mostly uh functional equivalent to total meniscectomy it leads to increased uh, contact stresses and meniscal extrusion horizontal mattress configurations alone has chances of meniscal tissue cutouts on loadings and chronic radial tears with a retraction are in a challenge and healing is uh, at times delayed if it's uh, alone usually uh, if it's uh, without a, a ligament injury and we are not doing any kind of uh, augmentation in healing so let's deal one by one radial tears which involve the avascular zone but then uh, in 2000 2002 banois and baba westin almost uh, came to a conclusion that excellent results were there even in the avascular zone and in athletic active patients preservation of meniscal tissue wherever possible is regardless of the age regardless of the age is important so it should be done even in the young arthritic knee patients where we see uh, radial uh, posterior tears in the root near the root uh, we do repair along with an hto so uh, and it's functionally equivalent to total meniscectomy so meniscal repair has to be done this is again uh, pressing on the same thing i am uh, so various techniques available in the literature double hold horizontal mattress configuration cross suture tech tie grip sutures two tunnel techniques as uh, told by laprade which was uh, mm -hmm. which has been used uh, uh, while uh, world over and uh, a later innovation into it has been done by one company which has come with come with a specific root fix anchor then the cross tag and the hash tag technique hybrid two tunnel technique along with uh, inside out and all inside along with a uh, two tunnel technique the rebar suture this is the latest in 2020 which messi came up with which has given very good results and has prevented cutouts as well and another one was in cross tie grip so various configurations have been uh, mentioned in the literature horizontal mattress configuration inside out alone has chances of lot of suture cut out on cyclic loading and fails to decrease the contact pressure uh, pressures so all inside constructs constructs are better than the inside out configuration for specifically for a radial tear and complex kind of these configurations all inside would be better in cyclic loading than just doing a horizontal mattress configuration so this is kind of a posterior near root radial tear where with an anti grade device we initially do a horizontal mattress configuration and over and above that we can use an all inside device to either rebar it and prevent the suture cut out or you can uh, directly push in uh, through the capsule so you can uh, sit back on the capsule as well so we can put these stitches knots below the meniscus to prevent uh, if you are putting it uh, on the inner edge to avoid any kind of uh, irritation later on to the cartilage usually these kinds of knots whether put superiorly or inferiorly usually synovialize very well 
later on. So another uh, radial tear of the lateral meniscus where you have seen uh, an all inside kind of repair. Dr. Navedas and Dr. Brajesh had already uh, shown these kinds of videos earlier as well. In the chronic radial tears where there is a tear retraction, for such specific tears, you can, uh, this two, Labrad's two uh, transtibial te uh, tunnel technique is, has proven good results. It ties down the meniscus right to the uh, cartilage there. You have to uh, actually remove the cartilage and then make tunnels and make a cross bridge there. So the anatomic transtibial meniscus repair technique as described by Laprad is really good for the chronic kind of radial tears. So this is one kind of uh, case where uh, there was a radial tear in this patient as you can see. For this case we did a transtibial two tunnel technique. Over and above this, at the end of it, if you still feel you can add a vertical mattress configuration along with it with an all inside device. And remember, it's a cross link. The medial fragment goes to the lateral tunnel, and the lateral frag and the other fragment, outside fragment, comes in to the medial tunnel. So it uh, gives a compression force both towards it, uh, each other. The both the fragments come towards uh, near to each other, and they are also compressed down to the bone. And you can check at times you can chip off the inner margins once done. So all inside repair constructs are better than the inside head con configurations, specifically again for the radial meniscus tears, which has been proved again and again. And these all inside technique with a vertical suture configuration demonstrated lower displacement, higher load to failure, and greater stiffness compared with just the inside out technique. And anatomical transtibial repair techniques uh, are better for the chronic radial tears. So that's basically the take home. And rebar tech, which was given by Macy, it has proved this is specifically for those who are really worried of the horizontal matters configuration, which would cut out because at times the meniscus is fragile. So what you need to do, all do is just put a vertical configuration, uh, matters configuration there. And over and above that, you put the horizontal matters configuration with an all inside device or an inside out technique. So it pushes. The it doesn't allow the horizontal mattress to cut out, and at the same time, it pushes the entire meniscus back to the capsule there. So it is a very, very stable construct. So the basic the, this is the hybrid two tunnel technique where for again for the chronic uh, radial uh, tears where you have a gap between in, uh, and you cannot do in proper interposition. So what you can do is make a two tunnels or use in uh, root fix anchor and do a ripstop vertical mattress configuration along with these two tunnel technique or a, a suture anchor. And as far as the healing is slow and delayed, all we know about the meniscus is so what we can add is biological augmentations in form of either you can trephinate or you can do a synovial rasping, you can do marrow venting procedures, you can just do with an all, we can make some uh, in the uh, notch area. You can use PRPs, you can use stem build te uh, based techniques. So in uh, Blaparat came with this uh, systematic review level 4 in 2016, where he mentioned that radial repair techniques, all inside and inside out techs were considered. And they concluded that there was subjective patient improvement in short term with repair and results were very encouraging with maximum healing rates, even with or without an ACLR done together. The take home is for the medial meniscus, always use an all inside ripstop or a hybrid technique or a rebar technique. Or just in case you don't, yeah, there is a chronic tear, you're not able to interpose, you can use a two tunnel technique or a hybrid along with it. Mostly for the lateral meniscus, all inside ripstop or a rebar tech would do the purpose. Thank you.
Mm. Next talk would be on bucket handle meniscus tear techniques. Uh, Dr. Amit Hadole. Good afternoon, friends and seniors. Uh, today, I'll be talking upon the bucket handle meniscus. I'll be only elaborating on uh, video uh, technique surgical rather than going in theory. So, Brajesh has uh, excised the meniscus, I will try to save. <laughs> so, key to successful repair depends on three, these four criteria. The tissue quality, the meniscus should not be deformed or bulbous. And, and, and if it is a chronic tear reduction, uh, difficult one, we have to have patience in reducing it. There are various techniques we will be talking about. Then, stimulation of healing through shavers, trephination, and other biological process, and uh, finally, stable fixation. Coming to the steps, patient positioning, uh, uh, leg hanging, so that we can go to the corners posteromedially, and like directly coming to the MCL release. Now, this slide is important. Uh, I usually follow this magic point. It was uh, published by Dr. Bancha. So, uh, basically, uh, here surface marking is very important, otherwise we will miss that magic point. So, uh, adductor tubercle, yeah, so we have to mark the adductor tubercle and a straight line to the posterior tibial shaft, we have to mark and after marking the joint line, so this magic point is 1.2 centimeters above the joint line or it's 2.8 centimeters below the adductor tubercle so that in this area once we uh, uh, give a, through 18 gauze needle uh, the joint opens so and uh, it has to be given in uh, normally we release the mcl in uh, extension 20 degree uh, flexion and uh, external rotation of the foot so that what happens if we don't do proper uh, MCL release and we may end up with iatrogenic damage and insufficient repair. Now this slide is also important. We have to be patient in reducing the meniscus. Initially we will uh, see in videos, we have to do gentle probing, very important and slowly sustained uh, reduction will help. Normally the anterior part is usually bulbous. So that makes a difference. So, we have to push it slowly and after a uh, eye crusting it helps. And uh, in chronic, we have to release the scar and finally, uh, most importantly, inside out of uh, reduction suture, it helps a lot. Uh, preparation of bed is important through trephination. I use a uh, spinal needle uh, or uh, 1.2 mm uh, k wire and do uh, trephination, shaving, to stimulate another uh, notch plasty also I do. This is also important part. So, in inside out suture, usually uh, technique from upper surface, the anterior anteromedial portal usually is the viewing portal, so that from anterior lateral we can go and uh, put the stitches. 
uh, one more this slide is also important in chronic uh, periods i am using a horizontal and vertical pattern so that uh, the bulbous part it flattens and uh, the, it creates a mason allen suturing technique so that uh, our tear also the meniscus sits flatter and there is more surface contact rather than suture point contact and uh, finally uh, uh, i usually give posteromedial incision and uh, safety incision so that main idea is ki we have to protect the saphenous nerve and sutures should be tied on the capsule so posteromedial incision and once you are confident uh, we can uh, give a incision later and at that time also we have to identify the saphenous nerve at least you should be com uh, confident that you are tying over the capsule this slide also finally while tying the sutures i tie from anterior to posterior while passing we can uh, pass as we want but uh, while tying it creates a zip effect so that the uh, uh, meniscus closes comfortably and tight uh, sutures at inferior surface this is also important and uh, if you only gives uh, on superior surface uh, there are chances of floating of meniscus and flipping so uh, inferior surfaces the suturing is also important so this is one this is a uh, 21 year old male video is not running huh no yes one again but it sorry for inconvenience there is some ha yeah it's not link nahi ho raha wo aage ja raha hai is pe double click kare iske iske se kare so uh, as i said the anterior initially it, it looks like we should go and excise the meniscus the anterior part is usually was bulbous and uh, it was seeing to be degenerative sort of unprobing so initially first of all i did thorough preparation and preparation of bed and one more trick while uh, sometimes you are afraid that we will be eating away the meniscus with the by shaver so one trick is to close the suction and then and after that we can see this bleeding bed we have 
received. Now again, trying to reduce the meniscus. Gently sustained. Initially, it was not coming, so uh, I gave a reduction suture inside out. So uh, sub subsequently, vertical matrices. So after that, uh, we, now we can see he, uh, after applying the upper uh, sutures at the upper surface of the meniscus, it, it is floating up. So we can see the number of sutures from anterior to posterior, more 6 to 8 sutures were there. And in this case, uh, I uh, gave a posteromedial safety incision so that I can go more posteriorly and uh, we can avoid uh, use of all inside. And uh, in, on the inferior surface, I usually uh, I give a, uh, this is number two fiber wire, two is to one ratio I usually keep. If there are six sutures, so two or three I usually give on the inferior surface if, if on the superior. Now, after passage of this, you can see when we tighten the sutures, the meniscus sits in its place. Notch plus finally. Okay. And second case. In this, I have uh, uh, used a Mason Allen type. This was also initially thorough probing and planning. And once we give the reduction stitch in from inside out, in this case, I have uh, given horizontal matrices initially. And then and see horizontal matrices and then the vertical matrices also have start. Creating a masculine and effect so that the meniscus sits, sits nicely and there is more surface contact and helping in healing. Coming to the final picture. Like this giving second and third vertical matters. And the posterior part of the meniscus, it was fixed by uh, all inside, fast fixed 360 degrees. We have to be gentle, use probe to reduce its width. Now you can see the final picture. And after that, I place an inferior suture also, all inside suture, Mason Allen stitch, first, second, and third. And coming to the power point.
ಹಾಂ ಓಕೆ ಆಯಿತು ಹಾಗೆ ಹಾಗೆ so the key points for success as a good, good patient positioning and uh, good mcl release usually uh, i use the magic point it's quite comfortable initially was having this problem but uh, proper surface marking gives to the exact point hardly 5 mm error you have 5 to 10 and uh, preparation of bed is very important and combine inside out all inside repairs uh are to be done and mesalen and suturing technique which i say i stated in the second video so it increases the surface fixation rather than the suture point fixation uh take home message remember the magic point close the zip from anterior to posterior circumferential re uh, repair and stable fixation and uh, of course we have proper thank you thank you dr amit moving on to complex tears and horizontal cleavage tears dr pritam agarwal Uh, good afternoon everyone uh, i'll be speaking on uh, simple repair techniques for horizontal cleavage tear and complex tear so of the all meniscus tears the horizontal cleavage tear is almost 25% so we should repair it frequently uh, but historically the it is challenging to repair this tear because of their orientation and uh, its intrameniscal location and the involvement of the avascular zone 3 in horizontal cleavage tear so the choice of management that we have one is to clean and leave it alone the second option is to debride the superior inferior leaflet and the third is subtotal meniscectomy and the fourth option is the repair we should avoid doing this debridement or subtotal meniscectomy to prevent future arthritis so as per the evidence uh, this uh, repairs uh, has good patient reported outcome with around 11% of failure rate so i will be discussing few cases of uh, horizontal cleavage tear and uh, complex tear this first patient is a 38 year old male uh, complained with right knee clicking and locking and uh, on mri there was a horizontal cleavage tear in zone 1 2 and with a flap tear component at zone 3 of the lateral meniscus so on arthroscopy uh, we can see the flap component so first we have to excise this flap tear 
because it's in the avascular zone. So once we excise this flap here uh, and do the meniscus balancing, then we can clearly see the horizontal cleavage component. And to uh, for better healing, we should do rasping or uh, shaving of the both in, in, in inner margin of the superior and inferior leaflets. And the debridement should be done till the meniscocapsular junction. So with the all inside uh, suture passing device, uh, we start from the posterior side, then come to the anterior side. Uh, we pass a number two zero fiber wire suture and then uh, pass a sliding knot followed by a few arpages. Uh, sequential suturing is done from posterior to anterior with a five millimeter of increment. So the second case, a uh, 30 year old male with ACL tear with complex tear of the lateral meniscus. Here you can see in the MRI, there is a vertical component of the tear with a horizontal cleavage component. So first uh, we have to define the tear. Here we can see the longitudinal component of the tear in the uh, zone 1, 2 of the lateral meniscus, body and posterior on. So first I start from the posterior side, uh, I use a all inside device and uh, close that longitudinal component of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus in the femoral side. Then after that I take a second suture anterior to the popliteus uh, to close the gap of the longitudinal tear component and after this two femoral uh, side suturing then I use a tibial side all inside suturing to close the inferior surface of the meniscus tear. And then on the anterior side of the uh, body of the lateral meniscus tear I use inside out device to repair the longitudinal component and then I completed my ACL tear along with that. So this is a third case, uh, this is a complex radial tear of the lateral meniscus posterior horn with uh, gapping of the meniscus. So here I chose a trans tibial repair technique. Uh, I use uh, all inside device and pass number two suture, uh, one in the anterior part of the tear and on the posterior part and then I with a trans tibial drilling, I pass the suture and fix it with a button. So this is the final repair after the transtibial suturing. So next case, uh, this is an uh, ACL tear with horizontal cleavage tear of the medial meniscus. So the first, the flap component is excised and after that, uh, repair the horizontal cleavage component with circumferential compression stitch with multiple number 20 suture started from the posterior side so this is the first uh, circumferential stitch and then i did similarly uh, for the anterior side so total three sutures and then I completed the ACL reconstruction after that. So we should probe the meniscus after our suturing to see if is there any gap, then we can increase the number of our suture. This is the last case. Uh, this is a complex tear of the lateral meniscus uh, with a ACL tear. Here, uh, horizontal cleavage component and vertical component both were there. So I started anteriorly, first I used the inside out device and repaired the body of the lateral meniscus. Then for the posterior horizontal cleavage component, I used uh, all inside suture passing device and 
did a circumferential stitch. So the take home message is, uh, we should uh, try to repair the horizontal cleavage tear because of their better outcomes and this circumferential stitch, it allows uniform compression along the holes or superior inferior lift plates of the meniscus and it's a technically simple procedure and biomechanically the stronger construct as compared to all inside and inside out device for this type of tear and we should add biological augmentation either with a micro fracture or some other procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pritam. Uh, moving on to the last uh, lecture in this meniscectomy, is there any role in 2023? Because we are seeing all these uh, repair techniques are there for last 8 to 10 years. Before that, I feel all the cases were for, for meniscectomy. So still in 2023, is there any role for meniscectomy? Dr. Virendra will elaborate on this. Uh, very good afternoon to everybody. I, I would like to thank the organizing committee and Sir Nix for this opportunity. Uh, is there a role of meniscectomy in 2023? So after so much of uh, discussion on meniscus repairs, we would like to see whether meniscus meniscectomy is a choice in treatment of meniscus or is it a necessity? Of course, it is a choice in few cases uh, and it uh, becomes uh, a necessity in some cases. So uh, enough is being discussed about the function of the meniscus. Uh, most of the times it is the injury which decides the result. It is not uh, a very good surgeon or a very good implant. If the injury itself is so complex, depending on the location of the tear, tear pattern, the blood supply, all of it would be the deciding factor for the healing of the meniscus. So various uh, meniscus patterns. So we have moved on from initially removing the complete meniscectomy. Uh, then understanding the radiological changes after meniscectomy and now we want to save as much of meniscus as possible. So there is enough literature uh, to support that whatever the meniscus which is there even if it is peripheral from the central uh, zone of blood supply we should try and preserve as much of meniscus as possible. A loss of hook tension is equivalent to a total meniscectomy. So total meniscectomy should be a strict no-no. You should try to preserve as much of meniscus as possible. So uh, does, does meniscectomy affect the stability of the ACL? Uh, there is a cadaveric study which, su which supports that it is a root tear which, which increases the instability uh, compared to a partial meniscectomy uh, or a subtotal meniscectomy. If you compare the um, medial versus lateral, the lateral meniscus appears to be a significant restraint in valgus and rotator instability. So consider always repairing a lateral meniscus subtotal meniscectomy, medial meniscectomy can always be uh, done by a choice if you are expecting an early return to sports. In spite of all of this, meniscectomy remains a widely practiced uh, procedure. So we are supposed to understand what are the indications. So one is a degenerative tear, irreparable tear, many times it is an intraoperative decision, flap tear, a peripheral tear, peripheral in relation to the blood supply. Discoid meniscus is a choice you, you, you always uh, go and plan it and do it off and uh, re-tears after meniscus uh, repairs. These are the uh, common indications for meniscectomy. Always consider the factors of age, location, chronicity for the BM of the patient. Coming to the degenerative tear. Many times, degenerative tear, uh, it is an incidental finding in middle-aged or elderly patients. Usually, uh, uh, it is not necessary that you do a MRI when a patient of middle-aged uh, patient comes to you with a, a knee pain. You find an incidental meniscus tear and decide to do a meniscectomy. So, this has to be avoided. There is uh, enough uh, literature 
which supports that uh, non operative treatment is the first choice for a uh, degenerative tear if the patient doesn't respond with non non operative treatment or if you feel that the mechanical symptoms are so significant that he should be benefited then only you go early in very times in this elderly patients it is the mechanical alignment which is the reason for the pain uh, rather than uh, the meniscus tear itself it is it is almost similar to a degenerative disc where the mechanical symptoms are usually because of the alignment of the uh, spine rather than the disc itself so we should be very cautious in putting a scope in in a degenerative tear irreparable tear uh, we have seen so many complex uh, uh, meniscus repairs being done in spite of uh, a highly skilled surgeon with no bar on using the implants you will always find an intraoperative case where you will not be able to repair so they are there it becomes a necessity you will have to uh, do a little bit of uh, meniscectomy flap tear you can see a hidden flap tear sometimes when you probe you can see a small flap coming out this this would definitely require a debridement there is there is no choice here you'll have to uh, do a debridement of the meniscus now uh, re tear after meniscus uh, repairs uh, there is there is an incidence of at least about 19% of re tear according to the literature it is usually found in the second post operative year so if 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 you go in again you can always try to do a repair but there are high chances that you might end up uh, doing a meniscectomy the volume of the meniscus which is removed in the first surgery or after a re tear of a meniscus repair would not significantly change so it's always worth doing a repair and keep meniscectomy as a second choice in discoid meniscus uh, it is it is a properly planned procedure you do a uh, partial meniscectomy you try to keep as much rim of the meniscus as possible this is pretty a, a, a simple and standard procedure we'll go to the next slide we are running short of time so if you look at the uh, uh, short term results of uh, meniscectomy compared to the long term short term usually you find a benefit for the patient first two years patient is symptomatically better it is only the long term results which are really concerned so you consider the age of the patient and then offer if it is an elite athlete and if he wants to return to the sports early a uh, hyperselective very selective meniscectomy medial meniscectomy would definitely be uh, useful for the patient but if it is the lateral meniscus always try and do a meniscus repair in conclusion uh, meniscus meniscectomy uh, still is an uh, choice you preserve as much of meniscus as possible resect all the mobile fragments keep the remaining tissue uh, to create a stable meniscal rim and uh, as far as degenerative tears is there you always keep a non operative treatment as a treatment of choice first and be very careful when you do a meniscus meniscectomy about the condral injury which could lead to an uh, arthritis thank you thank you very much Thanks uh, all the chairperson for moderating this session. I request uh, Dr. Vinay Tantuve to felicitate uh, Dr. Manish Rao. We will have a panel discussion after we have got. Uh, we will take one or two more lectures because there is again a flight induced tachycardia which is going on the hall. So for the next session, may I request Dr. Anshu Shekhar, Dr. Abhishek Gatke, and uh, Dr. Achish Dubey to not only to chair the session, but they have to do a panel uh, to act as a panelist for the meniscus session. So, Ashish. So first, we will do two talks. Of uh, one talk is the PCL anatomy by Dr. Sai Chandra, which would be followed by a talk on the clinical evaluation by Dr. Chandra Krishna, and then we will move on to panel discussion.
very good afternoon and uh, i hope those who are present are awake you can go catch a cup of coffee if you want uh, we have dr sai chandra who will uh, be giving one talk on pcl and followed by that uh, dr chandra krishna who also has a flight to catch will be talking on clinical evaluation and biomechanics of collaterals and corners so dr sai chandra please who will talk on pcl anatomy biomechanics and role of conservative management yeah first of all i would like to thank uh, organizing committee and uh, sunil ap singh sir for giving me opportunity so uh, i'm talking about pcl anatomy and uh, biomechanics and uh, how do we examine so majority of my talk is taken from uh, sir's article itself and uh, an article by dr labret so we all know pcl uh, the length is 38 mm diameter 13 it's larger than acl centro articular and uh, extra synovial so it has got two bundles al and pm bundle al is stronger bundle and uh, we know its function basically it resists posterior tibial translation uh, coming to the anatomy part so we have uh, trochlear point medial arch point and uh, posterior point described by dr laprade so in this picture itself we can see uh, the al bundle is uh, more vertical when compared to the pm bundle so basically al bundle is more vertical and more anterior on the femur so that is the reason uh, the name al so uh, this is one diagram depicting uh, the trochlear point so here we can see uh, there is a abrupt deviation at the superior uh, edge of the trochlea or the medial uh, cartilage medial arch of the cartilage so that is a trochlear point if you come down at one point it goes vertically that point is mentioned as medial arch point and that extension uh, the point where it goes still posteriorly that is mentioned as a posterior point so al bundle occupies the area from the trochlear point to the medial arch point so this is one slide showing uh, its anatomy on the tibia the al bundle is more medial and anterior so in this diagram this uh, study is done by sunil ap singh sir uh, tell uh, tells there is uh, uh, they compared around 20 studies uh, where uh, still uh, standardization of the footprint of the pcl over the femur is still needed so oh, this is another depict diagram telling the same uh, about the same trochlear point and the medial arch point and the so 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 in this diagram um, we are depicting the tibial footprint uh, where uh, i think this diagram is more clear where we can see the champagne glass uh, drop off sign where we can see and uh, the bundle ridge between the anterolateral bundle and the posteromedial bundle so on the shiny white fibers of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus so coming to the function al bundle is a dominant restraint uh, for posterior tibial translation during uh, mid flexion that is 90 degrees and uh, pm bundle during extension and deflexion so coming to the menisco femoral ligaments we know the uh, anterior is the humphrey and uh, the posterior is the ligament of risberg so most common mechanism of injury is uh, posteriorly directed force uh or either a dashboard injury or uh, falling on a flexed knee so multi ligament uh, knee injury uh, involving pcl is more common than isolated pcl injury we all know regarding the grades of tears grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 1 to 5 6 to 10 mm more than 10 mm So this is the posterior drawer test.
So this is the water subsactive test. So if there is a PCL tear, uh, if we ask the patient to actively extend the knee, the tibia comes anterior. So this is the dial test where we do at 30 degree and 90 degree. If there is more than 10 degrees of uh, external rotation in 30 degree, it is the PC, PLC involvement. If it is in both 30 degrees and 90 degrees, then it is PCL involvement as well. So, coming to the treatment aspect. So, isolated uh, PCL tear, grade 1 PCL tear is treated conservatively. Uh, grade 3 PCL tears uh, associated with instability uh, is treated uh, with PCL reconstruction. So, grade 2 PCL tears associated with any other ligament injuries or uh, if there is involvement of PLC, then we are, uh, then we based on the intraop finding whether we do, we have to do surgery or not that what we decide so thanks for giving me this opportunity thank you dr sai chandra come quickly air hostess is waiting Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I would like to thank you, Cyrenix India, for giving me this opportunity and the organizing committee. Uh, I'll be talking on the clinical evaluation and biomechanics of both the collaterals and corners, which is a very vast topic and the complex topics of the knee. And till now, everyone had dealt about the intraarticular structures of the knee, but I am going little out of the knee. Just bear with me. So, is Dr. Laprad, without mentioning his name, the topic of collaterals and corners are incomplete. I'll have a brief discussion on the anatomy first of the medial side of the knee, which is a very brief. And the medial collateral ligament injuries are which are common on the medial side and which has a very good potential for a healing. And there are some anatomic references. Uh, and the main part, the anatomy of the medial part of the knee, which was uh, published in 2007 by Laprad, has given a details of anatomy and it uh, biomechanics and about the reconstruction of the collaterals and corners of the knee. Coming to the basic anatomy of the medial side, it is divided into uh, anterior one third, middle one third, and a posterior one third. We know that anterior one third has a MPFL and middle one third as a superficial MCL and deep MCL and the posterior one third has a posterior oblique ligament. And coming to the mechanism of injuries, usually uh, force on the lateral aspect of the leg or a lower thigh, which is seen in the soccer players. And there are non-contact injuries from an external rotation stress, like as a uh, in basketball players cutting and pivoting activities. And most commonly, we see uh, uh, femoral avulsions at the peel of lesions and which tend to heal uh, by conservative methods. And coming to the major topic, which is a, a physical examination of the medial side of the knee, always we should compare the normal knee before going to the abnormal knee. And we should check for the point tenderness. And the most important gold standard test for the medial side abnormality is the valgus stress at 30 degrees is the gold standard test for the medial side of the knee. And this is the Laprad uh, uh, examining the uh, knee uh, where the 
and you can show uh, we can see in the video that the laprad holds one hand and fingers on the joint line so that we can see the opening we can uh, feel the opening on the medial joint line and also the other hand what he uh, describes is here you have to hold the other hand on the uh, foot rather than on the lower part of the leg and is it's another test which uh, is a, a slocum uh, test which is almost a modified of an anterior draw test which we uh, which is performed in a valgus press in 15 degrees external rotation and 80 degrees of flexion where there is a prominence of medial tibial condyle is a positive test which gives a, 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 a disruption of the deep mcl allows the meniscus to move freely and allows the medial tibial plateau to rotate anteriorly and and we examine the gait so many patients with a grade 3 injuries can walk unaided and have a minimal pain only some part of a uh, incomplete tears have a uh, pain rather than a complete tear patient and this is the most important uh, part in evaluation which is also described by the laprad and the stress x rays which are very important prior uh, 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 taking a patient into the OR or on an operation theater where you always uh, examine on the contralateral side and see the side to side difference of on the medial opening on the normal side on the as well on the abnormal side. Coming to the other imaging modalities that is the MRI which is also a uh, gold standard in an acute knees where we cannot uh, uh, do a clinical examination as it is a very painful. And in the MRI, we uh, correctly delineate where whether the uh, lesion is a proximal mid portion or a distal portion and a deep or a superficial uh, ligaments are disrupted. And also MRI tells us about the other concomitant meniscal repairs or a root tears, etc. And uh, coming to the biomechanics, majorly the medial side uh, stability is maintained by the static and the dynamic forces and the static being the superficial MCL, deep MCL and the posterior oblique ligament and the dynamic being the various structures like pest tendons, semimembranosis and the vastus medialis also adds to it. And uh, the as we know the superficial MCL is a fan shaped structure which the posterior fibers are the tense in extension and the anterior fibers are uh, tense in flexion. And there is a study uh, which uh, shows that at 25 to 30 degrees of flexion the superficial MCL provides 80% of restraint to the valgus and at 5 degrees there was contribution is minimal. As the knee extends, the posterior oblique ligament is tightened and providing increased restraint to the valgus press. And these are the studies where the load to failure is more with the superficial MCL followed by the posterior oblique ligament, uh, superficial MCL followed by the uh, posterior oblique ligament and followed by the deep MCL. And there are a control of valgus on a flexion extension and uh, flexion extension and uh, on the rotations and these are the uh, control of internal rotation uh, the superficial mcl is more important with the flexion whereas a post oblique ligament an important restraint in the extension and this is a uh, control of a tibial rotation external rotation where superficial mcl is important throughout the flexion uh, and deep mcl is important in the flexion and summary onto the medial side, uh, the superficial MCL is the primary restraint to the valgus at 30 degrees and deep MCL is important restraint to the external rotation and posterior oblique which is important restraint to the valgus in the extended knee. And uh, uh, I'm not going into the treatment part where later on Dr. Anshu Sekar and Navet sir will extensively describe about the reconstructions of the medial and lateral side of the uh, knee and I'm going to the lateral side of the knee. Uh, before uh, going to the lateral side, like uh, as I said, medial side injuries heal well because uh, articulation is a uh, convex on concave and the lateral side, they do not heal well because the convex lateral femoral condyle articulates with the convex lateral tibial plateau so that there is a convex on convex articulation which are inherently unstable, hence they do not heal properly. And these lateral side injuries are also associated with a lot of concomitant injuries like a 
uh, ACL or a neglected PCL. So these, uh, as I said, 72% of the uh, postolateral uh, corner injuries missed at initial presentation because they are associated with the multiple ligament injuries and only 50% of the PCLs, PLCs were uh, diagnosed correctly at the time of referral to the specialist. And this is a brief uh, anatomy of a, a lateral side where you have a three main structures that is a fibula collateral ligament, popliteus and popliteofibular ligament. And the other supporting restraints to the uh, lateral side are ITB, biceps femoris and we have a PCL lateral meniscus and a fibulofibular ligament. And coming to the biomechanics, uh, structures of the PLC uh, uh, including the LCL, they function to resist the varus opening mainly and external tibial rotation and PLC excluding the LCL is the primary stabilizer of the external rotation and there are the various mechanism of injuries where the posterolaterally directed blow to the anteromedial aspect of the proximal tibia with a resultant hyperextension of the link and these are the dashboard injuries where PCL is also involved and the non-committent sports like a skiing injuries and they usually present with a failed ACL or a PCL because of underdiagnosed to PLC and the chronic PLC injuries uh, with a various uh, malalignment, osseous malalignment. Coming to the physical examination as, uh, as same to the uh, medial side also, the complete knee examination is important exclusively here. We have to check for a vascular because lateral side common peroneal nerve is involved most of the times and uh, a gait assessment is important where they present with a varus thirst grade like this whenever the patient on a stance phase there is a lateral side opening on the uh, lateral side and, uh, and the knee goes into hyper extension where they present as a varus thirst gait. And uh, uh, this is how uh, the leprad examining the uh, varus stress test usually performed at zero to uh, zero degrees yeah. to 30 degrees. And one more test, more important test as, uh, as uh, Dr. Sai also mentioned about this dial test where uh, examining in a 30 degrees and a zero degrees can be examined in a prone and a supine position also. And uh, dial test at 30 degrees, which indicates the isolated PLC postrolateral corner injury and at 90 degrees, which indicates the postrolateral corner and a postro uh, PCL. And the dial test, there is a, uh, there is a uh, significance that whether dial test is significant of, uh, for a postrolateral corner or a MCL or a medial, uh, medial side uh, the, uh, for a rotational instabilities. They say that injury to the medial or a posterolateral structure can also provide an external rotation movements, but movement of the tibial plateau which distinguishes between the medial side rotatory instability or a lateral side rotatory instability. This is another test for the uh, uh, posterolateral corner which is a reverse, reverse pivot shift and another, these are all uh, special tests, um, external rotation and recover, uh, recover item test and these are also a uh, frog leg test. And another most important is a varus stress X-ray, which we have uh, Laprad has stressed on it, which indicates the uh, 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 side to side variation, which is about uh, 2.7 to 4 mm, which indicates a complete uh, lateral collateral ligament tear. And if it is a more than uh, 4 mm uh, say, uh, difference, there is a uh, postural lateral uh, combined with a PCL tear. And if it is more than 6.6 .6 mm, which indicate uh, associated with a single cruciate, and if it is beyond 8 mm. It's a bicruciate injury. And this is a comparison on the medial side, on the lateral Dr. side. Chandra, wrap up. Uh -huh. uh, two slides. And uh, uh, scanograms are very important uh, for uh, uh, checking the alignment because these are neglected injuries. And uh, the, as noted, MRI uh, also uh, associated with a uh, physical examination is very important. And some MRIs, uh, even though we cannot see a minor uh, slices of the MRIs, bone bruises also indicate the postrolateral corner injury. And coming to the later, uh, summary of the lateral side, evaluation of PLC uh, comprises of high degree of suspicion and clinical uh, examination and stress x-rays are important and scanograms and bone bruises. And finally, the take home, knowing the uh, anatomical landmarks is very important and clinical evaluation for the confirmation of the injuries because these are most commonly missed injuries and Stress views when needed and scanograms are mandatory when neglected injuries and MRI when uh, available, uh, dynamic MRI is preferred and early diagnosis prevents the delayed presentation and uh, keep it in mind, these are all not keyhole uh, surgeries like uh, uh, what all are routine arthroscopy surgeries, 
do. These are not uh, keyhole surgeries, these are extensive surgeries. And thank you, Sirenix, for giving me this uh, opportunity. Thank you, Chandra. So we will have a quick, quick question and answer session by our panelists. And uh, uh, for moderating, we have already got our three uh, faculties over there. So I would request uh, for the meniscus panel discussion to all the speakers of the meniscus session to come on the front. Dr. Suman Nag, Dr. Nave, Dr. Tanmay Chaudhary, Tanmay is here. Dr. Pritam Agrawal and Dr. Virendra. So I will request my moderators to precisely politely and modestly roast our faculties with some good questions. We need a mic there. Yeah, Navit sir, the first question is for you. Can you just guide us what needs to be done if there is a accidental uh, implant uh, misfire inside the joint so can you please elaborate exactly like which, uh, you are using an all inside tube the first one or the second one yeah it depends yeah if a, a first one is there it's easy but if if second one is there then what what thing you need to be done if the second misfires yeah yeah second so, anchor misfires so then the uh, first one has gone inside and the second yeah, one you unstruck the first second one, one is, is, yeah first one is deployed accurately but second one misfires so misfires as in it comes, comes out. out yeah so comes. then you are left with no option but to just amputate it and then try with another so one. any tips and tricks just to uh, how to make a tunnel how to do an entry to avoid this misfire so uh, see it's technique based Every implant, you should know your implant in and out. Now with this, uh, the short stitch, the, the implant won't fire till you put the safety knob to the second position. So that is one good thing about this. Even if you inadvertently push the deployment knob, it is not going to go ahead till the safety knob is on the second position. So that is one good thing. So if you want to start all inside uh, with all inside devices, that this is the best device to start with. Couple of times I it happened with me in a show stitch at the black button broken up. Did you? Did you? It didn't fire and broken up because it, of the it, needle it got. Okay, it broke. So you are a very strong person. You should handle it gently. And <laughs> the second thing is you should ask Seronix to give you another one. <laughs> Next question, Doctor Amit. Uh, uh, do you use some sort of augmentation for your? Meniscal repair in chronic cases, some sort of augmentation such as fibrin clot or something. Uh, uh, I, uh, in fact, in ninety percent of cases, if, if we uh, our uh, rationing of the edges and uh, trephination and uh, stimulation with diamond rasp and uh, notch plasty, it gives eighty-five to ninety percent of uh, the healing potential, biological healing by progenitor cells. Uh, so I usually, in my personal, I don't use fibrin clot. People do use uh, PRPs. I don't use so it, because nine, it will add more ten percent, maybe. But in ninety percent, practically in cases, I'm doing all these procedures for to enhance biological healing. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Viru sir. Uh, you talk of meniscectomy in DLMs, discoid lateral menisci. So, in what kind of a discoid lateral meniscus tear would you go ahead and do a meniscectomy and not repair it? See, in discoid meniscus, the presentation, if it is an incidental finding, I would not touch. Only, only if there is a tear and the tear is more on the central side on the body. If it is a peripheral tear, I would do a partial meniscectomy and then do a repair for the rest of the meniscus. So, uh, the typical unstable capsular avulsions, you would not do a meniscectomy? No, you would repair no. Them. We, we would try to only within the body. Only within the body. Rest of the thing, after doing meniscectomy, I would like to still repair the rest of the meniscus. We should always try to keep as much rim as possible. Uh, if it is asymptomatic, probably nothing to do. If there are any questions from the house, we can take at the same time regarding the meniscus repair. If there are any questions, you can come on the mic and just ask the question to the faculty. My question to Dr. Pritam, uh, horizontal previous tear, if you see in your practice, suppose there is a superior leaf which is thin and inferior leaf which is thicker, still you will go ahead and do a compression stitch or you will 
uh, excise the superior relief and what is the advantage of excising that superior relief if you can give a compression very well? Well, I will still uh, do a repair because uh, when we are doing the repair, the thickness of the meniscus were increasing. So biomechanically, it's better. Absolutely. So this is the point, like even the superior leaf is very thin or flimsy, still you can go ahead and do a compression because anyway, it's going to increase the volume of the substance of the meniscus. So when, uh, inside out technique, if you're talking about the medial side, you will give a posteromedial incision and a safety incision. Yeah. What about the lateral side? You give the similar incision, how do lateral you protect side, the you can give similar, similar incision and uh, we have to give it just posted to the um, LCL and uh, identify your uh, gastroc belly and put your uh, bend spoon retractor. So, if you talk about the posture of the meniscus, so it's still very safe. I mean, you can put your spoon. Yeah. Now, talking about the posture of the lateral meniscus, still you will go with the inside no, out no, or you will change it? No. I'll go for uh, all inside. All inside. Yeah. So, so for lateral meniscus, posterior it's horn, yeah. inside out is not a safe option, but it is a safer onto the medial side. Medial side. Um, uh, just a question for you, will you define some duration when we should matlab, do it? Let us say ki a tear is in a red zone, but it is of long duration. Would you prefer going for a repair? Will you red try red it? Zone, red zone will go for repair. Any time. It's not like ki six if weeks, eight weeks, two weeks. Yeah. If it is reducible, uh, it should go for repair. No question to Tanmay. Uh, Sir, will tear when you are going to treat it as a root tear and you will do a transosseous fixation? And then will you consider a standard radial repair, either an inside out or all inside technique? Transosseous, I will consider only for mostly for medial meniscus, not for the lateral. Lateral, I'll always go with a, uh, either a rebar or a uh, regular horizontal and vertical configuration, all inside. Lateral meniscus, always, always on all inside. Or inside out, if it is a mid third tear, we can go with a in, uh, inside out rebar technique. Uh, for a mid third lateral meniscus, meniscus not for posterior. So when we are on the topic of rebar repairs, so what I intended to ask you was, you would put in the rebar sutures and then do your horizontal mattress. Exactly. Correct. Yes. And not the other way around. Yes, exactly. Yes. That is what put the vertical mattress. Exactly. And over and above that vertical mattress, we have to put so that we actually we have to prevent the horizontal mattresses to cut out tearing through. To prevent the cut out, we are doing this. Correct. And we so have one question from the. You seem to have a faculty which is very heavy on inside out and all inside. What about outside it? And the third always outside in. There's no other way out. So I prefer outside in only specifically when it is a anterior third. So I go almost up to posterior third on the medial side. On medial side, definitely you can go. Definitely, it's pretty straightforward. You can do it with a small incision. And uh, so many if you're doing the inside out and you're tying up the knot. So what is first sequence of tying from posterior to anterior? And what is the angle of your uh, flexion angle of your knee while you're tying? Maybe uh, 10 to 20 degree flexion or full extension to little flexion. Okay. And uh, what about sequence? You will tie posterior to anterior or anterior to posterior? Anterior to posterior. Anterior to posterior. And uh, Amit, uh, regarding your Mason-Allen technique, what you've shown, do you feel it may lead to some kind of a, a constraint of the capsule or a Stiffness post op have you observed it or it's I usually uh, do it in uh, chronic tears so that uh, the bulbous or deformed uh, meniscus sits nicely. Otherwise, I do the vertical mattresses and on uh, uh, in inferior surface the horizontal mattresses. Are. And now, with you shown the technique in which you are, yeah, please. I'll just add to that. It's always advisable to when you are tying, we should see the meniscus. Yeah. You should always quickly and then keep on absolutely tying. because otherwise meniscal will meniscal will float. So the technique that you were showing that you have put the this thing on superior surface and there was a lifting of the inferior surface. Normal recommendation is you always go ahead and put a inferior. So would you go ahead with a horizontal mattress which doesn't lead to the lifting of that meniscus yes. or the same technique that you have shown while you are doing a vertical just press it with the probe. So I I still go on the superior surface and in this case it was very important because there was a posterior ramp lesion as well which I wanted to address in the same suture. But otherwise, and if I had a lift off, then I would definitely go in inferior. So mine is like superior, inferior, superior, inferior like that. I go alternating. Uh, any indication of meniscectomy in a very young patient, Dr. I mean, patient's age is less than twenty. 
So still in, uh, in any of the case, you will consider it uh, a suitable candidate for Minister Tommy. In one paper that you shown, there is only one paper in 2003 by uh, this uh, yeah, uh, said Tommy should be very uh, selective in the for media, the media in the medial side, but still we need a level one study to prove it. Yes, yes. So what is your opinion, particularly for young patient? You can go ahead and do a medial minister Tommy, particularly for a sports person. For a sports person, I would try and counsel the patient that it is very important that we preserve it. Only if he's looking at a very early return to sport, and if it is really important, we, we can still be selective in resecting the uh, peripheral uh, meniscus. So preserving the peripheral explaining the patient that it is going to uh, have uh, arthritic changes, arthrosis maybe about seven to eight years. Patient asks you how many, how much time it's going to take me to develop arthritis because it's a very short term. I mean the sports career is really yeah, short. So, so, so you want to preserve or you want to excise, it will depend on the, on the age of the patient rather than a sports career of the patient. Yeah, if you are looking at the uh, professional age, probably he would be playing for up to 30, 35. By the time he develops arthrosis, it is it is roughly about 40, 45 plus. So definitely return to sports is a priority for him. I would I would uh, still prefer doing a partial meniscectomy and uh, uh, put him back to his sports. Yeah, please. Uh, if there is a patient with an ACL tear and a uh, say medial meniscus tear, and to begin with, it's a very basic question: How would you place your portals, anterolateral and anteromedial? Because they play a very important role while we are passing the uh, suture and repair. So, if you can just uh, guide, like Tanmay sir or Doctor. See, my general portals are depending on what exactly I'm looking at. Once we do a scopy, then we really um, my anterolateral portal is usually if it's an I know it's an ACL tear, it would be in a high a AL portal. ACL plus meniscus. Yes, ACL plus meniscus would be a high AL portal because that gives yeah. me a bird's eye view. And uh, that would be a vertical high AL portal. And what I do is I uh, make a horizontal low AM portal. So that it gives me both ways uh, access. Right? Access. And you'll just be zones. going adjacent to the patella or, or a bit far off, like anterior lateral. Near to the anterior lateral. Yeah. Anterior lateral would be right near to the uh, uh, ligamentum patella. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We should. So going to the last question of this. Uh, you have shown uh, very beautifully a case of all inside technique uh, for repairing the bucket handle tears, which we are also using in almost all of our bucket handle cases. Now I just want to ask the panel uh, panelists, uh, faculties, ki, have you ever encountered a situation where you have after a uh, uh, post repair you have faced a patient was having a lot of pain because of having uh, maybe a neural compression there, saphenous nerve or intra. You're talking about nerve. all inside or inside? All inside, all inside. Yeah. Now, wait, when, you are, when you are stitching for the capsule from outside. Right. So I've never encountered any nerve pain, but yeah, patients do complain of some kind of irritation on flexion, but which goes away over a period of seven to eight months. So yeah, no nerve pain. You, any uh, tips and tricks to avoid the nerve? No, I don't think there is any I think all inside never... is not going to create that trouble inside out. There is yeah. a lot of in, issues. So, so many any any tips? Inside, inside, inside out. I am talking about inside out. Inside, inside out. out. Inside out. Yeah. Inside out. Inside out. So yeah. Basically, yeah. we have to go yeah. to the inside. go to the capsule completely. You are not should be on the capsule or not not anywhere between in the subcutaneous tissue or there. So, and so, in your technique, you have shown that safety incision. You are taking after passing out all those needles. So, do you take no. that safety incision before passing out the needle? Or you, you can do both ways. Both ways. Uh, either you can put a safety incision uh, before putting the needles, or you can pass all your all your sutures and put an incision to retrieve all the sutures and uh, tie it. So, I think for a, if a very last year, I would go, uh, give an incision first. For a very small tear, you know, it's going to be managed in a one or two stitch. So I'll put the stitch no, first and then we'll give the incision. So if it's called a safety stitch. So it has to be done, uh, a safety incision. It has to be done prior to putting all your needles and your suture. So it has to be prior. Yeah. Which, I think on the medial side, it doesn't really matter, sir. So I don't take any safety, safety yeah, stitch. Yes. Because you're sure of your stitches. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to far posterior, then you should make a safety incision and put yes. a spoon. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, but, otherwise not. Uh, as regards pain following inside out meniscus repair, I think there are two things that you need to avoid. Number one, even if you take a uh, st uh, the incision later on, make sure that you dissect up to the capsule. capsule. No suture should be lying anywhere above the capsule, either on the sorteris fascia or anywhere else. Second is the suture tying, like Dr. Suman said, has to be at about 0 to 20 degrees. 
Any further flexion when you tie those sutures is actually causing capsular imbrication, which will cause pain later. Flexion contracture can also. Yes. No. Uh, which uh, suture configuration uh, you prefer to have? Which one is the strongest? Vertical, vertical matrix is the strongest. Sorry, then. Okay, given a choice, vertical matrix. Vertical matrix. Okay, thank you. So, thank you all the panelists. Thank you, moderator, for this uh, wonderful session. Now, I will invite Dr. Ankush. Uh, thank you to all the faculties who have come from Hyderabad. They have a flight now and we will quickly felicitate them. I will call upon stage Dr. Tanmay, sir. To felicitate all the faculty who have come from Hyderabad, Dr. Virendra Murnoor sir, Dr. Sunil Apsingi sir, Dr. Raju Ravi Teja, Dr. Chandra Krishna, Dr. Sai Chandra and Dr. Sukesh Rao. It was a wonderful discussion, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sunil, sir, and we can hand over uh, outside. So they have a flight right now. Uh, sir is coming. So we'll continue with the session now, and uh, I'll hand over to sir. For the next session, I'm inviting Dr. Sachin Jain, Dr. Manish Maheshwari to please uh, come on the chair. So we have got a slight change in program. We will be having a one talk on the PCL that would be by Dr. Brajesh. Then we will have a panel discussion on PCL by uh, Dr. Anshu. Anshu is here? Yeah. And then we will move on to the two talks that is a MCL and PLC. So that will finish our next session. And if time per permits, we will have a PCL relay surgery and a PCL aversion fixation by me and uh, Dr. Vinay. So may I also request Dr. Hirsch to please uh, join. So in this session, we are having the two things, one talk on the PCL on femoral and tibial tunnel followed by a PCL uh, panel discussion. So may I invite Dr. Brajesh Dadaria for his presentation. Speaking on techniques of femoral tunnel and tibial tunnel drilling and graft passage for PCL. Okay, so very good afternoon. I will be talking about the PCL tunnel placement and the graft passage. Okay, so there are various factors responsible for the uh, successful uh, PCL reconstruction. Among these, the accurate tunnel placement is one of them. Uh, so we'll start with the tibial tunnel. So tibial tunnel should be placed properly in both the anteroposterior plane and the mediolateral plane. So for this, for placing a tunnel uh, anatomically, so we should have a good knowledge of the uh, anatomy of uh, knee. So how 
inferior we should go uh, to place our tib uh, tibial tunnel there are multiple uh, many articles are there some recommend 10 mm some recommend 20 mm inferior to the joint line so the consensus is somewhere between 10 to 15 mm distal to the articular cartilage so placing the tunnel more distal uh, gives us advantage of uh, just avoiding the uh, or minimizing the killer tunnel and uh, there will be more gentle curve so it should be tibial tunnel should be placed somewhere around 15 to 20 milli, uh, 15 to 20 millimeter inferior to the uh, joint line and in medial lateral plane it should be in between the footprint so we can palpate the mammillary bodies so with the help of jig we can palpate both the mammillary bodies whether medially or laterally our jig should be placed in between uh, these two mammillary bodies that is approximately 10 to 15 millimeter inferior on the uh, from uh, anterior means on the tibial cortex the starting point uh, for starting our uh, tunnel should be midway between the anterior fibers of the mcl and the tibial tubercle so uh, we should place our this bullet exactly in midway as a starting point So, uh, for getting a, for placing a good tibial tunnel, the most important thing is have a good vision. So, our posteromedial uh, vision should be very good. We should place one uh, inferior from the posterior inferior portal. There should be one Wiersinga rod which pushes our capsule posteriorly. Then we will have a very good vision, and then we should place our jig. Until unless we'll have a very good vision, we can't place the tunnel properly. So once we have confirmed the location of the tibial uh, jig, now we pass, we drill our guide wire. This guide wire should be drilled very slowly and it should be protected. Vision should be good. Posterior capsule must be retracted more posteriorly to prevent atherogenic damage to the neurovascular structure. Once this guide wire is there, again we should confirm its uh, location that if we are satisfied with the position, then we should drill it with the definitive size reamer. Again, the guide wire should be protected either with the same zig or with a minisca uh, or with the PCL protector. So once we see this kind of uh, uh, that reamer is coming, we should slow down. No, it should be well protected to avoid the damage to the structure. Once drill uh, this uh, uh, tunnel is made, shaving is done to allow. Uh, graft passes otherwise the remaining fiber of the PCL they goes inside the tunnel and they prevent the passes. Resting should be done the superior and superior medial cortex should be rest thoroughly to minimize the killer turn and then this relay suture is passed through the tunnel with the help of a curved PCL artery forceps this suture is retrieved through the anteromedial portal. So all these steps should be done under vision. So this is how we make our tibial tunnel after uh, after confirming that location properly, uh, doing good reaming, good resping, and the superior part of superior medial part of the uh, cortex should be rest really thoroughly. Otherwise, there are chances of laceration of the graft. So now we come to the femoral tunnel. Femoral tunnel has a broad, uh, a very broad attachment. Means uh, on the top there is anterolateral uh, bundle which attaches. On the in, uh, inferiorly there is a posteromedial bundle uh, attaches. Practically, whenever we are reconstructing the PCL in a single bundle, we are reconstructing the anterolateral bundle. So the location of a femoral tunnel should be in the center of the anterolateral bundle. <coughs> we should uh, uh, assure the adequate tunnel length and the graft femoral uh, angle. As like in the tibial side, there is a killer turn. Similar killer turn can be there on the femoral side also. So we should uh, take care of both these things. At the same time, we should take care of adequate distance from the articular side. Because if it will be too close, then there are chances of the articular cartilage damage, subcontral bone collapse, avascular necrosis. So femoral tunnel can be drilled either from the outside in technique or from the inside out technique. Both have their advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, Again, there are uh, various papers which narrate how much uh, far the tibial, the femoral tunnel should be from the articular cartilage. It ranges from 5 millimeter to 10 millimeter. 
the general consensus is somewhere between 6 to 8 millimeter from the articular cartilage the uh, femoral tunnel should be placed so to start with the femoral tunnel if we are doing with the outside in technique first the fibers of we do some gentle saving so that the fibers of anterolateral bundles are exposed because most of the time we do the augmentation means we uh, keep the remnant of the PCL intact. So this synovium overlying the anterolateral bundle is exposed and we identify the our entry point the outside in zig is placed and then guide wire is drilled. So once the guide wire is there, again we check our position. <laughs> if we are satisfied, then we go ahead with the reaming. <coughs> I always start with a 6 mm reamer. So first I drill with the 6 mm reamer so that I can have some play, 1 to 2 mm play for the fine tuning of uh, uh, my final tunnel placement. So after this 6 mm reaming, again I pass my guide wire with the artery forcep, a strong artery forcep. I hold it and I can move it uh, anteriorly, inferiorly according to the location. Like in this case, I wanted it to place more anteriorly. So this is the final reaming. Final reaming with the definitive 9 mm size reamer. This was again, I save only those fibers which I think they will come in my way of uh, graft passes. So gentle saving is done, <laughs> reaming is done and then the suture, the release suture which was passed through the tibial tunnel to anteromedial portal, it is now retrieved through the femoral tunnel. So <coughs> now we come to the graft passage. Now this is very important to pass a, a single rod beneath the passing suture because this will minimize the curvature and this will give us ease of passing the sutures. See the and this Wiersinger rod helps us in pulling the graft and it damages the laceration of the graft. So placing this rod is really important. This helps us in many ways. So with the help of gentle pulling and uh, by manipulation with this Wiersinger rod, our graft is passed. There should be gentle and uh, gentle pressure. We should not be very vigorous. So now this pass uh, graft is passed in the femoral tunnel. This is the final graft passes and setting in the tunnel. This is the how we do the outside in tunnel. We can also make femoral tunnel from inside out. So same thing, we expose the uh, some fibers, guide wire is passed and whenever we are doing uh, inside out tunnel drilling, it is really important to protect our uh, middle femoral condyle to get damage. So I always pass this cannula. This is a simple cannula from the uh, our 18 number needle. So after passing up, uh, the guide wire, I place this cannula and over this I drill with the 4.5 mm reamer. And afterward, after confirming the position, I do reaming with the definitive size reamer. Again, while reaming, I always pass another cannula. This is a broad cannula so that our middle femoral condyle is uh, protected to avoid the uh, injury to the cartilage. So after doing the definitive reaming, we do uh, saving of the fibers which might come in our way to protect the rest of the fibers. Again, resping is very important to avoid the sharp ends at the mouth of the tunnel. So as I mentioned, they, it is very important to maintain the distance between the femoral articular cartilage and the tunnel position to avoid the complications like uh, damage to the cartilage, subcondyle bone collapse or the AV, avascular necrosis which might happen if the tunnel is very close to the articular cartilage. So to conclude, it is very important to place our tunnels correctly. Graft passage is a trick which we should give gentle uh, pressure, gentle uh, uh, pull should be there and very aggressive pull should be avoided and understanding of the anatomy is really important to have a successful outcome after the PCL reconstruction surgery. Thank you. Excellent presentation. So next, any question for Dr. Vajal? Okay. 
So we are coming to the panel discussion. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Anshu Shekhar and uh, our panelists are already there. May I request Dr. Brajesh to join along with uh, Dr. Vinay. Vinay is here. I will take the opportunity to thank Seronix for such a wonderful academic program. And it has been all by the vision of uh, all of the company whose team leader is in front of me. And it has got an excellent team. So may I invite uh, Anup to just update about your uh, technologies and what are your future plans like this. This conference has been one of the wonderful conferences, which uh, I have come to know that such similar programs are going to be conducted in different zones of country, so which is going to helpful for not only for uh, budding surgeon, but at the same time, it would be good interactive sessions for all the faculties. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Anup. Uh, I head the business for uh, uh, the Seronics business for Helium. Uh, very quickly, I know we are running late, so I'll maximum try and finish this off in about five minutes. Uh, first of all, thanks to the entire organizing team for putting up a brilliant agenda and also kind of facilitating the discussions during the entire day. Uh, uh, very, very happy to be part of this, and we would like to come back with with more and more such programs, especially for. Central India and move it from city to city uh, uh, as part of the IMC series. Thank you once again. Uh, just to quickly share who we are, uh, we are part of the Healthium Group. Healthium Group is one of the largest medtech companies based out of India. Uh, it aims to kind of provide precision medtech for for all the people globally. Uh, we are currently present in about seventy plus countries. One out of every five surgeries globally uses some or the other product from Healthium. Could be a surgical needle that we make. It could be a, a, a antimicrobial glove that we make. It could be a suture that we make. It could be arthroscopy that we make. Uh, <clears throat> as part of uh, the Healthium Group, Ceronics is the arthroscopy vertical. Um, one thing that we are proud of is we are the only company based out of India which has an entire portfolio for arthroscopy implants without copying any other company's products. Uh, with our own R&D, with our own understanding, with 70 plus patents, almost all the patents commercialized, every single patent coming in from the problem statements or the ideas of surgeons from India. Uh, and that has been our, uh, uh, our uh, what do you say, strength of bringing those ideas into, into workable products. Uh, it's a journey and, and I, I feel we, we have uh, made decent progress in the five years that we've been in the market. And uh, just to kind of share the kind of products that we are working on or the thought process on which we are working on very quickly so that anyone is interested to participate in that, we'd be more than happy to kind of uh, get your knowledge and get your experience incorporated into the project and take it forward. Uh, at a product innovation level, uh, one we are trying to work on is a metal-less ecosystem. Uh, let's say an anchor or even for, for that matter, a femoral button. Uh, a metal based implant is supposedly gold standard right uh, so the first attempt in trying to move away from a metalless ecosystem was the t button which you might have seen today uh, but that's for the tibial side now there is some work going on for what to do to make it metalless on the femoral side uh, especially in in shoulder anchors uh, when you have a osteoporotic bone all of you would go to a metal anchor as as your preferred choice but how can it be metalless but still give you uh, the advantages that a metal anchor today offers? Uh, so the thought process of a metalless ecosystem is, is very strongly proceeding in our R&D lab. Uh, AC joint, again, all of you uh, know that everyone has a particular technique which has worked for you. 
uh, and you know you you kind of stick to what what has given you better results after trying three or four different types of techniques uh, so there is no one answer or there is no one gold standard in ac joint so we are trying to come up with about two probably three different systems uh, depending on the thought process or depending on how you would want to approach a surgery if it is a chronic if it is acute how do we kind of make that differentiation so we we are working on two probably three uh, we not yet frozen the third one uh, different ways of approaching ac joint uh, hto we are getting on to the the hto bus slightly late but uh, we're extremely extremely happy with the two concepts that we have in front of us we finished our uh the dry trial using 3d printed prototypes now it is moving into commercial prototyping phase probably about 2 to 3 months time we should have the prototypes finish all the mechanical testing in our r&d lab and we'll start meeting some of you to kind of uh, you know asking for feedback uh definitely starting off with dr sheetal we've had the discussion around hto sometime uh, in the past uh again lataje it's it's more from the fact that we are in the process of getting our us fda and ce approvals for our entire portfolio so we're going to be available in more markets beyond india uh and as you know especially western europe prefers uh, lataje as their preferred uh, mode of treating instability 70% of instability cases are uh, are are treated in the lataje technique rather than you know the standard uh, uh, anchor and labrum stitching kind of a technique that we use there so it is is more outward looking than than uh, the need of the our for india so that's something that we started we've just finalized what should be the construct like we've not even done any 3d prototyping yet so it's very early stages right now the other one is a uh, digital innovation here we are, we are trying to bring as much data driven uh, uh, ecosystem as possible data in surgical planning data in following the patients we have data in analyzing how is he improving over a 6 month or a 9 month or a 12 month period so uh, we working with two two uh, digital apps uh, one which is pre one which is post uh, trying to build that ecosystem so there are some tweakings that we are doing to those apps from an indian lens perspective both these apps were developed for for other markets we trying to kind of work with them to kind of show what india needs uh this is one of our most ambitious project and i'm uh, i can confidently say that this will hit the market this year uh when we launched 5 years ago seronics we had brought equipment from day one itself uh, but from other manufacturers based in europe who were making for other companies we also got it made for seronics that's how we got a stack uh, from day one but about 2 years ago we started uh, the process of making our own hd camera our own 4k camera our own shaver system completely built in india uh, it has been a massive project uh, we are really hoping to unveil our shaver system in the arthro academy meeting in the end of july in bombay uh, we are racing against time that but we'll try our best to see if we can kind of showcase uh, uh, you know to everybody who's visiting there but the intent is to reduce the entry barrier with about 22000 orthopedic surgeons but only 4 or 1000 arthroscopy surgeons in the country uh, while skill is all uh, you know uh, you are propagating all the faculties are propagating the skill through such programs and through hands on sessions the entry barrier to have access to your capital to have access to your costly instruments is something we would like to address we would like to play a part in reducing the entry barrier so that more and more uh, arthroscopy surgeons kind of come into the foray and as a result the entire ecosystem grows much much larger than what it is today for the population that we have in india the size of the market that we have in india is very very small it is brown bound to kind of multiply multiple times uh, and we would want to play the leading role in in that particular journey the the last thing i would like to leave you with uh, is a few of you would definitely be aware that we we have a very very strong patient awareness and an athlete athlete uh, support system in seronics so we've partnered with abhinav bindra foundation with bhaichan gutia foundation with mericom foundation wherein we we help uh, non affordable athletes who have an injury today they do not have insurances they do not have access to quality care they go and get it operated in some government hospital in their hometown and at times despite the surgery they are not able to come back and follow their dream 
So in this initiative, what happens is they can reach out. We've already signed on about 35 centers of excellence in India. Uh, Dr. Sheetal being one of them, Dr. Gajesh being one of them, uh, wherein uh, we kind of route those patients to those hospitals. At times, ho patients also directly come there and we subsidize the entire cost of consumables and implants, no questions asked. Uh, you want uh, uh, X implant, you get X implant. You want Y units of X implant, you get Y units. There is no, there is no restriction that you have to use a metal screw or you have to use a metal anchor or you have to finish it off with, with one or two sutures. No. They are athletes who are probably going to be the future of Indian sporting uh, future. Whatever needs to be done to get him back on his feet and follow his passion and dream, we are willing to do without any questions asked. And we've done we've done so many uh, such surgeries, especially in Central India. And we've just launched a sport love sport for life campaign where we are trying to move awareness uh, on how to play the sport in the right way, how to get ready to kind of play that sport in the right way. Uh, and and most of you, some of you would have recorded a video today uh, for swimmers. Uh, so the next month campaign is on swimmers, the current month is on running. So we are trying to do as much as we can to kind of ensure that people understand how to play sports in the right way so that they can avoid injuries. Uh, I mean, that's the patient awareness uh, thing that's going on. And uh, yeah, uh, more than happy to kind of look at any any ideas and, and discuss. We, we are thankfully bombarded with a lot of ideas. We may not be able to work on everything in one at the same point of time, but we remember, we don't forget. We will work on them uh, as and when we are able to. And, and thanks once again for the opportunity and, and putting such a lovely program uh, for everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we need a huge round of applause and whole of your team for supporting this uh, course. Thank you. So I will request Dr. Anshu Shekhar to please come on the dais and start the panel discussion and be gentle and polite. They are all our good friends. Very good evening and um, okay, at least I, I will try to be gentle. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I will be uh, trying to uh, cover is the entire philosophy of TCL surgery going stepwise uh, in the surgical flow, in the patient management flow and try to uh, prick brains of uh, not just the panelists, but also uh, I would request all the delegates who are present here to please uh, chip in whenever possible. So we'll start with a uh, PCL avulsion. Uh, Vinay sir was going to talk about it. Uh, so PCL avulsions, when you see them, when they present to the clinic with this avulsion in the tibia, is that enough uh, for you to decide what to do, or would you like to investigate this further, Vinay sir? Uh, apart from clinical examination and X-ray, I would like to get MRI also done for the same patient. Okay. Why an MRI? Because uh, he may having some other concomitant injuries like meniscus tears or uh, other cartilage injuries, those can be addressed as well if the things permit. Okay, so you get your MRI and you have no meniscus, you have uh, no root, you have nothing else, you just have that. Now, how do you decide? What do you? How, do? how many days after? Fresh. Fresh. Fell from the bike while preparing for putting up the camera yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> so in a day or two, I would like to operate it and will fix it arthroscopically. So you would want to operate on this? Yeah. Thank you. So what is your criteria for surgery? Uh, Avals fragment, which has displacement more than 5 millimeter and uh, other injuries are also there, then also I will fix it. If it is Avals and displaced, I will fix it. 5 millimeters. Brajesh sir? Same. Five millimeters. But I won't operate on the day two. I'll wait for at least five to seven seven days for the PCL. Right. Yeah. 
So you would wait five to seven days five for PCL avulsion fixes and just for having some capsular healing, because I know ki uh, the fluid is going to be extravasated. Okay. So for five days I'll wait for some capsular healing, then I'll operate. So you would go arthroscopic? Yeah, always five to seven days. Yes. Apart from this, uh, though, uh, I would like to know the history of the patient, the occupation. So Correct. if you can give some insight about that mm -hmm. as well. So he is, you know, a banker by occupation who just rides his bike and goes to the office. That's about it. No sports, nothing else. Age, age. Age is about 32 years. Two years. So we need to counsel the patient. Right. But there is a possibility looking at his lifestyle, he may opt for conservative. Patient it, is not so high demanding, but still my inclination towards fixation. I would try and counsel the patient for fixation, arthroscopic. So displacement is not the only criteria. Displacement is one of the criteria, but yes. apart from that, we need to see the patient profile. Right. right. So I will see all the slides in all the sections. And Correct. I think minimum 2 mm is uh, sufficient uh, to go for a fixation. 2 mm? Yeah. Yes. 2 millimeters of displacement? Yes. Two, yes. Even if clinically, that would mean maybe just a grade 2 yes, draw. Sir. Actually, I have seen the non rates are very high. If we leave the patient for the conservative management. Okay. If you are to manage this patient conservatively, how will you manage this? Let us say there is one millimeter displacement. How will you manage this patient non surgically? With this PCL supporting brace, posteriorly supporting braces, I use. Okay. And ask the patient for non wearing for at least one month. Okay. And brace will be 24 hour use or almost, almost 24 hours. How would you manage a patient non-surgically who presents to you with a PCL avulsion? Exactly the same, sir. I will use a, a PCL supporting booster okay. onto the knee brace and okay. keep him immobilized or non weight bearing for at least six weeks. No cast? Uh -huh. it, it will work on a knee brace as well. So no cast? No cast. And uh, what about uh, you know, weight bearing four weeks and then how six, do you graduate? Six, six. six weeks? Six weeks weight, non-weight bearing. Non -weight bearing. And then you gradually start with? Yes, sir. Partial with, weight or you with straight partial, away? With partial. I, say, I think there is no such thing as partial weight bearing. The patient, he can immediately, uh, as soon as we tell him to uh, bear weight, he puts on flat foot weight. Yes, right. Okay. So, surgical approach. How would you approach this surgically? Arthroscopic? No, sir. Open. I Open. have no experience on uh, arthroscopic ACL level. I would uh, prefer to get it openly fixed. Why open? Because you think if if your skill set improves as you get experience, maybe, maybe, maybe. But it is better to do a open because you have only a single incision and you can just go on through that small three or four centimeter incision. You can fix it. Okay. Rather than giving multiple one one centimeter incision, it's better okay. to give a single three point five centimeter. So I think there is a control there. Yes, there are certain indications. So this patient seems to have, though we have not seen the full profile of the Correct. wrist. Correct. But it is isolated one, not commutated fracture. So yes. this is a case where few surgeons may opt for open approach or arthroscopic surgeon will go for arthroscopy. Yes. But there are certain indications like if it is commutated, then definitely open surgery may not be the good idea. Because you think open surgery will not give adequate reduction and compression. Reduction. The size of the fragment is, I think size of the fragment is very crucial. Okay. If it is horizontally large fragment, like yes. 2 to 3 centimeters, yes. it is very difficult to reduce it arthroscopically. Okay. I will go for open reduction and fix 2, two or 3 screws. A small multi-fragmented okay. fracture avulsions, I will do arthroscopy, uh, okay. end button fixation, two end buttons, one on PCL and one on even projects. Okay. Dr. Pritam, yes. Can we get a CT scan in this patient to look for the uh, displacement? For this patient? Like, no, I don't have it for this patient. But yes, I get your point. So, how many arthroscopists here who do regular PCL reconstruction but would still, uh, you know, maybe do an open PCL aversion fixation? Anybody? Amazing. I love you all. Okay, so. Uh, I am one of those. I, I am more inclined to uh, do a small mini open, uh, the technique described by Bade, Philippe Nere and Peter Ferdong and uh, so far has not given me problems. Uh, of course, I do uh, 
arthroscopic fixations whenever there is as rightly pointed out it is extremely comminuted i'm scared that i might not get adequate compression here yes, this is uh, we should not hang up with arthroscopy only all right we'll start from this side how frequently do you actually see an isolated pcl tear nothing else rare. just a rare. rare rarely it is quite common it it's quite it is quite common to see a articulated pcl tear avulsion actually no no i'm not talking of an avulsion now we're done with avulsion we're talking of pcl ligament injuries no, no. isolated pcl it is, it is rare right it's rare right so this is one thing we need to remember that i be very careful when you're thinking that the pcl is torn in isolation so investigations of course besides a, a, a radiograph an mri scan how else would you investigate maheshwari sir would you like to do anything else besides an mri or is that enough of course with your clinical examination so i think that should suffice unless uh, after clinical examination patient is having something else okay. so uh, if it is a chronic case i may ask for cartigram also okay. considering patellofemoral artery okay otherwise okay. for me so chronic pcl tears would you like to you know look at anything else that's it rajesh sir nahi for me mri alone is sufficient even for chronic injury even for not chronic injury clinical examination plus mri okay vinay sir clinical examination x rays and mri can we get stress x rays in this patient stress scanogram i think maybe yeah. exactly yeah that is what time. i was trying to yes so scanogram in chronic injuries because we know that uh, even a pcl injury which have a minor component of a posterior lateral corner eventually with a thrust they tend to go into more war so scanogram yes extremely important in chronic injuries uh and of course stress x ray somebody was mentioning of uh, stress x ray yes uh, pritam so stress would you uh, routinely do stress x ray sir vinay sir no. not hyper acute injuries would you do not, not usually no until I'll, because on clinical examination and mri most of the things are clear right so stress x rays usually are not required yes. because those findings which you want to see are already reflected in the mri even yes. the chronic cases if somebody uh, for uh, looking for a varus thrust or something if you are doing x ray you must be seeing something in the mri that middle compartment degeneration is started or something exactly exactly so stress x rays uh, probably don't have so much of a role outside laparts clinic for pcl instabilities uh, all right criteria to operate acute injuries rajesh sir isolated pcl you have got it you have diagnosed you are sure you are damn sure that this is an isolated pcl presenting in the first two weeks when would you operate on them uh if the knee is calm patient is having good movement yes definitely i'll go with the surgery but if the knee if there is some effusion uh quadriceps he is having some extensor leg yes it is altered then i so all, all that is resolved there is no effusion he has good range of motion and for an acute isolated pcl acute isolated red free pcl two yes. weeks is a good time yes. if the knee is calm yes. all the criteria is fulfilled i'll go ahead with the surgery what about grade 2 Grade two, depending on the patient's uh, demands, his uh, lifestyle. Okay. If, if it is a sedentary kind of person, right? Household female, then I'll try to conserve it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mahishwari sir, chronic injuries. I think chronic isolated PCL. What is uh, your criteria to tell the patient that now you need to think of surgery? Okay. So. we have to see the, about the complaint of the patient correct uh, if he is complaining of instability then definitely this if there is a um, uh, pain also there so mm -hmm. patellofemoral then we have to counsel the patient right even after doing the pcl surgery some amount of pain may remain because right. of this patellofemoral arthritis right so patient profile and uh, other things i would suggest patient about the surgery with okay. proper counseling okay isolated pcl whenever you see them isolated pcl neglected yes chronic neglected years. of course chronic so 6 I, years old they are quite rare actually i think uh, i we have to uh, uh, differentiate from posterior lateral and posterior no mid. so this this one is an isolated pcl so if the patient is symptomatic we will go for uh, reconstruction of the pcl okay anything else that you would like to add the, the fact that the patient is coming to that means he has a problem okay i mean it is bound to get the surgery done all right so 
yes uh, of course symptoms and absence of contraindication symptomatic patient with even a isolated pcl definitely will merit surgery so additional factors to be weighed in this is of course based on uh, current literature is uh, level of athletes body weight we don't know what cut off but probably high bmis do better with surgery isolated pcls also probably grade 2 instability also and any amount of constitutional varus isolated pcl even grade 2 probably we are right in choosing a, a surgical option early on okay so graft choice vinay sir favorite graft for hamstrings uh, for acl it is hamstrings pole showed 95 96% how do you think it will be for the PCL? Still the hamstrings. My favorite choice is the hamstrings. Hamstrings. And how many fold or how many uh, strands? Isolated uh, PCL if uh, two strands of semi deep plus two strands of gracilis. Okay. If these are sufficient, more than 8 mm, then okay. it is okay. And it also depends on the patient's role. If it is patient is bulky and heavy, yes. then 9, 9.5 mm graft is required. So I can, uh, in those cases, I can. Uh, Take the perineus longest along with that to uh, have a uh, thicker graft. So for soft tissue graft, first choice is soft tissue graft. So hamstrings and what is the sacred number for diameter? For ACL, it is 8 mm. 9. 9 mm. Register. For me, the first choice is double peroneus, double semity. Double peroneus, double semity. Yeah. Okay. And diameter? Not less than 9 mm. Not less See, than it, uh, at times, if the uh, these uh, remnants are totally fine, yes. but even if after uh, getting a double peroneus, double semi it is 8, hmm. and with an intact uh, remnant, I'll accept that 8. Okay. Never, yeah, but never less okay. than 8. Great, yeah, we need that nuance, yes. So, uh, for I prefer to put screw on both the sides, so for me, length of that graft is also important. So, Correct. it is minimum 130 okay. length. Okay. And the uh, diameter, if it is a uh, okay type build patient, medium build patient, then it will be nine. If it mm. is uh, more than that, then I will not hesitate to add peroneus or gracilis or semi whatever it may be. So first choice will be hamstring. If it is not sufficient, I would add peroneus, double peroneus. Okay. So uh, I try to achieve at least 10 mm of thickness, but nine is sufficient and uh, length is 10 to 10. So hamstrings? Yes, sir. Hamstrings. Okay. Hamstrings. So you are going with hamstrings even for peroneus, uh, even for PCL, not peroneus yet. Okay, that that's great. And minimum length, of course. We need to also understand what kind of fixation method you are using. Okay, another controversial uh, topic coming in from the ACL world: synthetic augmentation, which has a technical name. Can't use. You don't for PCL. We are talking of PCL, sir. Rajesh sir. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. never, never. So none of the panelists like any kind of synthetic augmentation right. for even PCLs. Correct? Okay. That is great to hear because uh, I know a lot of surgeons who don't do it for ACL, but for PCL, they would swear by saying that because that early on the graft tends to loosen out the collagen because none of you would want a bone on one side or on both sides. None of you would want a BTB or a quad tendon, correct? Anybody in the uh, delegates who would not want a soft tissue graft, both sides for the PCL? A quad tendon or a BTB? Yes. Okay. Okay. Right. Makes sense. All right. So, I think all of you are single bundle. When would you do a double bundle? Or would you consider a double bundle or would you just send to somebody? Single bundle, always. I think only the spokesperson. Otherwise, single bundle. Only the spokesperson for double bundle. For double. In US. Sports person, you said. If it is a sports person, okay. So I thought double bundle. Spokesperson for double bundle is sitting in the US. So sports persons, you would want a double bundle. Irrespective of, you know, any other nuance, irrespective of how much remnant there is, irrespective of everything else. E even if it is, let us say, of course, we might have a panel on MLKI, but if it is a KD3 injury, if it is a KD3M injury. So, this we are talking about isolated. Case. No, so we will, so 
like we know that PCL in isolation is very you know rare. So now we'll talk of nuances. So when would you do a double bundle? Let us put it that way. isolated PCL in a sports person. Double bundle female. Okay. Rajesh. Always single bundle because I always keep all my remnants intact. Correct. So single bundle. So never double bundle. Not yet. Should not complicate life. Yeah. Yes. Fair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any experience with only? I know uh, uh, almost all of us are uh, trans TBL. Only have you ever done it? I have done once. Yes. It was a long story. So yeah. Uh, I what happened once? I have used that uh, VTB graph. Yeah. For PCL and uh, I, that opposite limb was uh, M2T. That patient okay. was. Okay. So in the, uh, I have and this knee uh, patient had uh, vascular repair also. Okay. So I tried doing uh, harvesting the semity. I didn't find them because during the vascular surgery, mm -hmm. those were sacrificed. Okay. So eventually I have to open up. I have to take another uh, graft, then made the tunnel anteriorly, put the sutures, wire, then I turned the patient and yes. open from the back and it yes. put the screws. So if you do lots of knees, ultimately you will come up with some patient who will require an only. Yeah. Maybe. Yes. So we should know at least in theory how to do an onlay. Okay. So posterior portals. Vinay sir, how many posterior portals? One, two, three. For PCL only one. Posterior middle. Only one posterior middle for PCL reconstruction. Yes. We, we PCL reconstruction. Re repair, I, I used to take. I take yeah. Those. So we're talking of reconstruction. So one, posterior. high, low, where would you put it? High. You would put it high. Rajesh sir. Rajesh two. Two. One high, one low. Like Sheetal sir. Yeah. Yes. Manish, sir. I shifted to two portals now. Earlier I used to do, but I find life is more easier if you have to. Both portals. medial? Both medial. Posterior medial. I'm doing with one portal. I will try two portals now. <laughs> okay. So, one or sir, two? Uh, uh, abhi to, abhi tak to ek hi. But abhi, Vijay sir ka video dekhne ke baad Okay, great. Postolateral portal, nobody likes it? Hans portal? Yes. Yes. Root, no, routinely, always sing every single time. Right. Okay. So I tried doing that, but I found it is more time consuming. You spend some more time while going transeptal and then going lateral. Yes, so I agree. It is agree. Al already there. You are visualizing it. Correct. Time is saved. So Pankaj said you always do a post lateral portal. Almost always. Okay. So you think post lateral saves time? Yes. Yes. Then shuttling becomes far more easy. Also. The visinger the rod. And the life is easier. Yeah. Okay. So yes, post lateral portal. I, I do it every single time. So special tool. Vinay sir, one tool and you will not repeat the same option. One tool without you which you will not do a PCL reconstruction. PCL elevator. PCL elevator. Okay. Rajesh sir. PCL jig. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. See, to be very specific, that is stores PCL jig. Okay. Yeah. We will beep that. Huh. Okay. Mani sir. Oh, he had taken my answer. So that. <laughs> huh. so, but since what else? Said. One instrument without you will, without which you will not do even in your own OT? Maybe. No, I think then it is cannula. So the low posterior medial portal has Correct. to as a cannula. So you yes. have to manage the thing for me. And what diameter cannula do you use? It is 4.5 or 5.5, whatever. You mean the A asterisk, asterisk, asterisk X cannula? The blue cannula? Yes. Yes. In any special tool that you absolutely want in your OT. Sir, I prefer to have CM on. CM, when great. It, when you have, we are lost, it yes. is the guide which helps. Great. Actually, when I started doing PCL, I had a hard time passing uh, the relay sutures yes. to the TV tunnel. So, yes. that what I am using currently is I use a braided SS wire with a loop, teardrop loop at the end. And I pass it through the TV tunnel and use that as a uh, as a marker for the relay. Okay. It passes on very easily along okay. with the uh, elevator, uh, the PCL elevator. Okay. So it makes 
the passage of suture much easier okay i think keeping speed dial vascular surgeon is another special tool that we should have vascular protection besides using the uh, you know the special jig which will protect your guide wire what is the thing that you would do curved curate so you need a curate yeah curved curate i put on the actually the pcl elevator that is the elevator and it is it is larger in diameter the curate yes. it holds all the reverse everything is under it okay anything else any so special think, trick that you have so one trick that i do i just put the pcl zig yes. and on top of it only 45 or 50 mm of uh, guide wire the more the length we yes. have kept yes. so if needed so you can i'm sorry to interrupt it. sir what kind of jig do you use starts with s starts with uh, ks S, or starts S, with S. a starts with s okay so you hold that no that's ks then it is okay sorry so, sir Carl Stoss Zig basically, ah. so that has a stopper. Yes. So that is there, and yes. apart from that, so we keep the guide wire. So you just measure the length. Yes. Whatever it is. Yes. And just add fifty millimeter on top of that. Correct. If needed, you can just uh, by that time you are almost about the touching the second cortex. Correct. If needed, you can just tap it. Correct. To pierce the second cortex. I think that sells. Okay. Uh, Rajesh sir, who drills your tibia tunnel? Not the guide wire, the reamer. Me personally. Always. Okay. Yeah. You don't trust anyone. Not trust. So, uh, for protection of the vascular injuries, yeah. I always measure the length of guide wire which will go into the tunnel. Correct. And it will never go beyond that tip of my zig. Yes. That is the length I keep it. Yes. So that very simple formula is there that the num uh, how much tunnel bony tunnel is there. Yes. Only that much guide wire you have to load. Yes. In yes. Yes. So that is for me and uh, my assistant drills the. uh tunnel every time you trust your assistant so much because my i know anybody will anybody can relate will not go beyond the tip of the zig okay so there is no uh, anybody can relate okay assistant is male <laughs> so uh idea of uh, asking assistant to drill is you need to see yes so that exactly. one your one end is busy with this with the other end you are holding the zig because exactly. holding the zig, zig is also important Correct. so it has to be assisted yeah so that's exactly what it, so if you are holding the scope and if you are holding the wire catcher you cannot drill or then you hold let somebody else hold the wire catcher or a wisinger rod and of course this technique published by sheetal sir i tried doing it i could not sheetal i could not pass the polis i don't know i have to learn how to put poly polis from you Okay. Uh, tibia but tunnel, viewing portal. One thing, yeah. but yes. putting the Wiersinger rod and put, pushing the capsule posteriorly. Yes. Really important because we have lot of room. Exactly. Even if it uh, accidentally comes your vein yes. or reamer, then yes. you have enough room. So it gives a lot of uh, yes. safety. Right. So viewing portal. Is there any anyone amongst you who still views from the anterior side? when drilling the tibia tunnel or you always want to view post so when i was using single portal i was visualizing from the interior side but okay. now it is routine with the okay so always visualize posteriorly i think yes with jig we covered that so you always want iitv assistance when drilling your tibia so not always is there anyone who would always want a iitv to check where the tibial pin is exi pin is exiting no so 70 degree scope okay how many of us have 70 degree scope sheetal sir might have when i have but never needed <laughs> never is <laughs> it is up for resale okay uh, what is your trick to prevent the killer turn lower uh, so what is low for you approximately 1.5 cm 1.5 cm So how 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 do you determine how low have you gone? You you won't so, always measure it, right? Yeah. Is there a landmark that you look at from the joint line? The, the jig has a marking. No, before you put the jig, you need you need to clear soft tissue before before you put in your jig, right? Yes. So yes. when we clear the soft tissue, we yes. always to see the footprint of that uh, native PCL. So you you look at the PCL. Ah uh, yes. Yes. Look at the PCL and below that footprint. Okay. In, even inferior to uh, or inferior part. Distal edge of the footprint. Yes. Okay. Anybody uses any other landmarks besides the PCL to guide? So that you look for the curvature, whether the curvature is changing. So yeah. you will dissect. 
Okay. You look at the champagne drop off. Yes. Okay. And then second, uh, with the zig, there is already there is some marking. Exactly. So it life becomes easy. Exactly. So, yes, yeah. so to yes. answer your question, so how to avoid this? So number one is going low, and yes. number two is I don't pass uh, graft in one go from tibia to femur. Okay. First, I will pass from tibia, take it to the femur through the anteromedial portal. Okay. Once the graft is there, then from there we will take through the femoral. So you twist the graft inside the joint. Ha. Acha, okay. okay. You go joint to tibia. Okay. You go joint to tibia. No, 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 no. From tibia tibial to tunnel joint. to joint, okay. and then from joint to the to out, out to the femoral. Joint. Great. Yes. So that, that is very difficult to do, but. No. That is easy actually. Okay. Anything else to add to preventing killer turns? And then adding that passenger rod beyond. So yes. The passage. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. We should have a hedgehog kind of a rasp to get rid of all that bone at the edge. Femoral tunnel, I think we have already covered uh, all this. Uh, is there anything else that you would want to comment besides, of course, everything was covered by uh, Bridges. Your special trick to isolate. Vinay sir, you do mostly outside in or inside out? Inside out. Inside out. Outside in, inside out. I do outside in uh, or femur. And just one thing which uh, I think uh, I have not seen in the video, I might have missed. I would pass the guide wire first before taking the graft in the femoral tunnel because after that it becomes really difficult. For because you do outside in. Yes, do. Why do you do outside in? Why not inside out? I am more comfortable. But I have no answer. I have never tried. I am satisfied with this. So satisfied. Why do why do you do inside out, sir? Because I use endo button for the femoral side. Great. Yes. 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 Inside so that has a bearing. We yes. have longer tunnel. We can make for endo button use. Okay. All right. Graft passage fixation. I think uh, tricks you all told us we need Wissinger order to relay the suture and uh, okay femoral fixation. So inside out, of course, you will want cortical fixation. Do you want double fixation on the femur? No, no. Rajesh sir, so you put in a screw outside and screw, yeah. and then you put in what outside? I put a screw, then I yes. put a uh, endo button outside. Over, yeah. So you need a large button, right? Because yeah, you are outside in really. Yeah. Manish sir, single screw double sides. screw both sides, single fixation, single, single. both sides single fixation. So if uh, what I have observed for 260 millimeter uh, graft, or it is 13 centimeter. Yes, it is never short. You can always see the graft on both the sides, the tibial okay. tunnel as well as the femoral. So tunnel. you completely rely on your screw fixation even on the tibia. You're not scared of slippage or things like that, sir. So endo button on the femoral side and yes. the screw on the tibial side. Single fixation, yes. both sides. Yes. Suspensory on the femoral side and. Uh, 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 the interference on the tibial side. Plus, no double fixation? No double fixation. But uh, there is this technique that uh, does it very frequently. Yes. He makes uh, three or four square knots yes. over the loose ed ends of the strand so that that knot, now that is around three to four mm, mm. it sits on the interference screw. Now it acts as a foothold over the interference screw and acts as an added measure to avoid slippage or uh, or avoid any undue unparallelism of the graft limbs. So that is one technique Vinasa uses. Okay. Okay. But Strobel, I think he always recommends double fixation on the tibia at least. Yeah. Okay. And uh, bracing, uh, do you use the special brace or just long knee brace is enough with the support? What do you use for support? Gamji? Yes. Okay. You trust Gamji? Gamji, artboard, anything. Here. Sorry, sir. Uh, even I have tried reversing this brace actually the posterior it was anteriorly. Okay. But it, it requires some support. Okay. And how early do you allow range of motion after PCL? For two weeks for me. Two weeks, no range of motion. No, no. And then you start. Supine or prone? Supine? Two weeks and for first 90 degree till that is end of one month, prone range. So initially only prone? Initially only prone. Yes. Sir, the motion sir, second post of day. Okay. Prone, prone range of motion. Prone range and of motion. Weight bearing after six weeks. Weight bearing after six weeks. Yes. So weight bearing must be delayed. Range of motion it is recommended. Uh, Strobel doesn't do it for four weeks, but I think uh, even two weeks later, if we start in prone, that works. And these are two essential readings if you want to understand current concepts in PCL. Thank you very much.
and i hope it was good learning for you thank you thank you anshu for a wonderful discussion and uh, we will coming the last two lectures mcl and uh, plc repair and reconstruction so all of the moderator uh, looking very active so i will request all my moderator to sit and continue there only <laughs> and just invite the last last uh, two speaker uh, for uh, mcl in the plc and if you got a time if dr sunit is here he want to present one case the last it's the fact end of the day and I'd like to finish this quickly so management of mcl injuries uh, we need to know that there are static stabilizers on the medial side the superficial mcl the deep mcl the posterior oblique ligament and some dynamic stabilizers like the semi membranosus vastus and the pes so everyone should know this uh, diagram in detail and i would suggest you uh, stick a picture of this in your operation theater uh you should also be knowing about the layer concept by warren marshall where there is the layer 1 it consists of the deep fascia and the sartorius the layer 2 the superficial mcl and between these two layers is the tendons uh, the hamstring tendons and the layer 3 consists of the deep mcl and posterior oblique ligament so mcl injuries uh, were classified way back in 1966 by uh, the american medical association and they were based on joint laxity uh, while uh, applying valgus stress in 30 degrees of flexion and they were graded by the amount of medial joint line opening where in grade 1 was when there was 3 to 5 mm opening grade 2 was 6 to 10 and grade 3 when there was more than 10 mm opening so coming to the management of mcl injuries there is a lot of uh, gray area whether you need to conserve or you, you operate if you operate whether you repair or reconstruct if you are uh, repairing whether you repair only or you do an augmentation along with it if you or you can augment or reconstruct and either an autograft or allograft but i believe that uh, management should uh, be decided on based on the classification as in the grade of the tear and the anatomy of the tear whether it is torn from the femoral side or the tibial side or the mid substance and whether it is avulsed or not whether there is a bony avulsion and whether there are any associated injuries along with it and the personality and the demand of the patient so uh, quickly running through the management algorithm of isolated uh, medial sided injuries so if there is grade 1 and grade 2 tear you can conserve it but if it becomes chronically painful and unstable then you need to operate if it's a grade 3 injury uh, and it's only on the femoral side you can still conserve it but if it's a complete disruption from that side or if it's a bony avulsion from any of the proximal or distal part then you can you need to operate so i'll just skip this so there is this orthopedic review article uh, which mentions uh, about the consensus of uh, conservative treatment and they say that isolated grade 1 and 2 lesions can be conserved uh, there are excellent outcomes with conservative treatment in acute femoral sided injuries but if uh, but the optimum protocol for uh, conservative treatment still lacks evidence most support using the range of motion brace with weight bearing as tolerated varus knees heal faster rather than valgus knees consensus is to avoid external rotation of the foot when you are doing conservative treatment rehab has to be individualized depending on the patient and grade 3 injuries rarely occur in isolation and in such situations surgery is advisable so in surgery you can either repair you can either augment or you reconstruct so when do we repair so when there is a complete proximal detachment with associated ligament injuries that is the time you should repair if it's a mid substance tear associated with ligament injuries you can repair or augment if it's a tibial sided tear and it's not retracted you can conserve but if it's retracted or a stenner type lesion you need to repair and for me 7 to 12 days is the golden period for repair because that is the time that tissues are most uh, amenable to repair uh, for repair you need uh, a lot of armamentarium you don't know what you're going to fix it with so you should have suture anchors interference screws ligament screws staples suture discs uh, strong sutures 
and suture tapes uh, which might be required for augmentation. Uh, reconstruction, when do you do it? When you, uh, when you have uh, chronic MCL tears, when uh, you have acute tears with bad tissues, and when there is a multiligament kind of scenario. So we have two options uh, which are most commonly used. One is the Laprade technique and the other is the Danish technique. The Laprade is an anatomic technique wherein he drills two drills on uh, two sockets on the femoral side and two on the tibial side. And uh, the one which is uh, prophesized by Professor Martin Lind, wherein he uses only one socket on the femoral side and two on the tibial side. So this is just a video showing the Danish technique. We'll go, uh, we'll see through this. So the incision is made from the medial epicondyle to the pes area. Then just uh, we keep the attachment of the semitee intact and uh, use an open tendon stripper uh, to harvest the semitee. And then that what he's marking is basically 6 mm from the joint line wherein you change the direction of the semitendinosus from anterior to posterior so that the vector of the MCL works for us. And he uses two suture, uh, suture anchors, one anteriorly, one posteriorly. Then you have to identify the adductor, uh, adductor uh, tendon because the, the, that's where you have the adductor tubercle. Can I have a mar mar marker, please? Hello, marker. Here. Okay. Yeah, I'll just go back on this. So we have covered this. So you identify the adductor tube about the adductor tendon over there, that's the adductor tubercle. Then you that's the MCL. You identify the medial epicondyle because your uh, socket for the uh, femoral uh, tunnel has to be somewhere in between there. That is how you are going to do a Danish reconstruction. So you identify the isometric point and uh, drill with uh, 6 or 7 mm, depending upon the uh, diameter you get of this, you do a whip stitch of this graph so that about 15 to 20 mm goes inside the tunnel and you, uh, you then pass it through the tunnel, keeping a guide wire in place as has been advised. Then this is the semimembranosis muscle. So just proximal to it, you drill your POL tunnel on the tibia. And then you put a guide wire and then pass it through after taking proper whip, whip stitches over there. And then you fix the femoral side with a bio screw with the knee in about 10 degrees of flexion and neutral rotation. And then you fix the posterior oblique ligament in the same neutral rotation and 10 degrees of flexion. And in the end, uh, we use a suture anchor on one centimeter distal to the joint line so that it works as a deep MCL as well. And that is how you do a uh, Danish type of MCL reconstruction. So quickly going through some cases. So this is a 38 year old male. He had a ipsilateral POTS fracture in the same leg. And if you can see, he has a medial sided femoral avulsion and an ACL tibial avulsion as well, which is not uh, very uh, easily seen, but he had. And these are his uh, evaluation on an anesthesia. So the anterior drawer is positive. And if you see the uh, valgus, valgus press, so he has a grade 3 opening. So I opened only on the femoral side. So those sutures are for the ACL avulsion pull through sutures. And then this is the bony fragment which is avulsed from this crater and attached to it is the MCL. So what I did is I put a uh, double loaded uh, suture anchor with tape into it. And then I retrieved all those sutures through the MCL. I would have wanted these sutures a little bit anterior, but that's fine. And then I used a uh, lateral row anchor and then took all these sutures inside and then fixed it over there. And that is how nicely it has uh, <coughs> reduced the fragment over there. So this is like a double row repair. And then I sutured it up, plicated it a little, and that is how it looks. And he's doing well. So avulsion repairs uh, need to be done. Case 2 is a 33-year-old male. He comes two weeks post-injury. You can see his MCL is attached to the femur, but it's not attached or it's completely retracted over there. And there's a lot of effusion. So he has an MCL tear. 
and he has ACL and PCL also go on. So it's a multi-ligament kind of scenario. So this is 18 days post injury. So you can see he has a grade three MCL laxity and he has an anterior and posterior drawer also positive. And this is how it looks on 18 days. That is why I said for, for me, seven to 12 days is the time when I, I, I advise repair. So look at the tissue. It's so friable. And you can see it opens up, the joint opens up on valgus stress. So here we did the Danish technique. So if you can see, that's the SMCL, that's the POL. So the POL should be lax in flexion. So that demonstrating just that. So it's tight and extension, but as soon as you flex, the POL becomes loose. So that means that our, all our fixation points are isometric. And then I repaired this uh, uh, MCL also on that. And I also did the uh, all inside ACL and PCL. So that's his post of X-ray. Uh, case three uh, is a 21 year old female. She's a budding physiotherapist. She represents three days after injury. So she has an ACL tear and a MCL tibial sided injury. So if you can see there, that MCL is wavy. And it's basically torn from the tibial side. And that's the ACL gone over there. So that's our evaluation under anesthesia. So a valgus positive. And this is how the MCL was torn. So it's detached from the distal attachment on the tibia. So that's the all inside ACL. So I repaired that uh, MCL to the tibia. I took whip stitches into the tendon, uh, into the ligament. And then I uh, did a internal bracing augmentation also. So put in a lateral row anchor with a tape over here, and then one lateral row over here, which included the repair sutures of the MCL as well. So no more implant required. So this lateral row anchor included the internal brace and the sutures from the MCL. And I also sutured over here uh, through the, the fibers of the MCL. So that's how you can augment your repair with an internal base. Case four, the last one, 63 year old male, sedentary. Uh, he, uh, the dislocation was reduced by the primary surgeon. This is his stress x-rays. Uh, so you can see the medial sided opening more than 10 millimeters as compared to the contralateral side. And the, this is his MRI, which shows a lot of uh, effusion and white signals. And uh, we just don't know what's going on on the lat uh, on the medial side, and that's the uh, sagittal section showing ACL and PCL tear. So that's his evaluation under anesthesia. So he has a valgus opening of grade three. You check it in uh, zero degrees and thirty degrees of flexion, and then this is the anterior and posterior drawer grossly loose. So and. So once I opened it on the medial side, so I don't know if you can visualize, but it's all in tatters. It's not good tissue. And you can see the femoral condyle over there. That's the deep MCL with the capsule. So all in tatters. I don't know how to repair this, although it was, uh, we took him, uh, I think, seven days post injury. So you can see that there's the MCL about two centimeters of. MCL is still attached to the femur and it's basically a mid substance kind of tear. And I'll also show you. So the tear is reaching out posteriorly also. So that's the posterior capsule over there, along with the all elements of the uh, medial sided tissue complex. Right. So we repaired uh, the uh, deep MCL using anchors. We used three anchors. And then uh, we took the graft. I also decided to uh, reconstruct. Uh, so we took the semi from here and uh, we drilled for the isometric point on the femur and then passed all the sutures through the deep MCL from anterior to posterior, repaired that, then uh, whip stitched the, uh, whip stitched the tendon and then put it in the femoral socket. So that's the Danish technique of MCL reconstruction. 
and that is the final picture that we have. Um, so that's the uh, suture disc for the tibia, uh, for the PCL, and that's the MCL repair, repair plus reconstruction. And that's the PCL we did for him. I did not do the ACL because he was 63 and it was a very uh, major surgery for him. So the take uh, conserve MCL injuries whenever possible. They heal very well. Be aggressive when uh, it is a grade 3 injury which is associated with other ligament injuries. The golden period for repair is 7 to 12 days. Keep all armamentarium ready in case you are doing a repair. And the Danish technique of MCL reconstruction is reasonable for our subcontinent uh, with excellent results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nave. And Dr. Anthony who is going to speak about PLC repair and reconstruction indicating it. Okay. Uh, thank you for bearing for so long. So the PLC was considered the dark corner of the knee, and we were all scared to talk about it. Talk to forget about operating. For you know, even discussions were very hazy. So uh, with uh, a lot of biomechanical and clinical research, now we know that it is probably not as dark as it was meant to be. Of course, Chandra covered the anatomy long back. We basically have three structures in the posterolateral corner. So I'll try to cut the clutter and keep it to a uh, minimum uh, for understanding. So we have the fibular collateral ligament. Uh, we have the popliteus tendon and we have the popliteal fibular ligament. I'll not talk of their origin and insertion, but we need to keep these three structures in mind. The PFL, the LCL and the popliteus when we talk of the posterolateral corner. So basically the LCL is a varus stabilizer at about 30 degrees of flexion. The PFL or the posterior, the uh, uh, popliteal fibular ligament is an external rotation stabilizer and the popliteus tendon is basically an external rotation stabilizer at higher angles of flexion. Now uh, that is not as important functionally as the PFL. So the PFL is far more important functionally than the popliteus tendon. Now how to approach will depend on what is the spectrum of uh, the PLC injury because they always present uh, very differently. Most commonly, we assess and we talk of the valgus stress, the varus stress test to look at how much opening there is at 0 and 30 degrees of flexion. So, a varus stress will basically look at the LCL. However, we need to look at uh, the dial test in 30 degrees and 90 degrees of flexion. Very commonly, we get PCL with uh, a PLC injury. Now, when a, P uh, when a PLC presents with a PCL injury, what has happened is the PCL is causing the tibia to sag behind. If at that position you perform a dial test in the supine knee, you will not know where you are starting because the tibia has already sagged posteriorly. Therefore, in PCL PLC combined injury, it, it, it always makes sense to perform a dial test in the prone position, wherein the tibia then sags back uh, because of the gravity. And then, of course, extensive injuries to the posterolateral capsule will also cause a uh, varus recurvatum kind of uh, appearance. So, this uh, Spectrum has been very recently classified. This is, of course, based on uh, Greg Fennelly's work and uh, Wheeler and Philipp Lobenhofer from Germany. Now they have uh, classified this as the polis uh, classification. So type A is basically PLRI. It is posterolateral rotary instability. Type B is PLRI with mild opening at zero degrees, uh, at 30 degrees, which in which means that there is some involvement of the FCL. Polis C is basically PLRI and there is opening obviously at 30 degrees but mildly at 0 degrees and polis D is the most severe kind of injury which means that there is extensive injury there is PLRI and obvious uh, opening on the lateral side at 0 and 30 degrees. So going from polis A to D it is uh, an entire spectrum again as per the uh, anatomic considerations. Laprade of course uh, he is obsessed about uh, stress x-rays I always do them I always do stress x-rays whenever I suspect a PLC injury more than clinical decision making, it helps me understand where the laxity is lying. So we know that up to 2.7 millimeters compared to the contralateral side is normal. Again, this becomes difficult when there is a combined, you know, ACL, PCL. We get such large openings. Uh, and of course, more than 4 millimeters opening indicates complete uh, rupture of the PLC. 
Now, the decision to perform a repair or a reconstruction is a far simpler in the PLC. Now, why we need to understand that perhaps repairs are not as uh, you know successful is because we are looking at a convex femur and a convex tibia. So, we are looking at two convex surfaces which are not congruent. So, obviously, anything which we repair is not going to be inherently stable. And the second is how soon the, present, uh, the patient presents to us. It is now known since the last almost 15-20 years that repairs don't really do well. And both these papers by Stannard and Bruce Levy from uh, Mayo Clinic, these are landmark papers which have proven that failures of PLC repairs are as high as 40%. Hence, uh, you know, they are better meant for the bin. However, there are some injuries of the posterolateral corner which can still be uh, repaired. These are the typical ones. These are the injuries where this is basically an arcuate fracture, a fracture of the proximal tibia, which contains the attachment of the biceps, which contains the attachment of the LCL and of course of the PFL. Now the PFL is the main ER stabilizer, remember. So of course you need to do an MRI scan to document to see how many structures are injured. Uh, one way of doing it is to you know, take whip stitches into the entire sleeve of uh, bone and soft tissue. Uh, drill tunnels and then tie it off. This is an implantless technique really. Uh, we need strong sutures, something like uh, ultra molecular weight uh, polyethylene. The other way of doing it, uh, again another one, a uh, proximal fibular uh, fracture uh, which has, you see, there we see uh, there is complete disruption of the biceps along with the LCL. So this was repaired. I used uh, SS wire, created a small drill and just uh, tightened it. So this was again, using suture anchors for these repairs is a little dicey because anchors probably won't hold as well. I'm scared of them. Now when we talk of PLC reconstructions, now here again I'll, I didn't try to cut the clutter. The classic PLC reconstruction technique which was described by Larson's should not be spoken of. For the simple reason that this is nothing more than a sling, this is nothing more than a varus stabilizer. This does nothing to control external rotation stability. And if we are to perform a surgery just to reconstruct the LCL, there are better techniques available. Okay. So, uh, popliteus reconstruction, this is something fancy. I have never done it because I have never been able to diagnose an isolated popliteus tendon injury. I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but I have never seen it. So, uh, described by Laparat and I know Bancha does it a lot. Isolated PLC, no experience. So, I'll better not talk about it. So, there are two techniques which we need to understand. One is the Laparad and the other is the RCRO. So, the Laparad is basically an anatomic technique. It uses a single fibula tunnel, two femoral tunnels and a tibial tunnel. Now, you all know this. Now, why all why this is important is it reconstructs anatomically the LCL, the popliteus tendon and the PFL, all three of them. Compared to, so that's the LCL and the PFL segment. And that is the popliteus tendon segment, the blue one. Compared to the RC arrow, now the RC arrow also reconstructs the uh, PFL and the LCL. What it does not do is reconstruct the popliteus tendon. But then again, functional deficit of a popliteus tendon is probably not as well understood as yet. The biggest advantage is that uses a single graft, which is extremely important in our settings. And it is a fibula base. We don't need to go to the tibia, especially in MLKI scenarios where we might have tunnels because of the ACL and the PCL. So one single uh, graft, two, fib uh, two femoral tunnels and one fibula tunnel. So which one do you choose? Would you do a laparad? Would you do RCRO? Are you committed to one? So it depends on the severity of injury and laxity that you have. It depends on biomechanical proof for either technique. It depends on what graft and how many grafts you have available what concomitant reconstructions that you need to do because PLC is not an isolated injury in almost every scenario and what experience and training you've got with uh, both these techniques. And finally, we all talk of evidence-based medicine. So, I'll try to present some evidence. Now, uh, basically, we're now on only comparing Laparad with RCRO. So, when we look at biomechanical evidence as to whether either is superior to the other, so far, we have not found that the PFL LCL reconstruction is inferior to Laparad. So, the RCRA is not inferior to Laparad in a single biomechanical study till date. All right, even though uh, Laparad uh, reconstruction is called anatomic and nobody calls an RCRA anatomic, unfortunately, there is no biomechanical evidence. And this is this has been known uh, since some time 
and uh, we now know even after uh, the police classification came in that even for type d injuries that it really does not matter they produce the same amount of constraint for uh, virus stability and for external rotation stability at lower degrees of flexion that is when it is functionally more important so again these are all basic biomechanical studies now this was the first clinical study that came in which again showed that a simplified fibula based technique which is the rcro technique is perhaps superior to a laparat because it has less complexity less surgical complexity and that is something that we should understand doing complex fancy surgery even if it is not better sometimes doesn't make sense so we need to choose based on our experience and training uh, again this is uh, from germans they have now started performing both the surgeries arthroscopically i mean again i have no uh, experience of performing an arthroscopic plc reconstruction but apparently they are doing it in germany and there again they say that uh, probably if you do them arthroscopically either of them the rcro scores over the laparat because the results are the same the rcro is less invasive you have a shorter surgery and you have uh, equivalent uh, results coming out of it so clinical evidence probably tilting in favor of rcro uh, in our scenario this is uh, this was published uh, when i was with tapasvi sir we uh, basically did what is known as a reverse logic laparat using a single graft i'll present a short video of it so this uh, was done using a single peroneus longus tendon the length of the tendon that we require for this case is at least about 28 cm so what we do is we first start whip stitching the thicker end of the thinner end of the graft which is the proximal end of the graft for about 25 mm then we turn around the graft measure about 5 cm segment so this is the segment which will be meant for the popliteus and then the doubled segment is then whip stitched so the short segment is for the popliteus the longer segment is for the pfl and the lcl surgery of course lateral exposure the first thing that we need to do is isolate the biceps because just behind the biceps is the nerve the common peroneal nerve needs to be dissected we need to perform a neurolysis or just so that we know that we are careful although now some people say that it is not necessary we are still far away it is always better to perform a complete neurolysis right up to the nerve inserting into the peroneus longus muscle belly the second uh, window is behind the fibula the third window is between the biceps and the it band to look at where the lcl lies and the third is of course splitting the it band now uh, pulling the lcl remnant most of the times from the second window will reveal where the lcl is which is about 1.5 proximal and 3 mm distal to the uh, lateral epicondyle that is where we create the socket the popliteus socket lies in the anterior fifth of the popliteus tendon again a socket is created and the distance again described by laparat is 18.5 sometimes not true for us maybe for caucasians yes so there uh, that was demonstration of the instability of the proximal uh, pf ligament as a uh, tf ligament as well so then uh, the fibula is drilled from anterolaterally to posteromedially because that will mimic your pfl it should not be an ap tunnel it has to be anteromedial to anterolateral to posteromedial and then we use this jig uh, to drill the tibia the starting point is at the gerdes tubercle the flat surface on the gerdes tubercle the exit point is on the flat popliteus sulcus on the tibia now uh, this was of course when we did this 3 uh, years back uh, we did this using a flip cutter i have now switched to doing this in a standard manner because then we don't need an adjustable button like that we can do this even with a t button uh, now and so the graft is inserted in the tibia first then is shuttled and is inserted into the popliteus socket on the femur so we reconstruct the popliteus first that was the last thing to be done in the laparat original technique then the graft is shuttled from the back to the front through the fibula so that segment becomes the pfl segment so that is uh, tensioned again at about uh, 50 to 60 degrees of flexion no rotation and then finally this graft is shuttled proximally into the femur and then we measure cut the graft so we need just 25 mm of it and this is inserted into the lcl socket so this is a reverse logic laparat technique using a single y construct graft and uh, i have done about five of these so far uh, we get good stability 
both on uh, rotation and on uh, valgus virus assessment. So that's the LCL, the graph going in, dipping into the fibula, that becomes the PFL going back and coming out of the tibia, that becomes the popliteus. Probably a simpler way of uh, doing uh, Laprat. Of course, we need to look at uh, malalignment issues in chronic cases because which will require uh, an osteotomy. PCL always uh, very commonly associated with uh, PLC injuries needs to be reconstructed. Experience and training, again, very important. You should get cadaveric training, good exposure to cadaveric dissections to understand the anatomy. It is all about the anatomy. Surgery is what anybody can do. And of course, there's fancy equipment uh, if you have access to. So, if that was confusing, I'll try to simplify it again. So, Laprad is preferable when we have a polis C and D injury. When there is severe PLRI, and uh, along with an external uh, rotation recurvatum injury, when there is proximal tip fib instability. Now remember, Lapra does not uh, stabilize the proximal tip fib joint, but this is of course probably what it will, it might do indirectly. No evidence again. Concomitant grade three PCL again indicates a greater degree of injury, so probably doing uh, popliteus reconstruction also may help. And RCRO should suffice for a polis B C. Also for a D maybe, if it is not with a PCL, if there is minimal hyperextension and the proximal tip fib joint is stable and if we are performing a, a concomitant HTO or an ACL because we don't want to violate the tibia. We, the tibia is sacrosanct when we are doing an HTO. And of course, in multi-ligament scenarios, don't complicate life. Keep it simple because RCO works perhaps better than Laprat. So uh, that was my take on the PLC. Thank you very much. So I think Anshu was the showstopper for this session. So excellent presentation, Anshu. Any question for Dr. Anshu? Okay. So we have one more case presentation. So may I invite Dr. Sunit Raj Shekhar for his case presentation. And then uh, we will hand over to the organizers for final ceremony. Because it's all, I feel like a late person already. So, it was a lady, a young lady, 21 years, female, came to me around uh, one year back. She had an acute fall and came to me after 24 hours. She has gross swelling, blisters of the knee. Uh, on x ray, she had this presentation. Uh, ACL avulsion, a pretty big chunk, and uh, posterior medial tibia, which was fractured. So, this is just a sum summary. This slide shows uh, her follow up and the final range. Right, so according to me, it was type 3 CA, displaced more than 5 mm, uh, ACL avulsion fracture, and the posterior tibial part, which, was, which needed buttressing. Uh, she came finally on the on the ninth day when the swelling was less, the blisters were almost dried up. I took her up for a, a single stage surgery, uh, pulled through sutures for um, pull through sutures for the ACL and uh, uh, posterior medial sub, uh, buttress plate sub supporting the condyle. This is uh, the follow up, which shows. Uh, This shows uh, physiological varus. Uh, well, we should not call it physiological because this is after healing of six weeks. Uh, it looked like varus to me and I was worried. So I did a contralateral x-ray also. And uh, so uh, she had some varus in the other knee as well. Clinically, she did well. She had no problems. She was uh, a college goer. So she was riding a scooty three and a half months from the date of injury. She has no problems whatsoever, but I was not so convinced with the posterior elevation. And also, I would want to know whether I should have done it in two stages, which I do sometimes for people little older than this. Uh, I would do a, a bony fixation first, wait for four weeks, and then go in for the ACL avulsion fracture addressing. Uh, 
Yes, I'm open for questions or comments. Any questions? I think uh, such situation can be managed well with a single stage, uh, Sunit, what I think. Uh, so standard post-medial incision, take the patient in the prone position, finish up your surgery, uh, make patient supine, hanging down position, and do a standard AC lavation with a pull-out technique. So I so, think you've done a right job. So follow-up did not have any opening, virus or uh, otherwise, but the X-ray did not look very satisfying. That's because there's a central depression, which was uh, in the medial condyle. I think that was not very well... Uh, lifted, but she had a very uh, soft, spongy bone, which is sometimes seen in the young lady. So that was my point. I wanted to know if there is any any better fixation with the ACL, or if I had not combined, if, if I had not made a tunnel, I would have probably elevated it better. I think, I think it's got nothing to do with the ACL origin because with both the anatomy is totally different. So posteromedially, probably there was a depressed fragment. So while doing a posteromedial exposure, there was a chance that he could have elevated, put some graft, and then put the raft plate or a buttress plate. So the posterior part I have elevated well. There is a central part, the exact on the sagittal. If we see the middle part, there is some amount of depression that the double shadow. Uh, that's about it, sir. Thank you. Okay, that's it. So this finishes this session and i must congratulate all the organizers uh, uh, organizers especially dr sheetal for making this really academic event and i will say this is one of the best academic event at least in so this is a national level event and kudos to all the organizers and now i hand over the ceremony to dr Tan. i would like to thank uh... Everyone, Sheetal called me a uh, few days back and uh, he entirely actually uh, made up this program in his mind and then he called me up that we need to do this program at Indore. So I, anyways, I had a, uh, always had a, so many friends at in the, here in Indore, so I never, I never said a no and we went ahead. Thanks to you all, you all came all the way, spent your time, Sunday especially and all the delegates, all faculties, especially Saronics for helping us out with this entire program, totally financially, individually. And uh, thanks to the AV team, Mr. Vikran Daga. Thank you to the videography team as well. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think I'm missing anyone, Sital. Is it? Yeah, you can just come over and have, have a group picture one. So.
perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process, progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Serenex. Creating purposeful designs through perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process, progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change, the only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex, creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in, innovation, consistency, and giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future. The start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research 
and a team who brave every challenge to ideate and break ground inevitably. Be it man or machine, we don't settle for standards. We set the standards as we develop life-bettering tools consistently. And truth be told, the power to deliver groundbreaking innovations lie with the surgeons who put our products to the test day in, day out, and help us analyze every step and inspire us to push limits. It is this collaboration that's at the heart of who we are. Our research, ideation, development, and analysis in sync with your feedback, constantly pushing us towards the next step in perfection. Only one thing drives it, and we've got loads of it. Passion. Cyrenex. A division of Healthium. Perfection. It isn't the final outcome, but a sign of what's to come. There is no be-all and end-all. It is a process. Progress. It isn't the present tense or past, but the future, the start. Perfection is the opposite of constant. It is change. The only thing that's constant. That's what we do here at Cyrenex. Creating purposeful designs through what we most believe in. Innovation. Consistency. And giving power to you, surgeons. Our innovations are driven by constant research and a team who brave every challenge to ideate 